U.S. presidential election. There was, um, you know, considerable activity happening at the international level, and particularly in the United States, uh, following following what was seen as, you know, very high level, very sophisticated Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Um, there had also been. Um, other things going on um, in the world, you know, kind of within the next six to eight months, um, where we saw, you know, the Brexit vote, uh, where we saw um, the uh, Macron leaks in France, uh, the cyber attack against the German parliament, um, and leaks from the Bundestag. So there were a series of very high profile cyber attacks on uh, fellow democracies around the world. And so uh, when the prime minister gave me that mandate, it was very much um, trying to protect Canadian democracy and Canadian elections uh, from those kinds of high profile, very sophisticated uh, cyber threats, which at the time were primarily coming from Russia. And so let's pull up that mandate letter that you received from the prime minister. Can I please have COM 18, please? And so this is a letter um, that I understand you received on February 1st, 2017 from the prime minister. I'll just wait for that document to be brought up. COM 18. Thank you. Uh, and the document you see on the screen, is this the letter that you received? Yes. Okay. And if we can go down to page three, please. A little bit further down. Thank you. Uh, so we see the paragraph starting with, in particular, I will expect you to work with your colleagues and through established legislative, regulatory, and cabinet processes to deliver, to deliver on your top priorities. And the first bullet uh, lists in collaboration with the Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, lead the Government of Canada's efforts to defend the Canadian electoral process from cyber threats. This should include asking the Communication Security Establishment, CSE, to analyze risks to Canada's political and electoral activities from hackers and to release this assessment publicly, as well ask CSE to offer advice to Canada's political parties and Elections Canada on best practices when it comes to cybersecurity. I appreciate there's other bullets on that list. I will focus on that one uh, for today. Um, did you, in relation to this particular aspect of your mandate, did you have any discussions with the Prime Minister about expectations for what the plan should cover and how it should operate? Well, no, it's pretty clear um, in the mandate letter what my task was um, and to, to work across government to protect our elections from cybersecurity threats. And so, the, and the mandate itself is, is focused on cyber threats. Mm -hmm. Was the developing plan, so the plan to protect Canada's democracy, was that plan restricted to or focused on cyber threats? No, it ended up being broader than that. Um, how this came about, so, you know, as when you um, are a minister and you get a mandate letter, this is the job that you're tasked with. It's a job description, so to speak, in terms of what the prime minister expects you to accomplish in your time in that portfolio. Um, so I set about uh, gathering information, learning about what the threats were. So I had various meetings with the different heads of agencies to understand what the threats were to Canada, uh, focused on our elections. Um, and through that um, proceed, pr process, um, you know, I was presented with other threats to our democracy that included human intelligence, uh, which is what led to the four pillars um, that were released publicly in January 2019 and Canada's broad plan to protect our democracy that ended up bringing in um, not just the Departments of National Defence and Public Safety, but also Global Affairs uh, as well as Heritage, so that we had as comprehensive of a plan at the time to deal with the threats as we understood them. Um, but really, it was a process of of learning, understanding, engaging, and trying to come up with uh, the plan that could most robustly protect Canada's uh, national federal democracy. 
So let me talk to you a bit about that information gathering exercise that you've described. Um, what did you identify or learn uh, were the biggest threats or concerns to which the plan needed to respond? Sure. So, I mean, I think one of the important parts throughout all of this was the understanding that foreign interference or attempts at foreign interference, because foreign, um, I think it's it's the attempting uh, that has gone on for a long time. Probably in every election that Canada has ever had, there have been attempts at foreign interference, just like in probably every election in a democracy around the world probably since ancient Greece, there have been attempts at foreign interference. Whether they are successful or not is, is another question. Um, and so I think that was one of the most important things. The nature of the threats have evolved over time. And in the you know, period um, from 2017 to 2019, um, this was when threats online were becoming more of an issue that people weren't really aware of, and the security agencies themselves were also learning more about. Because if we go back to you know, the Russian example in the, <clears throat> in the United States, they were using social media platforms to try and either elicit a specific outcome in the American election, or even just creating chaos, right? So that it people have less um, trust in democracy, which feeds their interest of a national interest to say that democracy is um, is not something that Russians, for example, should be interested in because look at the chaos that's happening over there. We want stability. So there's many different interests at play here. Um, the other thing that I learned was of you know other countries, for example, that also had an interest sometimes perhaps in getting a specific candidate elected or not, um, whether they were successful again is always a question. And then the other part of it is, um, you know, they may have specific policy objectives as well, or they may have specific objectives with regards to um, influence operations. And it's really important to note that, um, you know, foreign countries and actors are engaging in influence operations all the time, but they're overt. Uh, you know, that's diplomacy, that's, you know, trying to, um, you know, in, uh, you know, have overt conversations in the public, perhaps through the media. And then there's the interference part, which is the stuff that is covert that um, they're trying to do in a sneaky way so that Canadians or politicians aren't aware of. So really learned quite a bit about what is going on. Um, I would also say, um, I think learned that our security agencies are, are quite sophisticated um, in Canada and have pretty good knowledge um, about what is happening, but also recall that you know, foreign actors are trying to do this in a way so that we don't know about it. And one of the other things um, that I think is really important that I learned through this process is that we have to be very mindful and security agencies are, about what information is disclosed publicly, because if they make a decision to disclose something publicly, they're effectively letting the foreign actor know that they know what they're doing. And so they could lose a source, that foreign actor could change what they're doing, they could go further underground. And so we need to be really thoughtful and mindful about how and when and what is released um, publicly, which also played a really big part in the development of the plan. And just um, to ask you specifically about this, the sources of intelligence or information you relied on, I understand that in your role as minister, um, you did not receive daily packages of intelligence products? Correct. Um, and I understand that you um, had various briefings and received information from various agencies as well. Is that correct? Correct. Can we pull up CAN 13303, please? and go to page three. So you can see here under the heading briefings to ministers, um, a series of briefings between August 15th, 2018. Um, and can you scroll down a little bit, please? Stopping there is good, thank you. This shows briefings to the Minister of Democratic Institutions, as I said, from August 15th, 2018, 
down through August 23rd, 2019, we see briefings, director CSIS, chief CSE. Are those all meetings that you attended? Well, I, I'm going to assume that I did, but I, I wouldn't be able to confirm the exact dates because I don't recall, but I would meet kind of on a monthly, bi-monthly basis with them. And was the focus of the intelligence that you received focused on cyber threats or was it broader than that? Uh, the primary focus would be on cyber threats, uh, both in Canada, but also what we were seeing around the world. Um, and the purpose of including around the world is important so that we could learn from other experiences so that we would be able to protect uh, Canada's democracy and elections against those. Um, and there would be, if, um, you know, if, if relevant, um, high level descriptions of um, other potential threats that could include human interference, but they would never be specific. It would be a very general overview, um, very high level of uh, what the agency was seeing at the time. Okay. And so in terms of high level, did you ever receive the names of potential threat actors? Of could you clarify that in terms of like... Did you ever receive names of individuals, for instance? No. Um, and did you receive intelligence relating to, like specific intelligence relating to alleged incidents of foreign interference? Not in specific detail. It would be quite high level. So in addition to briefings from CSIS and CSC, I understand you also received information from other agencies or entities. Um, from... from who else did you receive information from? So um, CSIS and CSC would be the two primary sources, but uh, the rapid response mechanism at Global Affairs Canada would uh, also generally uh, provide information. And what the RRM does is they well worked with um, G7 and NATO allies to uh, look more broadly around the world to try to identify trends and perhaps identify a threat before it would occur. And so they would kind of tell me um, what they were seeing around the world and any new trends or threats that they were identifying in the online space and from, um, from publicly sourced content. And in addition to RRM, any other sources? Um, PCO would also um, provide uh, intelligence, although I guess this was likely gathered by CSE and, and CSIS ahead of time. In relation to PCO, do you know who was responsible for compiling the intelligence or information that was shared with you? I, I do not. Um, I would have received it uh, through my deputy minister. I'm not familiar with the chain of command and beyond that. Uh, so I want to move now to the kind of building of the plan, who you collaborated with, and then I'll get into some specific questions about the plan. But I understand from the mandate letter and your witness summary that the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness and National Defense also had some involvement in the development of the plan. Are you able to describe what their involvement was? Well, uh what I set out to do as Minister of Democratic Institutions uh, was to come up with a whole of government plan, recognizing that as I learned more about what the threats were, um, that you know we needed to ensure that we had um, a variety of different departments uh, part of this. So um, the ministers of national defense and the ministers of, of public safety were much more in a supportive role, but identifying what their departments could do to support the broader plan. So for example, um, you know, under the uh, minister of public safety, obviously, um, you know, with regards to intelligence priorities, ensuring that cybersecurity uh, in our elections and our democracy was a priority. Um, the RCMP created a specific unit to look at cybersecurity threats in our democracy, um, updating uh, their um, other initiatives within public safety to make sure that they had a robust plan um, under defense, the communication security uh, establishment. Rests. And so um, they provided um, 
opportunities to political parties, parliamentarians, um, Parliament of Canada, Elections Canada, the commissioner, even provincial electoral bodies um, to say, you know, we can help do an assessment, if you like, of your cybersecurity. They stood up the um, the Cyber Security Center um, that uh, part of its mandate was to provide those services to have a, a call-in number if um, individuals or parties had questions with regards to a potential issue. Uh, they provided um, a list of um, you know, security approved vendors. Um, so there was a whole wide range of different things that they ended up doing to make sure that we were doing everything that we could, that we could kind of imagine at the time to uh, safeguard our elections from cyber threats. Um, and then the other thing is that as we learned more, I pulled in um, Global Affairs Canada through the rapid response mechanism, as well as Heritage Canada, because one of the things that um, you know, I learned and I believe very firmly is that one of the best methods to protect our democracy was a well-informed citizenry. And so um, as part of that, um, Heritage Canada had a uh, public education program uh, for citizen engagement and, um, you know, public awareness when it comes to cybersecurity um, to really ensure that we were trying to tick all of the boxes and maybe one other thing that I'll add is um, through that and through um, defense, we were put in touch with the NATO Strategic Communications uh, Center who I then invited to um, Ottawa to brief the parliamentary press gallery uh, to talk about how they may be able to identify um, cybersecurity threats, particularly with regards to mis- and disinformation. Um, and through that, they brought, uh, for example, a reporter from Finland who uh, was very familiar with Russian interference attempts to be able to brief the press gallery. So we really tried to do this as whole of government as possible um, to identify where the different vulnerabilities were in the system um, and provide uh, information and support to each of those different actors. And I understand from your witness statement that you wanted to consult with all of the political parties for their input and feedback in the process. When you say kind of input and feedback, what in what feedback were you eliciting from the political parties? So uh, from the get-go, I was engaged with um, opposition members as well as political parties. Um, I believe uh, in the fall, as early as the fall of 2017, I had meetings um, with each of my opposition critics, uh, the critics from uh, public safety and of democratic institutions, uh, to talk about the fact that we were building this plan to get their input as to what they were concerned about and to let them know that um, I thought this was something that we needed to have an ongoing dialogue with regards to. Um, following those initial meetings, my staff met with either staff from the political parties themselves um, or some of the staff of the critics to keep them informed and engaged throughout um, the process. Um, and, you know, even in my public comments when I announced the plan in 2019, I referenced the fact that um, I had been engaging with the opposition, the political parties uh, throughout. Because I felt it was extremely important that this be nonpartisan and that we have a consensus and build trust uh, in terms of the plan and the process. Because one of the things um, that you'll note in the protocol, and you may be getting to this, but is that um, democracy is very fragile and it rests on trust. It rests on trust of citizens in the process and in the outcome. And so it, it was vitally important that all political parties be involved in, um, in understanding what the plan was going to be and having a sense of comfort of it going into the election so that if something should arise, we would have a consensus and we would have a comfort to know that, uh, that this was being um, monitored and reviewed and if there was something that needed to be said, it was coming from a trusted voice and a trusted source uh, because what we didn't want to have, you referenced this earlier in terms of 
the Obama dilemma is the very fact of making a public comment can be seen as interference, um, whether that's from a partisan or from a nonpartisan body. And so we needed to have um, a way to engage and to share information by which all of the parties would be confident. And of course, what we saw in the US election uh, was that there were very partisan comments on both sides with regards to whether the information should or should not have been released or even whether um, a foreign actor should have been named. And so there, there, this is a very sensitive and complex issue uh, for which I felt it was really important that it be as nonpartisan as possible, well, completely nonpartisan, um, and that um, everybody had comfort in where we were going with it. And of course, it was the very first time we had ever done something like this as well. And so for me, it was really important um, that all of the political parties, all of the opposition parties had comfort in where we were going. And in terms of the input and consultation with the political parties, did you receive specific feedback on the particulars of the plan? Like in the composition of panel of five, for instance, did you specifically elicit uh, feedback or input? Uh, we certainly presented it to them. Um, I wasn't part of those conversations because that was happening at the staff level. But I think, um, you know, what you could see from the various reports is that going into the 2019 election, there was generally comfort with where we were. So I want to ask you about the panel of five. I won't get into the mechanics of it, um, but that the panel is composed of five senior public servants. Um, and I understand from your witness statement that for the composition of the panel, you took inspiration um, from France, who'd used their electoral authority, which was an impartial body of legal advisors to address the Macron leaks. And so, and I understand in terms of the concept stage of the plan, you had considered forming a panel of judges or other eminent Canadians, but ultimately settled on um, selecting senior public servants. Is that correct? Correct. And on what basis did you decide um, the composition of the panel of five? Mm, sure. So the very first point is I felt it was really important that uh, partisans be removed from the process. And so even though I was a minister, still I'm a minister of the crown, but was the minister responsible, I was also running in the election. And so any involvement of a partisan minister, prime minister, during the writ period, uh, during the caretaker convention for something this sensitive, even if everything um, you know, was fine, could be seen as having a partisan interest in whether or not information would be released publicly. And so I wanted to remove, that was one of my primary objectives, was to remove any notion that there could be um, a partisan interest in the decision as to whether or not to release information if something should occur. So <clears throat> I was very interested in what France had um, in terms of their council of legal advisors. I think colloquially they refer to them as the Conseil de Minas Gris, right? It's, a, it's folks who um, are very well respected um, in, in France, but, but it wasn't something new that they had done for that election. This was a, an institution that they have in place generally. We don't have something like that in Canada. We have Elections Canada. Um, I did consult with Elections Canada. That's not really their role um, to, you know, determine if um, if there has been foreign interference in an election. They don't necessarily have the capacity to do that. Um, I also consulted with the Commissioner of Canada elections at the time. Again, not really the right space for them either. Um, and so trying to figure out who would be best uh, placed here. And one of the reasons why I settled on um, senior public servants who are independent, nonpartisan, professional, um, is that they would have access to information and understanding of the threat landscape to determine whether something was irregular and whether or not it would have an impact on a free and fair <clears throat> election. And the other part of it um, in terms of the composition was that um, the government of Canada can be quite siloed sometimes. And so it was important that we brought together those that had 
uh, access to the information. So the head of CSC, the head of CSIS, who are seeing what's happening um, and can bring that up to this group quickly, because if something happens, there needs to be a quick decision as to whether it's going to be released publicly or not. Um, so they had access to that information and a very good understanding of, an, of the intelligence world um, and what intelligence could perhaps be linked to evidence, because that's another important piece. Intelligence is not evidence. They need to be certain if they're going to suggest something, uh, because again, the very act of suggesting or making a public declaration will have an impact on the outcome of the election. And then the Deputy Minister <clears throat> for Global Affairs Canada as well, again, uh, because perhaps there are steps that might need to be taken with regards to intelligence that don't merit a public intervention, but maybe there are previous things that could be done, such as like a démarche to uh, an embassy or something of those lines, and they would have an understanding of the global context. Uh, and then the NSAI, uh, the, sorry, the um, clerk of the Privy Council, again, as the most senior public servant, um, and the deputy uh, for justice. And the reason why I felt it was important, <clears throat> excuse me, to have the deputy for justice there was specifically to have that legal perspective and to have knowledge and understanding of, you know, the, the corpus of judicial history and precedent in this country and to ensure that the democratic rights of Canadian citizens, of uh, candidates of political parties were uh, front and center and understood in making such uh, a profound decision that would have such an important impact on an election process and outcome. And so with the focus of trying to include nonpartisan individuals on the panel, um, as I understand it, deputy ministers are appointed by the prime minister on the advice of the clerk of the Privy Council. Is that correct? My understanding. And um, that appointment is for an indefinite period? To my knowledge, I'm not involved in that, so, yeah. And, well, the real point being the prime minister um, technically has the power to dismiss a deputy minister, is that right? Again, uh, I think so, but that's a bit beyond. But what I would say is that um, certainly, I'd say every deputy that I have had has served, I think, well under successive governments of different political stripes. And I have, um, you know, tremendous confidence in their ability to be uh, nonpartisan, um, independent and professional. And, um, you know, many of the deputies that I have had had served under conservative governments. And I'm sure many of the deputies that serve under liberal governments will also serve uh, under a future uh, government of a different stripe. That's, that's the role of the public service is uh, to be professional, to be independent and to be nonpartisan. And particularly during a writ period uh, where the government is under the caretaker convention. And so part of where this panel of five fits in is also under a care the caretaker convention, which is something that has existed in Canada since Confederation. Um, where uh, the public service takes on the responsibilities of the government because the government is a political actor at that moment in time seeking election or, or re-election. And so I think it fit very neatly uh, within the existing institutions that we have. And, you know, I would say that, um, you know, Canadians tend to have confidence uh, in the public service to act in a nonpartisan way. And so you've indicated that the panel's operational only during the caretaker period. In terms, again, of the concept of the plan, did you consider um, the creation of a permanent body? I did not at the time. Um, remember, again, this is the very first time we're doing something like that. And so um, I felt it was important that, you know, we establish it. Um, but then there also be a review of the process um, as it happened to learn any lessons and provide any recommendations, uh, which ended up being the, the first uh, JED report um, in terms of whether this should be something that we continue with or whether there should be more of a permanence. Um, it was also one of the first times that we had, um, well, the second time we had a fixed date election in Canada as well. So there were many kind of different factors. I think in some respects, it's almost a bit harder for foreign actors to 
um, interfere when you have, you know, uh, more spontaneous elections. When you know there's a fixed date, you have a runway to lead up to. And so we were very much learning as we were going. And those lessons, uh, you know, from that should then be applied for future and subsequent elections. And in terms of a, a permanent body, my, my question is also focused on, did you consider the creation of a body that existed outside of the caretaker period? So that would sit for longer than a six week period. Uh, no, um, I mean, in the sense, all of those individuals who sit on the panel continue to exercise um, you know, their responsibilities as respective deputies and heads of agencies. Um, and one would expect that they would continue to talk to each other. However, in the formal capacity, uh, it should only exist uh, during the writ period, because that is the time when people are making decisions about who they are voting for. And uh, either before or after, the, the government is in place. Um, and my focus uh, in terms of protecting our democracy with specific, specifically with regards to the election event and election events, as opposed to, um, you know, broader foreign interference that happens by attacking government systems or, you know, going through uh, other things outside of um, a writ period. And we have already in the Government of Canada apparatus uh, roles and responsibilities for those activities, what we didn't have was something concrete for the writ period itself. And so we've heard that the panel's role effectively is to notify the public of an event um, during the election that threatened Canada's ability to have a free and fair election. And we've also heard evidence that the panel interpreted the threshold for announce an announcement as being high or very high. In the concept stage, was the threshold intended to be at a high level? Yes, and it was very important that it's at a high level because again, remember, the very act of making a decision to announce something publicly could be seen as interference itself. And this is a point that was actually very important for all of the political parties because um, for those of us that have run an election or been in an election, either as a candidate or working on it, it's a very intense time. There's a lot of information going around. It is uh, chaotic, so to speak. And so if there's going to be um, a high, uh, you know, the if there's going to be a decision to say, you Canadian citizens, you need to know that a foreign actor has interfered in our election, the threshold needs to be high because there's a it, it's it's resting on the trust of Canadians in the process being um, on the integrity of the process. And if someone is saying uh, that the integrity of the process is being questioned or has been compromised, they need to be certain of that fact and they need to be certain that this is something of significant enough value of the national interest that it be made public. And the political parties were very clear that that was something that was important to them as well. And when you speak about the integrity of the process and the high threshold, was it contemplated the focus on integrity of the process would be examined at a writing by writing level or a national level? Both. It could be either because it's Canada doesn't have one national election. We have 338 individual elections that make up an electoral event. And so everything is context specific. Um, you know, it could be uh, something that happens at the national level that everybody is aware of or is being um, impacted by. It could be as something that's happening in one singular uh, riding, but that's where um, the importance for the panel to have an understanding of the landscape of the activities and the potential impact was so important um, to make that decision. And it was um, specific in the cabinet directive to give the panel the authority and the responsibility to make that judgment call. And did you anticipate that the panel could take actions in relation to intelligence or information that fell below the threshold? Well, that wouldn't be the panel's decision there. Um, that would be up to the individual agencies um, 
who have those responsibilities. The panel's primary focus was on whether there was something of such significance that it would have, um, that it would compromise the free and fair election by Canadians and be in the national interest. And so that was really where the panel's um, responsibilities lay. I want to ask you one more uh, briefings related question. Can I have CAN15506, please? Scroll down, staying on the first page, but scroll down a bit, please. And if we look at the third bullet, it says prior to and during GE 2019, deputy ministers provided regular briefings on election security to the then Minister of Democratic Institutions, Karina Gould. Um, were you briefed regularly by deputy ministers uh, prior to and during GE 2019? Not during. I didn't receive a single briefing during the election. Did you expect to receive briefings during the election? I uh, expected not to receive any briefings during the election. Uh, I explicitly designed the process so that I would not receive any briefings during the process because as I mentioned, um, I had a vested interest in the outcome of the election. And so I felt it would be completely inappropriate to receive those briefings. And that's why uh, it was so important to create this independent, nonpartisan uh, body that would be responsible during the RIT period. And so you've indicated already you're receiving intelligence, it's high level, and no briefings during the RIT period. I understand from your witness summary that you did not receive any intelligence during the RIT period relating to allegations in Don Valley North, is that correct? Correct. And I understand as well that you were not aware that secret cleared Liberal Party representatives were briefed uh, in relation to allegations of interference in the Don Valley North nomination contest? That is correct. I, again, as, uh, as I created this um, system uh, and policy, it was very important that each of the political parties had their own doors into the security agencies that the government, myself as Minister of Democratic Institution, would not be aware of so that they would have trust to have that engagement with the security agencies. And I understand, uh, finally, that you were not briefed on intelligence assessments suggesting that there were likely at least two transfers of funds approximating $250,000 from PRC officials in Canada, possibly for FI-related purposes that were transferred via an influential community leader to the staff member of a 2019 federal election and then to an Ontario MPP. That is correct. So you did not receive that intelligence? No, I would have received um, something at a much higher level. And were you briefed on a TRM conducted in advance of GE 43 to reduce the FI threat posed by the government of Pakistan? Uh, at a very high level, but I wouldn't have received um, information as to what or with whom. Thank you. Thank you. Cross examination uh, by uh, counsel for Jenny Kwan. Commissioner, good morning, Ms. Gould. Good morning. Just going to take a minute here to. So, Ms. Gould, this morning I wanted to ask questions uh, specifically related to the kind of information that you considered when you were developing uh, the threshold and sort of considering the plan for uh, protecting Canada's democracy. In your witness statement, and you've said this in your testimony as well, that your briefings were quite high level, that you actually looked outside of Canada to see the ways in which foreign interference had affected elections. Do you think it would have been helpful to know the specific details, though, of foreign interference in Canada so that you could better address what was happening here, because perhaps the dynamics would have been different than perhaps our US partners or other countries in the world? Okay, well, I want to take you back to 2017 for a moment because um, 
it was the first time that we were thinking about uh, foreign interference in terms of cybersecurity. And it was the first time that we were seeing these wide scale attacks around the world uh, in real time. Typically, foreign interference before was very, very covert, right? Um, and uh, human to human, right? We weren't seeing this kind of hacking of systems, uh, divulging of information, trying to pollute the information ecosystem as we were at the time. And so it was incredibly important to learn from real world examples uh, that we were seeing happening to figure out what we needed to do here at home to avoid something like that in the future. Of course, I was briefed at a high level as to what foreign interference activities, um, attempts at foreign interference, I should say, uh, were seen here in Canada. So I would correct a little bit um, the premise of your question and say that, yes, both of those were happening. Um, and that was incredibly important to figure out how we protect ourselves. Also, the understanding is that threat actors don't often act the same way twice uh, because once they've been found out to do one thing, uh, they don't necessarily continue to do that activity. And so you're constantly trying to keep up and understand what potential new things are happening. No one before the US presidential election thought that Russia was using Facebook and Twitter um, and posing as Americans uh, through their bot farms at the uh, Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. All of that was learned after the fact. So it was really important to have that understanding uh, in order to develop a plan to protect ourselves as best as we can. I appreciate the helpful answer. And so just to disentangle that a bit so that we have an understanding, when you say you were being briefed at a high level of what was happening in Canada, is it fair to say that you were being briefed on the way in which foreign interference happens, the modes, who the players might be in the Canadian landscape, but not necessarily on specific events? Just so, I mean, yeah, so it would answer. be high level in the sense of uh, which are the foreign actors that um, try to engage the most in foreign interference activities uh, and some of the ways in which uh, the agencies would have seen them try to do that. Um, so there was an understanding of what the threats are in Canada. I would say that um, generally speaking, and as I mentioned in my previous answer, um, it is known that there have been attempts to interfere uh, in Canadian democracy since the beginning of Confederation. Um, but I would say that our intelligence agencies are, um, you know, I think, quite adept at trying to monitor that and if they are able to then um, share that information with the RCMP, whose job would be then if they have the evidence to act upon it. Okay, so if I'm under, I think I understand your testimony to be that you did have some understanding of the ways in which uh, FI operated here, who the risk, or sorry, who the um, threat actors might be. And, and so, over the course of the last few weeks um, in this commission, we've learned that foreign interference can be very discreet <sighs> events that perhaps on their own don't add up to very much, but in the aggregate do. Did you have a similar understanding of foreign interference at the time that you developed this particular threshold and plan? Um, yes, could be. Um, however, I would say that the emphasis on this plan was certainly with regards to cyber security, um, but also understanding the entirety of how foreign actors could interfere in uh, an electoral event and ensuring that the respective agencies had the tools that they needed uh, to be able to act upon it when they had the evidence to act upon it. Okay, so it does sound like you had a similar understanding that perhaps, you know, one WeChat post doesn't do much, but you add them all up together and there's a collective um, impact of that. Could be or could not be. Right. Right. Everything is context specific. Um, and every, you know, it's, it's very hard to say that this one particular thing um, might have an impact or... As I was saying in my testimony earlier, the threshold, for example, for the panel was very high, 
but it could have been something that happened in one riding or it could have been something that happened at a national level. It would be completely context specific. That's fair. So then given how context specific everything is and, and you have that same understanding, did you consider a sliding scale approach that could adapt to that context so that the threshold wasn't so high, but perhaps if it were triggered at different levels, a different level of response could address so the situation? So I'll just push back gently a bit because sure. um, Again, you can't really have a sliding scale because, again, you can't really imagine exactly what's going to happen during the election because, as I said, threat actors are going to change. For example, they're watching these proceedings right now yes. and are likely going to be changing how they're acting in Canada as they're seeing uh, how we are responding in this very setting. So. The panel did a series of tabletop exercises to imagine different scenarios, right? The site task force imagined different scenarios and how they might react. Uh, but again, it will all depend on that exact moment, what is happening and the context in which it is happening. Um, so it's, you can't really have a rubric to say if X, then Y and Z, because if you did, you might end up interfering in an election that you maybe didn't need to uh, in terms of saying something publicly because the context will depend on what is happening in that moment. So I, I know that you would like to have a, a rubric and a box that says this is what you need to act when, but it's really important that there's that discretion and that judgment in place before something is made public. Actually, I will agree with you that a rubric and a box is probably not possible given the amount of ways in which you could for interfere. But what I mean more is sort of a, a sliding scale in the way that the national terrorism threat levels exist. There's different threat levels and there are different responses as a result. And so not only would you have a sliding scale with respect to when to respond, but how to respond so that you're not necessarily interfering. And again, not at the minutia of, you know, if X happens, you do Y, leaving, of course, a great degree of discretion, but that way there's no under or over reaction. To a particular I event. don't think you would ever be able to determine if there's an under and over reaction because of the nature of an election when emotions are so high, when the outcome is so um, personal to so many people and it has such a great impact on the country um, that you're going to be able to be in a place where everyone says, oh, because you followed the sliding scale, we're okay with it. That's kind of the crux of the Obama dilemma. He saw what was happening, understood what was happening, didn't feel that he could say something because he was worried that by the very fact of saying something publicly, he would have an outcome on, he would have an impact on the outcome. And so what I would say to you is that those, those rubrics, those responses on a more granular level already exist within the agencies uh, and they already have ways to deal with things that happen on a more minor level and they make those decisions as to how and when to respond and react um, in a way that hopefully doesn't further compromise the national security of Canada and of Canadians, but also the integrity of the electoral process. I really do appreciate your answer, and despite the follow-up, I doubt I can ask a question in eight <laughs> seconds. So thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Council for Michael Chung. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Mr. Wold. Uh, Ms. Morgan asked you about uh, consultation with political parties regarding the critical election incident public protocol. You remember that? I do. And I believe your evidence is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but your evidence on that was we presented it to them. Um, and I'd, I want to ask you if you'd agree that presenting a plan is quite different from meaningful consultation on a plan. So we had conversations first before the plan was presented, and I'll take you back to my testimony earlier with Ms. Morgan, where I said the first conversations we had were likely in the fall of 2017, and the plan was made public in January of 2019. So throughout that period of time, there were ongoing conversations uh, with the political parties, uh, first to understand what some of their issues and challenges were to get their level of comfort. So for example, one of the 
pieces was CSE offered to do um, technical audits of their systems. I don't think a single political party agreed to that because they didn't want the government to go in there, but they did say one thing that would be helpful would be to have a list of trusted vendors. So there was a continuous dialogue and engagement uh, as we were building the plan and then it was presented in its final stage when it was public uh, in uh, the winter of 2019. That, that's helpful. And I just want to make sure that we have your evidence because my specific concern is not on the plan as a whole, but is on the panel of five, the, the critical election incident public protocol. And so I believe that's what, in response to Ms. Morgan's question, you said we presented it to them. And I'm wondering on that, on the panel of five, was there meaningful consultation with the political parties or was the plan just presented to them as you had created it? Um, I couldn't tell you the exact conversations because the conversation that I had specifically was in the fall of 2017. And then after that, it would have been at the staff level. Okay. And so can you point to any specific suggestions made by opposition parties that made their way into the cabinet directive on the panel? There was... Um, there was a, a general acceptance, and I didn't receive any pushback at the time, uh, that public servants uh, were, uh, that there was, there was no pushback that these public servants uh, be on that panel. Okay. And I have a question about the public servants on the panel. You say that, so the panel is the clerk, the NSIA, and three deputy ministers, correct? Um, you say that they're all nonpartisan, and we certainly would expect them to be, but you also referred to them as independent. So I want to ask a question about that. Would you agree there's an important difference between a nonpartisan at pleasure appointee and a public office with true institutional independence from government? I would say that uh, as your client was Minister of Democratic Reform, who served under, uh, who served alongside and was served by the uh, professional nonpartisan public service, that they are uh, independent in the advice that they provide to government. They are loyal in the implementation of it. But uh, I have very, very uh, strong confidence in our public service that they serve the government of the time, but they serve equally well regardless of what the partisan color of that government is. And I appreciate that, but that, that's not quite my question, which is just there's a, a key difference between an at-pleasure appointee who can be removed, and an office with institutional independence. I can give you a couple examples. Judges would be an example. They cannot be removed. The office of the, the Chief Electoral Officer of Elections Canada, who serves a 10-year non-renewable term, has institutional independence. You'd agree there's a difference between that kind of institutional independence and at pleasure deputy minister appointees. I, th I think that what you're getting at is um, is not quite appropriate in the sense of public servants are nonpartisan. And while, yes, they, the, the very heads of them could be removed, um, it, it is not something that I think um, is the right way to frame this because um, they are responsible first and foremost to protecting Canada. Um, that is their job, um, and protecting the institution of government, um, and that is something that they take very seriously, um, and they are not partisan in nature, um, and particularly during the caretaker period, uh, which is a long-standing convention in Canadian um, governance, uh, they take on the role of a government at that time, and particularly in this cabinet directive, they are given that authority. Um, if you look at the cabinet directive, uh, yes, they inform the prime minister, but they also have to inform the other political parties as well uh, to make sure that this is something that is fair and um, information that is being received by everyone ahead of it being made public. So I appreciate all that. I just want to try one more time because I have your evidence on the nonpartisanship and I'm, I'm not asking questions about that. I'm, I'm wanting to ask questions on the independent. So I, perhaps I can put it this way. There's a difference between a at pleasure appointee who can be removed at pleasure and the in institutional independence that say a judge or the chief electoral officer of the election of Elections Canada has. There, there, yes, there is 
a difference. However, in this instance, uh, these are very professional individuals who take their job of being nonpartisan professional public servants very seriously and whose primary responsibility is protecting Canadians, Canada, and our governing, governing institutions. Thank you, Minister Gould. That's very helpful. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Council for Irene O'Toole. Minister Gould. Uh, my name is Tom Jarman. I'm counsel for Aaron O'Toole. Um, and so let's go back to the panel of five and the threshold, um, which I'm sure everybody will regret me getting into. Um, you said, by, and the panel of five has said it was a high threshold. Uh, they said uh, need reliable information. Your words this morning, they needed to be certain. Is that correct? Correct. So, so it's by design you've got that particular way. I would submit to you that, in fact, what you've done is you've institutionalized the Obama dilemma. Because on October 7th, 2016, the Obama administration actually told the American public that Russia was interfering in the election. And the subsequent criticism of him and his administration was that he took so long to do it while they were looking for certainty. Are you aware of that? I've read all of the public information about it. Okay, but you're aware that, the, in fact, the Obama administration did alert the U.S. citizenry about intervention in the 2016 election, prior to the election. I, I, I don't recall exactly that okay. comment. Thank yeah. you. Um, could we go to your witness statement, WIT 62, at paragraph 7? Now, in the second paragraph, this is the discussion about the, uh, your, your initiatives with Facebook, Microsoft, and Twitter in order to uh, come to a voluntary, uh, I guess, regime to address information manipulation. Mm -hmm. it, and those were, did you negotiate with any other platforms or approach any other platforms? Uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and uh, Google were the main interlocutors. Uh, I know that uh, PCO approached other social media platforms, um, but it was harder to engage with them because they didn't have representatives in Canada. Okay, so no one approached Tencent about WeChat? Uh, I don't think they had um, an office in Canada at the time. And I would say at the time in 2019, uh, the primary focus was really on Russia. Okay. I'll, I'll put the, that, those other questions to other individuals in. Um, I'd like to look at uh, paragraph 11 of the witness summary. And um, you speak there about interference in the nomination process. And I see the statement that alleged interference in a nomination process would not be significant enough to question the integrity of an election in its entirety. But it would be sufficient enough to question the integrity of the election in the particular writing, wouldn't it? Well, there are agencies uh, that already have responsibility for that specific instance. So political parties uh, are responsible for nominations. Elections Canada has rules and laws already, How? and the Sorry, RCMP. Excuse me. How is Elections Canada responsible in nominations process? Well, well just for a moment, my friend is not entitled to Well, so the, the, rephrase your question, I think. I was just saying, in, the, in that statement, it said that elections Canada, the, the remits of the affected political party, Elections Canada, and or the RCMP. How is elections can is this within the remit of Elections Canada? The well, for a nomination process, it would be the political party itself that is okay. responsible. And of course, if they were breaking the law by uh, having... Uh, let's say, foreign um, money involved, uh, which would 
be uh, illegal under the Canada Elections Act, then the RCMP or the police of jurisdiction would have the authority to act on that. So I was going to say, Elections Canada, it's the financial operation of the campaign, and the RCMP, it's acts of fraud or things like that. Well, as, as you know, we have a separation of, of government and uh, law enforcement in this country. So, yes, the RCMP would respond if, if it was known a law was broken or suspected a law was broken. And just going to the uh, th uh, threshold for another second, um, with respect to the, the balancing of these things, we see the effect on discourse at the general level on the election, at the riding level, but what about the effect on political discourse? If foreign interference affects the political discourse, is that an impact on an election? Context-specific, again, uh, so it, it could be. Certainly what we saw um, in the U.S. presidential election, it was. Um, again, though, as um, anyone who has run in an election, uh, the information ecosystem is uh, quite chaotic during a writ period. And so to be able to determine uh, if it was foreign interference that caused a change in the discourse or it was something else, a statement by uh, a politician, a policy from a political party, a platform from a political party, um, you know, there, there needs, it's, it's hard to determine which one of those things might be the most effective. However, that's where uh, the involvement of the intelligence agencies and intelligence that they see impacting something would then be submitted to the panel to make that judgment call. Uh, but again, it's very context specific and it's one of the biggest challenges and one of the reasons why um, I believe, you know, Russia, particularly in uh, the lead up to the 2016 election, used social media uh, so effectively, but you can't necessarily say that Russia was responsible um, or their information caused the outcome of the 2016 election. Because remember, at the end of the day, I, I believe this very strongly, we need to protect Canadian citizens to give them the tools and the information to make informed decisions. And at the end of the day, if they go into that ballot box and no one has told them how to vote or is holding them to vote a certain way or bribing them a certain or bribing them, but rather they are going and making a decision based on the information that they have, that vote is valid. And the outcome of that vote is valid because that is a decision a Canadian has made. And so to be able to determine specifically that, that, um, that they got there because of one specific element in an election is quite challenging, which is why the threshold was set so high and why the intervention of the panel needed to be taken with the seriousness uh, with which I think it was taken. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Council for the Conservative Party, Maître de Luca. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to quote from your 2017 mandate letter from the Prime Minister, uh, which says, as Minister of Democratic Institutions, your overarching goal is or was to strengthen the openness and fairness of Canada's public institutions and also to restore Canadians' trusts and participation in our democratic processes. Do you recall that? Do you recall those words? Uh, would you be able to show them to me? Uh, I would, but I don't have a note right now of the document. It was, uh, it was part of it. If you could show it to me, that would be helpful. Sure. Yeah. COM18. And do you know which paragraph? Um, scroll up. Keep going. Well, why don't we do it this way? Uh, do you believe that uh, the prospect of foreign interference to the extent and, and to the extent that it actually took place in our in our elections is contrary to the mandate that the prime minister charged you with? 
Sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. To the extent that foreign interference actually took place in the 2019, that would have been contrary to what you were charged with safeguarding against in your mandate. Well, my job was to come up with a plan and a policy uh, to try as best as possible to prevent foreign interference. Um, it doesn't mean that there weren't um, ongoing attempts, as I mentioned at the outset, of foreign interference um, throughout all elections. But perhaps I can just get to your first point, because one of the reasons why I was mandated to restore uh, trust in democracy was because at the time, um, we were uh, when we were elected, it was after the Fair Elections Act that uh, the current leader of the opposition had put in place, which actually reduced citizens' ability to cast their ballots. And uh, that was the primary overarching objective, was to make sure that every Canadian citizen would be able to cast their ballot, be able to participate in our democracy, and have confidence in the process. Can I ask that MMC... Uh, 5020 be pulled up. Have it in front of you? I think so. And this, and this appears to be a summary of the CSIS briefings in the possession of the Privy Council Office relating to PRC foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 general elections and a general description of those documents. And can, can by my count, uh, between June 2018 and 2000, August 2019, you received seven briefings on foreign election interference. Does that sound right? Yes, and I, I would just um, gently correct you in the sense that I, I'm not sure this is specifically related to the PRC. It would have been uh, an overall uh, look at foreign interference generally from a variety of actors. Well, the, the heading actually says PRC. Do you dispute that? I don't see that here. At the top, but, CSIS yeah. briefings and intelligence products on PRC foreign interference. This is the, the heading of the document. Okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay. But I would just say that those briefings that I would have received would have been general with regards to a variety of actors. Okay. And safe to say that at least as a result of those briefings, you are well aware of the issue of foreign interference in uh, Canadian elections. I would uh, say that to make the statement that there uh, is foreign interference in Canadian elections is um, not entirely accurate. I would say that what these briefings suggested to me were provided to me was an overview of attempted foreign interference broadly around the world, as well as activities that potentially could be observed here in Canada. So you, you received, let me get this straight, you received seven briefings on foreign interference. Are you suggesting that as a result of those seven briefings, you weren't convinced that any foreign interference uh, in, the, in the election? I did not say that. Let me finish the question, yeah. please. Are you suggesting that you weren't convinced that any foreign interference had taken place in connection with uh, the Canadian elections process? Uh, what I said was they would show me they would share information with me of what potential interference could be, of activities that they had seen as attempts and things that we needed to be aware of um, in terms of what could possibly happen during an election. Um, certainly, I was the Minister of Democratic Institutions uh, before the 2021 election um, and for a very brief period of time after the 2019 election. You're not suggesting that attempts at foreign interference have to be successful and, to, and have to actually materially impact the result 
uh, be before they're taken seriously or they're dealt with. I'm not. And in fact, we are here right now today because we took attempts at foreign interference very seriously. It's why I was mandated to do it in 2017. And it's why uh, I came up with that plan to protect Canadian democracy. We did take it extremely seriously. It's why we're here today. It's why we're actually looking at documents that were prepared with regards to foreign interference, something I will note the previous Conservative government didn't do. Can I ask you to uh, turn up uh, CAN 004252? And this indicates that it's a uh, briefing or a secure it's a it's a briefing or a security brief that you would have received in or about October 29 2019 from CSIS did you in fact receive this briefing I did receive a briefing following uh, the 2019 election I couldn't confirm the date with you and I have only seen this particular document in preparation for today's proceedings if we could perhaps uh, scroll to page three of this document. October 29, 2019 would have been after the 2019 election, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, at the bottom of page three, there's a, a discussion of a China threat update. You see that? And part of it has been redacted. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you recall being updated with respect to the China threat on or about October 29, 2019 after the general election? I would have been briefed at a very high level that um, they were monitoring the activities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and with, within uh, or just, I guess it's after the third redacted uh, box, uh, there's the, the tail end of an explanation regarding um, but it says limited specific incidents suggested of FI, which were briefed to relevant clients, GC and political parties during the writ period, e.g. Don Valley. Do you recall receiving that briefing or that information as part of, uh, as part of this October 29, 2019? It would have briefing. been a high level. Um, I wouldn't have received the specifics about Don Valley and would have said something to the effect of um, limited activity viewed action taken, but it wouldn't have been to that specific level. Okay, so I just want to be clear though, when, what, what, what you just described as what you would have received would have been only at this briefing? Or, or, or it would have been all of the briefings. It, would have, it was high level. I was never given um, specifics about candidates, parties, locations, um, or individuals. Were you given specifics as part of this briefing? No. Were you, were you given even generalities relating to voting irregularities for Don Valley North no. prior to this briefing? No. If, let me finish. Oh, you, well, okay, no. Okay. Yeah. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mette Sirwa for RCDA. Morning. Minister Gold, you, you mentioned during your, your examination in chief that a primary national interest of Russia involves inciting chaos within democratic nations, right? One of them, yes. Including the 43rd and 44th general election? I wouldn't know uh, that specific for those elections because um, I was not the Minister of Democratic Institutions at the time. Uh, but what I can say is it doesn't necessarily mean that that was their objective in Canada, but that has been one of their objectives in terms of why they engage in cyber activities during election periods in democracies. So, so your evidence is that Russia has an objective and to in interfering, and a national interest in interfering in uh, democratic nations, but perhaps not Canada. 
could Canada is a democratic nation. It's a member of NATO. And so therefore we need to be alert and aware. It doesn't mean that Canada uh, is necessarily the main focus, um, but certainly what we see in democratic countries around the world, uh, one of the objectives that Russia has is creating chaos. Uh, maybe Canada is not the main focus, but it's certainly one of the fo key focus. I, I, I couldn't necessarily say that. Um, I mean, it would uh, we would have to have evidence of that, and um, I'm not sure that that's something that I'm allowed to talk about. Yes, that's the thing. My question is not about whether we have evidence or not. My question is more um, on Russia's intent in differing mm -hmm. in democratic nations, as you testified about this morning. Um, and so I'll just ask the question again, just to, to be sure I understand. Um, are you saying that Russia does not interfere in Canada or does not have the intent of interfering in Canada, but has the intent of interfering in other democratic nations? I think Russia has the intent of interfering in most democratic nations, uh, particularly those that are members of NATO. But not the 43rd and 44th general election in Canada? I, I wouldn't be able to say I wasn't. Uh, I was Minister of Democratic Institutions before those events took place. I understand. Um, but certainly Russia was something that we were concerned about, which is why we created this whole um, infrastructure to protect our elections. You expect that Russia may, may have an intent? To be prepared. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and I wanted to move now to the threshold, um, just with a little time I have. Activity when determining whether the high threshold has been met, right? That's why, that's why you have five different panel members. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Um, is it possible that for um, different members of the Canadian public, um, also there's um, different conce conceptions of what a high threshold um, is? I'm thinking in particular with, re with respect to diaspora members. For instance, maybe a, a pro-democracy diaspora uh, member may think that the high threshold has been met by a certain situation, but that may, same conclusion may not be reached by the panel of five. Uh, certainly, I think um, for different actors, there would be high energy moment uh, that has a huge impact. So that's why it was important to be able to have um, a group that could make that determination. It's possible that the group concludes that there's a, the, the high threshold hasn't been met, although with the same information, someone from a diaspora group may conclude that the high threshold has been met. I guess what I would say to that is that um, those the, the panel is put in place specifically to determine if that threshold meets um, the fact that a free and fair election has been compromised, the ability to have one, and that it's in the national interest to release this information publicly. Well, I, I know why the, why the panel of five has been created. That, that's, that's clear, and thanks to you. Um, I just want to understand whether it's possible for the panel to reach one conclusion with respect to the threshold and a member of the diaspora community to reach a different conclusion with respect, with well, respect to in, the threshold. With, with all due respect, um, I'm the member of the diaspora community um, is not necessarily charged with protecting Canada's democracy. And so their understanding of when and what to say publicly may be different. I will certainly grant you that. But I think what's important here is that we have a, a group of the highest ranking public servants in the country who determine when that needs to be released publicly. Well, I'm out of time, but I, I thank you. Yes. Council for the uh, for UCC. Good morning, Minister Gould. Good morning. Uh, John Duty, I'm counsel for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Um, we've heard from you and others that the, the, the motivation to create the plan to protect Canada's democracy was due to Russia's interference in the US and around the world. From when you got that mandate in 2017 and leading up to the 2019 election, did you see that concern decrease or increase from Russia specifically? 
uh, well, I'm not sure I can comment on specific intelligence. No, <laughs> so, but I mean, but what I, the country. What, but what yeah. I can say is, uh, well, I, I think that would um, maybe be classified information. But what I can say is that um, I remained very concerned um, as I continued to learn um, that this is something that Canada needed to do and we needed to make sure that we had a plan and a process in place. Okay. And you stated in your testimony this morning that uh, in every election, there's been attempts at foreign interference, but whether they're successful or not is another issue. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that there are attempts by Russia in to interfere in the 2019 and 21 election in Canada? I don't think I can comment on that. So you believe that every election there's attempts, but you don't know about these two with Russia? Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I don't think I can comment on that. Okay. Uh, and you said in, in response to a question for, uh, by Council Mr. O'Toole, that as long as a Canadian voter uh, make sure I understand this, go to the voter box with their own understanding of the issues without direct foreign interference, that that is a valid vote. Yes, I mean, if you consider an election, a writ period, there's a lot of information that is spread even by domestic actors that is not necessarily true. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is um, you know, unless you can tie it specifically to a foreign actor, it's hard to determine that that is what... Um, made them cast that ballot. So one of the reasons why one of the pillars in the plan to protect democracy was about informing citizens is so that citizens can have the tools to be able to identify information, uh, see valid sources. Um, and that's also the reason why we invited the NATO Stratcom to come talk to Canadian journalists as well, so that they as arbiters of information can hopefully provide the best sources to Canadian citizens. But in that scenario, if the understanding of that voter is incorrect due to misinformation or disinformation being spread by a foreign state, would that vote still be valid? If that citizen cast that ballot, yes. And, and they were not forced to cast that ballot. I mean, at the end of the day, Canadian citizens make decisions on their votes based on a wide range of issues, a uh, wide range of access to information. There's plenty of stuff out there right now that's false, that's informing people, that's spread by domestic actors, right? So it's, at the end of the day, if a Canadian has made that decision, that their vote is valid. What we are trying to do, or what I was trying to do, was to set up an infrastructure to enable Canadians to make informed choices and have an understanding of where that information was coming from. Thank you. Council for Human Rights uh, Coalition. Good morning. Good morning. If the court operator could please pull up HRC 31. This is the Liberal Party of Canada bylaw governing procedure for the Permanent Appeals Committee. And if we could jump to 3.1 at the bottom of page one. Uh, it states that two co-chairs are appointed by the national board with the consent of the leader. Um, Minister, would that be the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada? So I, I will just say that before uh, appearing here, I have never read this bylaw before. I would assume it's the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada, but this is, I think, more a question for um, the party apparatus as opposed to um, a minister. Okay, we can move on. Yeah. Um, could we please pull up next CAN4079 underscore R01? And if we could go to the top of page two, please. Thank you. It reads, the PRC is known to target and or leverage family as part of its FI, meaning foreign interference and other threat activity through operations Fox Hunt and Skynet, for example. The PRC could potentially threaten or intimidate redacted. What are your thoughts on this, Minister? Sorry, could you go to the top of this briefing note for me? I'm not sure I've... And my apologies, the document doesn't have identification in the database as to what intelligence body prepared it. Um, so I'm, so I'm not okay. able to tell you. I, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've seen this document before. If, if that's the correct date, then that's after the time that I was Minister of Democratic Institutions. Would you be able to speak 
from you know my understanding is that you have received high level briefings about actors involved in potential foreign interference and the ways that they engage in that foreign interference. Would you be able to speak to the issue of uh, the PRC targeting and or leveraging family as part of the foreign interference, as part of its foreign interference in your role before that? If we spoke, speak about it more generally. Um, I can speak more generally about my time as Minister of Democratic Institutions. This is something that uh, I have not seen before or been presented with. Have you been presented with information that speaks to the PRC leveraging or threatening family? Uh, no. Okay, so your answer is simply we, you aren't in a position to discuss or answer Correct. questions because you have not received information about this issue? Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. AG. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Minister. I just have uh, two clarification questions. You were taken to, and we can pull this up if we need to, you were taken to CAN 004252, which is a security briefing dated October 29th, 2019, which you, I believe your testimony was you weren't sure if you remembered that the security briefing took place on that date. Mm -hmm, correct. And uh, you were asked about, you recall being asked about your state of knowledge regarding Don Valley North. Uh, can you just confirm for the record, as Minister of Democratic Institutions, did you have responsibility and or accountability to address any alleged incidents of foreign interference that would have flowed no. in respect of Don Valley North? No. And do, no. can you tell us which minister or which portfolio might have been responsible? Uh, I would uh, think it would be the Minister of Public Safety. Um, however, I believe that that would, if there was something that happened, that that would be the purview of the RCMP because they would be the ones that would um, respond in such an instance because Thank you, the law would be broken. Yeah. Thank you. Re-examination? No. So it's, uh, we'll break for 20, uh, we are starting with uh, another witness, so I think it will be 11.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Order, please. Thank you. Free to go. The sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is now in recess until 11:20. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 11h20. Oh, correction, 11:30. Correction, 11:30.
The Foreign Interference Commission will commence shortly. Please take your seats. La Commission sur les gérances étrangères commencera sous peu. Veuillez prendre vos places. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is now in back in session. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'agence étrangère a repris. Good morning. Mr. Cameron, you will conduct the examination. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. We have Minister William Blair. Could I have the witness sworn or affirmed, please? Do you wish to be sworn? You, you, may, you may sit. Could you please state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? My name is William Sterling Blair. My surname is spelled B-L-A-I-R. Thank you. And do you, uh, do you swear that the uh, testimony you're about to give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God? So help me God. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. proceed. Good morning, Minister Blair. Um, I wonder if the court operator could pull up uh, WIT 64. And while he is doing that, uh, Minister Blair, I'll ask you if you remember that you were interviewed by Commission Counsel on February 21st and then uh, examined in camera uh, by Commission Counsel. Uh, and uh, that we have on the screen now the public interview summary uh, that was prepared in respect of your interview. And can you tell me, uh, did you have a chance to review that document, the public version of it? Yes, thank you, Mr. Cameron. I do, I do of course, recall that I attended uh, both meetings. I have had the opportunity to review uh, the, the interview summaries, both for the public interview and the in-camera interview. Thank you, and uh, were they accurate? Yes, sir. Do you have any corrections you'd like to make now? No, sir, I, I believe they're an accurate reflection of the conversations that we had. Okay, and do you adopt them uh, as your evidence uh, in this proceeding? I do, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> if you could begin, Minister Blair, mindful that we uh, are a little bit constrained by time this morning, but begin by giving us your uh, role in public life and how you arrived at the position of uh, Minister of Public Safety. Yes, sir, I'll try to be brief. Um, I, I became a Toronto police officer in 1976, and I, and I performed a number of, of, of a wide variety of functions within policing, um, including in criminal intelligence and, and organized crime. Um, I, in 2005, was appointed the chief of the Toronto Police Service, um, and I held that position as the, the chief of, uh, frankly, the largest municipal police service in Canada for approximately 10 years until uh, April of 2026. During that period of time, I also served as the president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, and many other national and international organizations. Um, I retired from my policing career in, uh, on April 26, 2015. Um, I then sought the nomination to run uh, for, for federal politics in the riding of Scarborough Southwest. I was elected on April 19th, or excuse me, October 19th of, of 2015 and became a member of parliament. In July of 2018, I was appointed to the Privy Council and the Cabinet of Canada as the Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction. Um, I, I then, following the election of 2019, uh, was appointed in November of 2019 as the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Following the 2023 election, um, I, I was, uh, a, 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 excuse me, the 2021 election, well, I haven't, didn't have one in 23, in 2021 election, I was appointed the Minister of Emergency Preparedness um, for, for Canada. And in July of last year, the Prime Minister appointed me as Canada's Minister of National Defence, a position that I currently hold. Thank you. And if I can just capture from within that uh, chronology, 
If I understand correctly, you were Minister of Public Safety from about November of 2019, so shortly after the 2019 election, until about October of 2021. Uh, is that correct? Yep. Yes, sir. I held that I held that position until I was appointed to a new position, and, and another individual was appointed um, in after the following the election of 2021 to the position of public safety. Thank you. Now we had the benefit of hearing yesterday from. Uh, senior personnel from the uh, Department of Public Security. So what I'd like to ask you about is your perspective uh, from the minister's chair, uh, uh, being the minister of that uh, de uh, department and the uh, responsible person for the various agencies that report uh, to the minister. Could you describe that for the commissioner, please? Again, I'll attempt to do it briefly. As the minister of public safety, um, I, I had an, a, a number of responsibilities. Primarily, I was the minister of the Department of Public Safety, um, which is headed by a deputy minister. But there are also five agencies uh, for which I had ministerial oversight and responsibility. That included the RCMP, the Canadian Border Services, uh, the CSIS, uh, Corrections Canada and the Parole Board. In addition, there are a number of other uh, review bodies uh, pertaining to those organizations for which I also had ministerial responsibility. There is legislation um, with respect to a, of the, the position of Minister of Public Safety defining some of those responsibilities. And in addition, each of the five agencies has foundational legislation that, that prescribes their authorities, but also defines the role of the minister with, in relation to those organizations. Thank you for that. And if you could just describe then, uh, in general terms, how you would relate or interact with, for example, the director of the service or the commissioner of the RCMP, how you as minister would relate to the heads of the various agencies for which you were responsible. Yeah, I, 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 I had a, a very close relationship with the heads of each of the agencies. My primary point of contact in the ministry was the deputy minister of public safety, Mr. Rob Stewart, throughout my entire, or through the majority of my tenure in that position. Um, that primarily pertains to issues around policy and, and other related matters to the department. Um, I also interacted with the commissioner of the RCMP, the director of, of CSIS, the president of CBSA, um, the, the commissioner responsible for Corrections Canada and the chair of the parole board, um, fairly regularly and routinely uh, meeting with them. Um, and and, and they, they had opportunities to brief me on, on matters related to their portfolios. And there were also, um, for each of those departments, certain authorities that I held over approvals for certain activities within their departments that they would, they would come to me for and seek those approvals. Um, and I'm just going to uh, note uh, that we're trying to keep things at a, a pace the interpreters, the simultaneous translators, can keep up with. So I'll, I'll just keep, ask you to keep that in mind. Uh, in the context that you were just des describing, the uh, way that you uh, managed your responsibility for the various agencies, can you tell me what the role was of the ministerial directives that you might have occasion to issue with respect to any of the agencies? Uh, one of my responsibilities as, as, as minister was to provide direction uh, to the agencies that were under my portfolio. And, and the mechanism by, by which we would do that was with the issuance of a written ministerial directive that established priorities, for example. And, and I think pertinent to this discussion, um, I, I did have the opportunity to issue ministerial directions to both the RCMP and CSIS, outlining what... what I perceive to be the priorities of those agencies, um, and 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 the intention of, of of that was to give appropriate direction um, to the areas that I felt they, sh they should prioritize in their in, in their work. And did you issue such a ministerial directive with respect to CSIS during your term? Yes, sir, I did. And did that ministerial directive make reference of the service's responsibility to investigate foreign? Interference. It, it specifically identified foreign interference as a priority for CSIS. As a matter of fact, in, in the list of, of priorities that were identified, foreign interference was the second on the list. I, and, and although it was not a prioritized list, I, I think its position there reflects the importance of which I put, placed upon it. Thank you. Um, now, noting that you became uh, the Minister of uh, Public Safety after the 2019 election, what was your perspective on foreign interference at the start of your term as Minister of Public Safety? 
I had had the opportunity, first of all, and as I've already mentioned, I had a very long uh, police career, and, and I was aware of the, the historically hostile activities of certain state actors uh, with respect to Canada and the threat that that could represent to the, uh, Canada's national interest, to Canadian citizens, to our critical infrastructure. Um, as in my previous role, prior to becoming the Minister of Public Safety, as the Minister of Border Security and uh, Organized Crime Reduction, I also had the benefit of some briefings uh, under the authority of, of, of then Minister Goodall, who was pre my, the previous Minister of Public Safety, um, with respect to information that was provided. And when I was appointed, when I became the Minister of Public Safety, I had the benefit of fairly extensive briefings with respect to the intelligence and the law enforcement situation, the public safety situation in the country, which included briefings with respect to issues around um, the hostile activities of state actors and, and the, the, uh, the wide variety of risks that that represented. Uh, well, since you've, you've uh, mentioned that, let me ask uh, the court operator to pull up WIT 64. <laughs> Uh, and if you can scroll to it, paragraph 13 of the uh, interview summary of Minister Blair. Um, Minister, the, you can see that in paragraph 13 of your interview summary, there's a description of your account of a briefing you received by CSIS after the 2019 election. Is this one of those briefings of the type you were just describing? Yes, it is. And can you be more particular about this one as it's discussed in your interview summary, the one about the uh, 2019 Don Valley North Liberal Party of Canada nomination? As part of a number of, of briefings that was provided to, to me by uh, the director of CSIS, there was a discussion about um, concerns that they had identified through their intelligence reporting about the nomination process in 2019 that occurred in Don Valley North. Um, and, and they provided me with information with respect to um, intelligence that they had received that, that called into question the, that, that nomination process, suggesting uh, that there, there may have been irregularities um, in, in the number of the people that participated in that and, it, and, and the possibility that it had been influenced in some way by uh, the activities of the People's Republic of China or, or representatives of, of, of that country. And in your, uh, in paragraph 13 of your interview summary, you describe uh, your reaction to that briefing. If you look at the sort of second half of the paragraph, you have some numbered points about your reaction. Yes, sir. As I've indicated in, in previous roles in, in both policing and in my previous roles in government, I, I have a fairly good understanding of, of, of the nature of intelligence. Intelligence isn't necessarily uh, factual evidence of what took place. If someone perceives that this has happened, and, and so I made some inquiries during that briefing with respect to the source of that intelligence, that information, on, on to determine if I... To, from CSIS's perspective, the reliability of that individual, if there was corroborating evidence to support the intelligence that had been received, um, if there was other corroboration or, or manner effort to substantiate that allegation, um, it, 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 they indicated to me that they did not at that time have um, other corroborating evidence to, to in, in any way to substantiate that. Um, I also made inquiries if, if there was any evidence beyond the nomination process itself of interference in the electoral process that we had just gone through in the 2019 election. And they did not indicate at that time to me that there had been any impact during in, in, in that writing um, and in, in, in any evidence of interference uh, following the, their concerns were limited only to the nomination process. Um, and, and, and my perception of that was, um, and, and my, my last question, was there any suggestion that the, the candidate was, was knowledgeable and aware of that and they had no information to corroborate that. Thank you. And perhaps if the court operator could call up a CAN 3326. Minister Blair, as you discussed in your uh, 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 in-camera evidence, you, uh, not long after your appointment as minister, you, uh, had an initiative, and this was mentioned by your uh, 
department in their evidence yesterday, so I'll just ask you again from your perspective as the Minister, uh, if you can start by describing the motion on November 18th, 2020, to which the document we now have on the screen was a response, and why you responded to it with this report and letter to the MPs. Yes, well, there had been a motion on November 18th, 2020, in the House of Commons, with, with, when the House sought information um, on what the government was doing to address threats to the security, prosperity, and democratic institutions right across the country. And in response to that, um, well, I worked very closely with my department and, and some excellent policy work that was done by my deputy minister and, and his team, excuse me, along with my ministry office, uh, we crafted a response to that motion. Um, well, we also had discussion about, you know, frankly, tabling a response to a motion. In my experience, those, those don't not always receive the full attention of every member of, of Parliament or the attention of Canadians. And I felt, I felt that it was very important. This information, I think, in order for Canada to defend its institutions, for in order to us to, to uh, take the steps necessary to respond to, to the threat of, of foreign interference, um, it was necessary to inform my parliamentary colleagues, but also to inform Canadians of the nature of that threat, give them information on, on, on what risk it represented, and also information on how they could then respond. What, I wanted to tell my, my colleagues what the government was doing, but also to tell Canadians um, if, if they saw evidence of foreign interference. The, the, the response that is provided in this document did not limit itself, quite frankly, to just political interference. Um, there was a great deal of concern, which frankly I still hold, with respect to the hostile activities of state actors in interfering with a number of our critical infrastructure, our, 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 our life sciences and health sciences institutions, our research capabilities. Um, there are a number of cyber threats that, that are also quite significant and deeply concerning uh, to, to our national interest. And, and the purpose of this letter uh, was to inform my parliamentary colleagues and through my parliamentary colleagues by publishing this document and making it a, and tabling it in par Parliament to inform Canadians about the, the, the full nature of this threat and to inform Canadians about what their government was doing in response to it. Thank you. And uh, with respect to a particular topic, this is a, a report of some uh, 12 pages long, but I just, if I could take you to one little section of it and ask for your comments, if the Court operator could scroll down to page uh, 11 of this report. And if you look down under the heading protecting our citizens and communities, there is a paragraph that begins, Canada does not tolerate harassment or intimidation of its citizens. And you might recollect that in both your interview and in your in-camera evidence, we explored this issue of your concern as minister for diaspora communities in Canada and just noting that this is a part of your report. Could you comment on that for the Commissioner, please? Yes, yes, sir. Um, there was and, and remains a, a fairly significant concern about the activities of certain hostile states in, in harassing um, or intimidating our citizens. I made reference in this document, for example, to, to Operation Foxtrot, in, in which the, the, the government of, of China was attempting to uh, gather information and to intimidate uh, people in Canada. Uh, with respect to certain economic investigations that they were conducting. Um, I spent most of my life trying to keep Canadians safe, and, and, and that's, it's been my job. And, and, I, and I, I believe the, the best way to keep Canadians safe is to give them information on how to protect themselves, but also to, to tell them what steps to take when they, when they perceive that there is intimidation and threats taking place, that they're not alone and that, and that, and that we're going to be there for them. And I, I was hoping to make that clear in this document that we would not tolerate it. And, it, and if they perceived that they were subject to intimidation or threat, um, the course of action of, of a, a hostile government, uh, such as the People's Republic of China, that the government would take it seriously and that we would respond. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears now and talk to you just uh, in a general sense about uh, the flow of information and intelligence to you as, as minister. Uh, not about any specific document or incident, but just generally speaking, and let me begin by asking you, did you have a security clearance to see classified intelligence? Yes, sir. I, 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 I hold, as a member of the Privy Council, but also be, as by virtue of the various positions that I've held, I, I have clearance for essentially the highest levels of intelligence, including 
some internationally shared Five Eyes intelligence. Right. So there would be no intelligence that you wouldn't be able to see if the appropriate agencies thought it was appropriate that you'd be briefed on it? I don't think there's any restriction on what I am able to be Thank made you. aware of. And uh, generally speaking, in your uh, tenure as minister, how did classified intelligence come to your attention? There were, there were certain, there's various levels of classification of material. Um, and frankly, I've always tried to be very careful with the handling of, of all classified information. And, and I, I, I frankly never take it from the room or make notes with respect to it because that would, in my opinion, compromise its security. In, in my role as the Minister of Public Safety, um, I generally have access periodically to some classified material, but virtually everything of a top secret nature was only shared with me in the confines of a secure environment, the SCIF, a SCIF. Um, generally, uh, throughout my tenure as a public safety minister, either in the SCIF at, I apologize. I may be subject to some form of interference there, Mr. Hussain. <laughs> All top side secret material was shared to me in the confines of a SCIF, either at uh, 269 Laurier here in, in Ottawa, where there is a secure room where briefings could take place, uh, and that, in the same building as my, my ministerial office was located. Um, I also uh, attended on, on a number of, of fr quite a frequent number of occasions at the CSIS headquarters, which is located in Toronto. Um, where there are secure facilities where information would be shared for, with me in a secure room. Um, I would enter that room. Occasionally there would be secure communications. Either the director and his team would be present, the director of CSIS and his team would be present in briefings. Sometimes that was done virtually, particularly during the, the, the pandemic, where, where we were able to use secure communications for that purpose. And occasionally I would just be in the room and they would present a binder of documents that I would read through. If you could just... Uh expand a little bit on that experience again and describe for me who would be briefing you, maybe not the same group every time, but typically who are the personnel briefing you and who are the personnel with you on the ministerial side or the departmental side of those briefings? In every case, the briefing was done by the director with his team. And, and so the deputy director and sometimes their associate director uh, would, would be present in the room. Um, in addition, not in every case, but in, in some cases, the deputy minister and, and other of his team, um, his, his ADM, uh, Mr. Rochon, would also be present in the room. And generally, my chief of staff would be present, certainly in the meetings that took place in, in Ottawa. And when I was attended um, to, to CSIS headquarters, I will tell you frequently I was in the room by myself. I was sometimes connected virtually um, by screens and sometimes uh, CSIS personnel would simply come in, present a, a, a binder of documents, and I would read through them. Thank you. I'm just going to ask if I can uh, clarify a, a detail in your evidence there. Um, when you talk about attending at CSIS in Toronto, uh, I think you're talking about attending at the CSIS regional, uh, Toronto regional office, right? Not yes, sir. I'm not sure whether you want me to give the address, but... No, no, you, I don't want you to do that, but it was, the, it was the Toronto regional office and not headquarters. Right? No, it's the Toronto regional office, Thank and you. it's, it, it's a place of because of all the work I did in Toronto, and I was also a member of the INSET team de right. dealing with national security investigations. I've, I've, I've attended there very frequently, but I, 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 I still, just in the past few weeks, I've, I've attended in, uh, high-level in, intel, secret intelligence briefings there. That's been helpful. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Those are my questions. Thank you. Cross-examination. Uh, first one is uh, Council for RCDA. Good morning, Minister Blair. Guillaume Sewa for the Russian Canadian Democratic Alliance. Yes, sir. Um, in your witness summary, you mentioned um, the evolution over time of misinformation and disinformation, correct? Yes, sir. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about this evolution? There are a number of ways in which foreign interference can take place. Some of it is you know, directed towards the intimidation or coercion of individual Canadians or, or institutions. It can also take the, the, the form of um, espionage in, in, in capturing information. But one of, the, one of the challenges that we face is 
in the way in which Canadians now receive most of their information um, through social media, there is an, a, a concern, I think a legitimate concern, of misinformation and disinformation. And I would differentiate between them. One is just simply providing false information, and another has, has frankly, a more nefarious intent uh, to, to, to not just misinform, but to create um, a public perception, which is not based on fact. Um, and, and we have seen the activities of a number of hostile states. And, and, and again, I would, if I may, I will differentiate between a number of for all foreign states attempt to influence other countries and other citizens in their best interest. But through the application of misinformation and disinformation, uh, we, it, it meets the threshold of foreign interference if it is um, deceptive, if, if it is uh, clandestine and, and clearly intended to, to create chaos and mischief and disagreement. Thank you. And I'm wondering, why, why is this a concern for public safety? Is there a chance that this misinformation or disinformation um, becomes a real threat to the security of Canadians, like um, threats to violence and so on? Well, if I may, I, I, let me sort of reflect during the period at which I was the public safety minister. There were a number of efforts in, among our public health officials in order to take steps that were necessary in order to keep Canadians safe. But unfortunately, there was a, a great deal of misinformation and some disinformation. health efforts to keep Canadians healthy and safe. And, and so that can represent a, a threat to the public safety of the country. It also, um, what we have seen is one of the intents of, of, mis of disinformation is to create significant social division within the country. And, and you know, I think it is a, a well-protected right of Canadians to hold an opinion and, and, and to express that opinion um, under, under our charter. But at the same time, if, if those opinions are being negatively influenced by misinformation with a nefarious intent to cause that social division, it can represent a concern for public safety. And is, is what you just mentioned, um, did you witness what you just mentioned specifically during the 43rd and 44th general elections? The, the misinformation that we saw in, in, in there... Uh, just, just to clarify, yeah, uh, I'm talking not necessarily about the misinformation, disinformation online, but um, perhaps the transfer of this issue to real threats to public safety, for instance, blocking polling stations, um, refusing to wear masks at polling stations so that there was... Um, I, Frankly, we, we saw those as the, the, that misinformation and, and the, the reaction that it, it created um, was a challenge. But in my opinion, it did not rise the threshold as interfering with our ability to hold a free and fair election in Canada. Oh, OK. I, I, I was not questioning whether it, was, it, it met the threshold. I was just questioning as whether is it something that the public safety witnessed or was aware of during the, at least the 2021 election. Well, I, I can tell you, my officials did not brief me specifically on the impact of mis, mis or diffs information on the 2021 election, but I think all Canadians observed and, and, and recognized you know, the wide diversity of, of information that was, was, was being put forward. And um, I, 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 it, it was a concern, but it did not rise to the level that our officials came forward and said, this is something that we need to respond to. Okay. At least not to me. And you mentioned, and just my last question, you, men, you mentioned numerous hostile states in one of your pre previous answers about mis- and disinformation. Um, would one of those be Russia? Yes. And would Russia in Canada specifically or generally? Both. Canada specifically and generally. In, in our elections specifically or generally? I did, not, I did not see substantial evidence of, of R Russian efforts to influence our elections through disinformation. Um, I think, and, and we have observed um, a fairly concerted effort among a number of hostile actors, including Russia, to, to engage in disinformation within our society, but not specifically directed at our electoral processes in the 2021 election. 2021 and 2019. As well. in, in, in either election. I'm, I'm not aware of any um, activity by Russia through their disinformation campaigns to influence the outcome of that election. They were influencing other 
types of public opinion, but I did not see evidence of it directed towards the outcome of our 2019 or 2021 elections. Okay, I'm out of time, but I thank you, Mr. Blair. Next is uh, Council for Europe. Hello, Mr. Sure. If I could ask the court reporter to please pull up CAN 3326. My colleague for the commission has already brought this uh, document up this morning. I understand it's a letter that you wrote dated uh, December 18th, 2020. If we could turn to page three to the last paragraph on the page. If, if I may just offer some clarification. I had a great deal of help among my officials, the deputy minister and his team and my mental officials in composing this letter. Um, and, but, but I adopted it all and added my signature to it. So I am the, the sender of the letter, but it was a, very much a team effort. Okay, so prepared by a number of actors, but you adopt what's said in the letter, or you agree with what is said in the letter? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you. So that paragraph, it reads, when foreign states target Canadians, persons residing in Canada or their families, they are seeking to deprive members of Canadian communities of their fundamental rights and freedoms. Such actions are unacceptable. If anyone feels intimidated or threatened, it is of the most importance to contact your local police. And I can assure you that your concerns will be dealt with in a serious and appropriate manner. Uh, do you remember this uh, sentiment being prepared or your No, ma'am, uh, this is something that, that I believe very strongly in. I, 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 I want, if people feel that they are being subject to th threats or intimidation, it's really important that they, they reach out for, for the help that's available to them. If we could please pull up COM 155 and turn to paragraph 289 on page 106 of the document. This is NSI COP's 2019 annual report. And I'll just wait for us, it might take a moment for it to load. Maybe in the meantime, in the interest of time, I can read it out and we'll just make sure that it's up there. Um, so in paragraph 289 at page 106, it notes, in a spring 2019 presentation to the Standing Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade, Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada noted that those who are targeted do not know whether to turn to CSIS, the RCMP or municipal police, and that they rarely receive a coherent response from officials. Likewise, um, and, and if, if you'd like, we can wait it, to see it. Yes, yeah. I think it would be better to have the document. Certainly. At least the paragraph, the document is there, but. It, can you repeat the paragraph number? Sure. So it's at paragraph 289. Uh, you'd like me to read it out loud again, Madam Commissioner? No, paragraph 29. Uh, 289. Uh, 289, sorry. Here you are. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Now I've got. It'll be on. Are we on uh, page 106 of the document, or perhaps the PDF? I apologize, or the document. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It, it, it was the, the, the paragraph in question. Oh, 289 is, is open before me. Okay. I think I'm just making sure that it matches. Uh, could we try the PDF? The PDF page 106. My apologies, I should have taken note of which one it was. Um, okay, perhaps we can move on. Uh, I apologize there. Um, at the start of these hearings, we heard from a panel of representatives from diaspora community organizations who explained that members of targeted diaspora communities often think it's a waste of time to even try to contact the police because in their experience, nothing comes of it or they get bounced around to different agencies. Are you aware that community members are experiencing these difficulties when they attempt to contact law enforcement for help? Yeah, I've, I've been a police officer in one of the most diverse cities in the world for very, very many years and work very hard in, in those diverse communities to make sure that they can know and trust 
uh, that the police will respond appropriately. One of the things I attempted to do in the letter that I published to parliamentarians and tabled in Parliament was to actually provide for Canadians the, the direct contacts with both CSIS and the RCMP. It's, it's articulated in that letter. But one of the reasons I made reference to local police is because if there is an immediate threat to someone's safety and they're concerned for their safety, that's, that's a 911 call, and, and it's really important that Canadians know that if they make that call, that somebody will come there and help them be safe. And, and that's the information. And, and, and I would also acknowledge to you that many diasporas communities you know, often come from um, cultural experiences which makes them untrustful of the police, and it really is incumbent upon all police services, the RCMP and CSIS, to, to make a very sincere effort to build trust in those communities so that people know that if they, they need help, they'll get help. And speaking specifically to reports of foreign interference through perhaps tip lines, web forums for public reporting, are you aware that diaspora communities are having difficulties accessing those mechanisms? I'm, I'm not, but, but that would be a concern to me because th those are established in order to help keep people report their concerns and to be safe. And, and I think it, it, your question highlights the need for us to do, to do more, to make sure we reach out to those communities, make it available to them in ways which are both language and culturally appropriate, so that people can trust that, that if they need help, they'll get it. And so by virtue of the fact that you've recognized that there's a lot more work to do to make sure that law enforcement can properly address the concerns of diaspora communities or they can properly engage in that reporting, access help, does that change your opinion as to whether or not you can assure Canadians that their concerns will be dealt with in a serious and appropriate manner by law enforcement, as you, as it was stated in that letter? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I can tell you that I, I, I have represented uh, Canadian police services across this country as, as the president of the National Association. Um, I work very closely with my colleagues in, in policing at all levels of policing in this country. I believe this is a very sincere effort to reach out to diaspora's communities and to, and to ensure that we are there for them um, in a way that is both language and culturally appropriate. Um, building trust is, is, is a con requires a constant effort. Um, I, part of that is, is providing um, those citizens with a reassurance that uh, that, that we will answer their call and that we will respond in an appropriate way. And I've tried to provide that reassurance in this document. Great. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Council for uh, Michael Chung. Thank you, Commissioner. No questions. No questions. Conservative Party. Good morning, Minister Blair. Just morning, bear sir. with me. I've had to change equipment here. Uh, Minister Blair, in your witness statement uh, at WIT uh, 63, perhaps we can get that called up. Paragraph 12, sir. You discuss approving judicial warrants under the CSIS Act. That's correct. As Minister of Public Safety. And am I correct that your evidence has indicated there that it usually takes you two and a half to three hours to review on and sign off on such warrants? And that's it's approximately, it depends on, on the complexity of, of the application, but that's usually the amount of time that, I'm, that it takes. Okay. And in your experience, uh, including as a police officer uh, and former chief of police, would you agree that uh, warrants and applications for warrants are often very time sensitive? Yes, sir. And you'd agree that delay in approving a warrant or, or applying for a warrant could jeopardize an investigation and the evidence that you're actually seeking to obtain uh, under the warrant? No, I think I think there always has to be a balance of uh, there's an appropriate due diligence of officials in the preparing preparation of those documents. There are also issues around duty of candor and, and other matters that need to be addressed. But certainly, any any undue delay is 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 can be problematic. Right, it could jeopardize the investigation. 
depending on the investigation, but yes. Okay. Can I get MC000053 called up? And Minister Blair, uh, this is an article from the Globe and Mail dated May 19, 2023, which generally deals with foreign interference from China. And it also includes an assertion at the top of page two. Perhaps we can scroll to that. Commissioner, I'm sorry to interrupt uh, uh, Mr. DeLuca. I just wanted to raise a potential concern as to the um, uh, whether or not this line of questioning maybe go beyond the scope of uh, these uh, first set of hearings, which are uh, directed, uh, as, the, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, to the uh, allegations of foreign interference in the 2019 and 2021 uh, general elections information flow relating to those and uh, decision uh, to decision makers. Um, uh, as noted, uh, other related issues uh, in respect of foreign interference may be um, addressed at later proceedings. I see what is the line of questioning. Uh, Sorry? Uh, just go on with your okay. question and I see whether uh, okay. sure. they're outside the scope of this sure. phase or not. So, so there's, a, there's a passage that, that's highlighted in the document itself in, in purple. Perhaps you could read that to yourself to save me from reading it into the record. But, but generally, uh, it suggests that there was undue delay uh, in uh, your signing off on a warrant for um, uh, to, to surveil Michael Chan in the lead up to the 2021 federal election. Can, can you comment on why it took so long for you to um, uh, sign off on the warrant? Yeah, let me comment. This paragraph is false. What aspects of it are false, sir? It, there was no delay of several months. The document in, in question right. uh, was put in front of me on May the 11th. I signed it off the same day, about three hours later. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is um, Jenny Kwan, counsel for Jenny Kwan. Commissioner and, and uh, Mr. Blair. Uh, Mr. Blair, I would like to ask you some questions about CSIS's threat reduction measure uh, power and your oversight of that. My understanding is that you as the minister have oversight over any TRMs that CSIS may want to pursue. That's correct. And just to understand, uh, what does oversight mean in this case? Are you required to approve any such TRMs? The, the the CSIS, when a TRM would, would be sought by, by CSIS, they would, co would come and brief me, um, uh, seek my, my concurrence. My understanding of the legislation doesn't necessarily require my approval per se, but it does require that CSIS make me aware of it and, and that I concur with, it, with the actions taken. Were there... Um, so just to take a step back then, uh, could you approach CSIS about a potential situation in which you felt a TRM was appropriate? There would be nothing to limit my ability to do that. Okay. Um, and in the context of foreign interference and during your tenure, did CSIS approach you of any TRMs that were related to or targeted to foreign interference? No, not specifically. There were things that did not meet the threshold of, of, of CSIS seeking authority for a TRM, but there were a number of, I think, really important and relevant discussions with respect to very serious concerns that CSIS had with respect to, for example, foreign interference um, in some of our health sciences institutions and research institutions. And we discussed measures that could be taken in response to that. And as a result, um, CSIS took the steps of very proactively going to those institutions, briefing those institutions, alerting them to the, the, the nature of the risk and helping them take steps to mitigate that risk. Okay, so that's an example of a TRM during your tenure that was brought to you by CSIS and that you concurred with and then mm -hmm. was taken and, and actually um, implemented. Yes. Okay. Were there any examples where you brought to CSIS uh, the possibility of using a TRM to address a foreign interference issue? No. No. And um, were you briefed or made aware of um, CSIS's TRM undertaking just before you became minister uh, to brief candidates uh, of foreign interference-related issues during the election? 
One, we, I did have discussion, and I had some awareness that, that CSIS intended to proactively uh, speak to, uh, uh, frankly, I had a concern that I discussed with the director about members of parliament or candidates who might be unconsciously influenced or, or interfered with as a result of the action of a hostile government. And, and I felt it was important to give those individuals enough information so that they would recognize the, the interference and to alert them to how that they might take steps in order to protect themselves and to make sure that they knew that CSIS was there to help them and, and support them. And, and so we did have discussions. Um, CSIS did not tell me specifically who they, they wanted to talk to or the information that they would share with them. But, but we did talk about the importance of what is sometimes called defensive briefings or proactive briefings for, of, that CSIS would undertake with an individual, sometimes parliamentarians or, or candidates. And so based on the evidence you're giving now, would you have known not necessarily who was briefed or what they were told, but that the briefing actually occurred? No, there, there, was, there was no reporting mechanism whereby they, the CSIS would tell me who they were going to talk to or if they had in fact talked to anybody, there, there, at no time did CSIS come back and say to me while I was the Minister of Public Safety that they had actually conducted a defensive briefing or that they were intending to do so. We talked about the process, but, but, but CSIS did not share with me the information of anyone that they felt that it was necessary to talk to or what information they wanted to share with that individual. So in the oversight function that you had, it was to sort of concur on these TRMs, but did you have any sort of oversight function to determine if the TRMs were an effective means of producing a particular result, or is that left entirely to CSIS to do? Well, it, it, it's an operational matter for CSIS, and so the information that they had, um, it, it, ministerial oversight, if, if I made it, it did not mean that I was sort of overseeing and actively engaged in managing their inquiries, their intelligence gathering, or their even their operations um, in, in order to mitigate threat. It, it was to provide ministerial direction as, as, as on priorities and where it was necessary for them to seek authority, to provide that authority. But the, the decisions with respect to the operational response, the gathering of intelligence, the sharing of intelligence, and information that they would take to mitigate the, the, the nature of threat was the responsibility of CSIS. Thank you for your testimony. It's very Thank helpful very clarification. Thank you. Uh, Council for Andan. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, Madam Commissioner. Um, if I could ask the court reporter please to pull up WIT 64 again, page 5, paragraph 13. So, Minister Blair, um, you have already had some discussions uh, about the briefing that's addressed in this paragraph with Mr. Cameron this morning. I'd just like to clarify uh, a particular aspect of your evidence. So, looking at paragraph 13 here on the screen, you said that you were not concerned about the intelligence regarding Don Valley North at the time you were briefed. Is that right? I think it was important to be to be briefed on this by CSIS, but it did, it did not raise concerns for me based on the information that CSIS provided, that with respect to this process or any compromise of of of, of the election, or uh, there was no indication in their briefing that Mr. Uh, Dong was a willing or even an aware participant in this. Okay, thank you. And I just want to put a point on what we see here is that you actually gave three specific reasons that you weren't concerned about the intelligence at the time. And I was just hoping that um, to the extent you've not already spoke about them, you could just do so now, those three reasons. Yeah, if I, if I may, just going through the, 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 the three reasons that I, I shared in my uh, t earlier testimony, um, I, I did make inquiries about the source of, of this information, whether or not it was single source or multiple, whether or not this individual had previously provided information which, which was termed reliable or not, whether there was any corroborative evidence or other elements of the CSIS investigation that would substantiate uh, the, the intelligence in this thing. I think it's important to recognize that intelligence isn't necessarily truth. 
but it's, 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 it is the beginning of other inquiries, and it, and it has to be assessed in, in a broad context of, of reliability in order to make a determination of next steps. Uh, the second thing that I, I specifically inquired about was whether or not that, that there was any intelligence or suggestion that Mr. Dong uh, was aware of, the, of, of this potential interference or in any way a willing participant. And the, the indication that CSIS provided me with that at that time was that they had no evidence that suggested that. And, and finally, um, I, my, my, my concern, because it had been a longstanding concern about the integrity of our elections, um, whether or not that the, the because this, this briefing was given to me after the 2019 election, whether or not there had been any other uh, interference or in influence that, that could have out influenced the outcome of the 2019 election in Don Valley uh, North, and they indicated that they had no information that indicated that. Okay, thank you. Those are our questions. Thank you. Attorney General? No questions. No question. Re-examination? So you're free to leave. Excuse me, Madam Commissioner, I don't have any re-examination, but I just wanted to make an a observation that uh, we called uh, Minister Blair to speak to his term as uh, Minister generally, and that the uh, timing of any specific uh, incident or warrant is not an issue in this part of the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So we'll take a five minutes break to adjust the time to switch witnesses. Order. All right. Alors, s'il vous plaît, the sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is currently uh, in pause. The sitting of the Commission of the Gérance is maintenant in pause.
Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is back in session. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère a repris. So, my apologies for the delay, but we are now ready. Thank you very much, Commissioner. It's uh, Aaron Dan, Commission Counsel, and our next witness is uh, Minister LeBlanc. If you could be sworn, please. If the witness could be sworn, please. Veuillez indiquer votre nom et appeler votre prénom pour le dossier. Dominique LeBlanc. Please give your name and uh, family name. Votre prénom, s'il vous plaît. D O M I N. And uh, spell uh, your first name. Um, with uh, Acadians, of course, it's a, a capital B, so it's a capital L, cap E, capital B, L A N C. And the commissioner is well aware of the spelling of Acadian names. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give is uh, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do swear. Thank you. But if Minister LeBlanc, do you recall being interviewed by the Commission Council on February 22nd, 2024? I do. Right. And if I could ask uh, that WIT 65 be called up. Minister, this is a summary of, uh, of the publicly disclosable information from that uh, interview. If, have you had a chance to review the summary? Uh, yes, I have. And is it accurate? It is. And will you adopt it as uh, part of your evidence before the commission? I will. Thank you. And next, if we could go to WIT 52. This is a summary, um, Minister, of your in-camera in examination. Have you had an opportunity to review this summary? Yes, I have. And is it accurate? Yes, it is. And will you adopt it as part of your evidence before the commission? I will. Thank you. You've had a number of roles in government, a number of roles in cabinet. Um, I will uh, try and take you through what I understand your various positions have been since approximately uh, August of 2018. And please correct me if I get uh, any of this wrong. Um, I understand that in August of 2018, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and you held that position until uh, 2019. Is that right? Yes. And after the election in, uh, in 2019, you were appointed president of what was then the Queen's Privy Council uh, for Canada, which included responsibilities for democratic institutions. That's correct. In the summer of 2020, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and you served in those offices as uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and with responsibility for democratic institutions until the 2021 election. That's right. Right. And after the 2021 election, you were appointed Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and retained responsibility for democratic institutions. That's right, and I had the infrastructure and communities portfolio attached as well. Thank you for that addition. And in 2023, uh, you were appointed Minister of Public Safety, Democratic Institutions, and Intergovernmental Affairs. That's right. All right. Glad I didn't uh, leave any of the, you have the, the, the record for longest title, I think. I have a hard time keeping a job. <laughs> <laughs> Given the scope of uh, this stage of the proceedings, I'll focus my questions today primarily on your responsibilities uh, in relation to democratic institutions. Um, can you describe your role or mandate uh, in relation to, uh, to, to that portfolio? Les institutions démocratiques. Democratic institutions are a secretariat within the Privy Council to and they develop uh, policies, uh, consider uh, legislative changes uh, that may be needed to support uh, the capacity of Canadians to hold free and fair elections. And uh, it's a, a public policy uh, function. And of course, uh, Elections Canada is an independent agency and looks after the operations. But it's a way that the government and the executive uh, interact uh, with uh, the elections uh, apparatus in Canada. Thank you. Uh, I would ask my questions in English. In the language of your choice. 
<laughs> excuse me, we heard this morning from your co colleague, uh, Minister Gould, about uh, um, her work in uh, developing the plan to protect uh, democracy. Uh, did your responsibilities in relation to democratic institutions include uh, reviewing or updating that plan? Um, yes, they did. Uh, she was the minister uh, in the lead up to the 2019 general election. She, I remember as a minister her coming to cabinet with that with that plan. I remember conversations uh, with her as a colleague around that work. Um, and after the 2019 election, when I took over that responsibility, one of uh, the mandates that I got was uh, to review the, how the plan had uh, worked in the 2019 election uh, and come back to cabinet with any suggested changes or uh, adjustments for the upcoming election. We were then in a minority parliament, so we wanted to have those measures in place. And did part of that uh, include reviewing uh, what we've heard referred to as the Judd Report, the uh, May 2020 assessment on the critical election incident public protocol? Yes, it did. That was a deliberate decision made by the government to have an independent review by a very senior public servant, former deputy minister, director of the of CSIS. Uh, so once we got Mr. Judd's report, I worked with the senior officials at the Privy Council office uh, to make any adjustments that Mr. Judd recommended. We also had the benefit of a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians report. So that work went into uh, the sort of second version or 2.0 version of what Karina Gould had uh, had taken to cabinet two years previously. Thank you. And, and just for the benefit of, uh, of the participants, the Judd report can be found at CAN 900. We don't need to bring it up. I would ask the court operator to bring up COM 48. And this is a, um, a report entitled Countering uh, an Evolving Threat that I think, uh, Minister, you'll be quite familiar with. I realize it was produced uh, sometime later, but if we could just go to page uh, 20 of that document. It contains a review of uh, uh, different recommendations that have been made by NSI, or <coughs> excuse me, some of the uh, the entities that we've listed this morning, including uh, uh, the Judd report. Um, you mentioned, uh, Minister, that you adopted or recommended adopting a number of the recommendations made by um, made in that report. One recommendation I understand that was not implemented, if we just scroll down a, a bit on this page, as what's listed as number two, that the protocol would cover the pre-writ uh, period. Can you explain why that uh, particular recommendation was not implemented? Um, so that would have been based on advice that I would have received from senior officials uh, at the Privy Council office. Um, in a context uh, where we're not in an election period where a writ hasn't been issued. There's a basic principle of ministerial responsibility. Uh, ministers uh, are in office and have responsibility, uh, including around foreign interference, uh, the national security agencies um, are empowered to work with the minister who's in office. Uh, this was very much and deliberately designed to be something that would be in effect during a, a caretaker period. It's a convention uh, of British parliamentary democracy where the government is in it itself a candidate to succeed itself. So in, an, in a government's act with a great deal of restraint during a writ period, as is absolutely appropriate, um, that's why the panel uh, and the protocol uh, was deliberately designed to exist at a period where the elected government uh, perhaps shouldn't be the best arbiter of public pronouncements on the conduct, uh, conduct of an election. All right, let me turn to um, a next topic, which is uh, to ask you about uh, whether and when you received a classified intelligence uh, in your capacity uh, as uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs and with responsibilities for uh, democratic institutions. Do I understand that, that would, it would be rare for you to, to receive uh, classified intelligence or classified briefings? 
Um, yes, the Minister of Democratic Institutions uh, is not uh, a regular consumer of intelligence products or intelligence uh, documents or briefings from intelligence officials. Um, and I've had a perspective on that since I became the Minister of Public Safety last summer. I now see the difference between the operational responsibility of a minister responsible for CSIS or, or the RCMP uh, and a minister responsible for democratic institutions. The democratic institutions portfolio, I did receive high level uh, briefings from officials on a number of occasions. Uh, I think the first one was <clears throat> in March of 2020. Uh, I think literally on the eve of the declaration of the pandemic, I, one tends to remember those moments. Um, but it was a, a high level situational awareness of the threat landscape. Uh, it was my first opportunity to hear from them how, uh, what they had seen uh, in terms of threat actors uh, and potential attempts to interfere uh, in the election of 2019. Uh, but it didn't, it, it was to situate my understanding of the threat landscape of the, of the particular state or non-state actors that are active in this space, uh, but it didn't go into granularity around specific constituencies or specific events. It was a higher level briefing, um, probably so as in your reference to the Judd report and other work that we would do as we were thinking through how we wanted to uh, adjust the protocol uh, and the protecting democracy plan uh, for the subsequent election. This was a sort of a introduction for me to the threat landscape. That was an intelligence briefing, but it was at a much higher level than, for example, the public safety minister would typically receive. All right, we'll, we'll go through that briefing in just a moment, but um, uh, we heard uh, from Minister Gould uh, this morning that uh, in developing the uh, plan to protect democracy. She had uh, sort of monthly meetings, she estimated with uh, CSIS, CSE, um, the Privy Council Office, uh, received information from RRM. Um, I understand you did not receive, uh, and those were to be clear, it's sort of high level as you've described uh, briefings, not sort of specific uh, incidents or um, specific geographical areas or things of that sort. I understand you did not have sort of these regular monthly uh, uh, briefing sessions. Can you explain the difference in approach? It's probably three explanations. The first one is uh, in September of 2019, I had a stem cell transplant uh, to deal with a very aggressive and rare form of blood cancer. Uh, so when I became minister, I was literally, uh, uh, I came from Montreal and went back to Montreal the same day. Um, so I was recovering uh, in terms of my own health. Uh, the assessment was that the plan that Karina had put in place had worked. Uh, the initial information was that it had been successful. We recognized that we needed to adjust or tweak or take into account recommendations from the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians or Mr. Judd. Um, so that was less uh, of an undertaking than building a plan from scratch. Before uh, Karina Gould had put together the Protecting Democracy Plan, nothing of the sort had existed. So she built the infrastructure from scratch. Uh, it was the first time the federal government had set up these mechanisms to detect and disrupt foreign interference, the public protocol. So these were all new elements. We were satisfied generally with how they had worked. We recognized that we had committed to reviewing and adjusting them, which is what I did. And then along came COVID as well. Uh, COVID literally happened, I think the day, the pandemic was the day after my first briefing. Like many Canadians, I returned to New Brunswick. My health was still fragile, uh, recovering from the transplant. Um, and uh, we were building the communications infrastructure as a government to allow uh, ministers to receive classified information from residences. Um, so that quickly changed. And uh, by the fall, uh, everybody was in a much different routine. But the need for the monthly briefings or to travel to uh, California to meet the social media 
companies uh, was much different after she had, in our view, successfully done that work. All right, let's turn to that March uh, 2020 briefing. If uh, the court operator could pull up CAN 15506. This is a, a memo. The memo is dated uh, March 9th, 2020. It is a memorandum to the National Security and Intelligence Advisor, uh, and I understand represents uh, the notes for the NSIA uh, for a security briefing to you um, in your capacity as pre president of the Queen's Privy Council Office. And we heard uh, some evidence yesterday that briefing notes are not always uh, strictly um, uh, strictly applied to. So I, I just want to go through this document and understand uh, what uh, topics were or were not uh, covered in, in that briefing. Um, if we look at the summary on the first page, it indicates that the purpose of the meeting would be to provide you with a summary of election security related activities undertaken to help safeguard the 2019 election, as well as an overview of the threatened environment, particularly as it pertains to foreign interference. Does that uh, accord with your memory of the, the purpose of the briefing? Yes, it does. Okay. And the summary also indicates in the third bullet point that the uh, December mandate letter that you had received specified that you were to lead a review of the measures put in place to protect the electoral process and bring forward uh, recommendations. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And does that uh, accord with uh, uh, your memory of the December mandate letter that you had received? Yes, it does. All right. And then in the bullet point below that, um, indicates that Ms. Bruce, who I understood was then the head of the, the CSE, and Mr. Vigneault, the director of CSIS, would expand upon potential threats observed in uh, GE 2019. Um, do you remember whether Ms. Bruce and, Ms. Bruce and Mr. Vigneault were at the at briefing and provided you, and did they provide you with uh, some information on the potential threats observed during the 2019 election? Yes, they did. Okay. We go to page three of that document. Um, just scrolling to the bottom of the page, there's a, a text box there indicating there is uh, some discussion of a, a threat reduction measure that the government of Canada had it conducted in advance of the 2019 election. Do you recall receiving information about that uh, about that TRM in this meeting? I don't recall details of that. Uh, a discussion around threat reduction measures, or I see that it references the government of Pakistan. I don't have a specific recollection of a conversation about CSIS threat reduction measures. All right. And then if we go to page eight of the document, If we scroll just a little bit further down, there's a, a title uh, indicating what we saw. Um, and the bullets indicate that uh, we did not observe any activities. And I presume, sorry, I should just to put this in context, um, there's a discussion above about uh, the site task force and the panel of five's work. Uh, so I am assuming, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this, when the we addressed here is, is the, the panel. Uh, we did not observe any activities that met the threshold for a public announcement or affected Canada's ability to have a free and fair election, including in the online space. Is that uh, something that you recall being briefed on in this meeting? Uh, yes, I do. And as I, that was one of the most significant takeaways uh, for me from that sort of first high level briefing is that some of the most senior intelligence and security officials in the country confirmed to me their view uh, that the 2019 election was free and fair and that any attempts at foreign interference would not have uh, affected the outcome of the election, uh, including in specific in individual riding. So I remember being reassured that the plan that we had put in place uh, in their view, in their independent 
senior official view uh, had been successful. And the next bullet point down, do you recall that being said as well? Uh, that is not the same as saying we saw nothing at all. Uh, yes, that's why I said the idea that there have been attempts or is not new. This had existed for over a decade, um, and and they they would talk about uh, that sort of overall threat landscape. But the takeaway for me, I thought, was significant. Your first bullet that the election had been free and fair and decided by Canadians in Canada. Turning to page ten of this document. Uh, we see a, a, a heading labeled China Threat Update, and there are a number of uh, largely redacted bullets. The third down, uh, third bullet down is bolded and says specific incidents suggestive of foreign interference, which were br briefed to relevant clients, uh, Government of Canada and political parties during the RIP period, e.g. Don Valley. Do you recall uh, being briefed on anything specifically related to Don Valley? As I said, and uh, the first time that I saw this document was when I was preparing for these uh, hearings. So as a minister who receives a briefing from the officials, I don't see the notes that they've prepared uh, by their colleagues for the meeting. So the first time that I knew that they had such uh, notes, it was honestly uh, when I was preparing uh, for this hearing. And when I looked at your document, so I think I also understand that this section here, it was, uh, for example, if you need any other information, uh, it would be uh, a supplement to the main document. And as I said, my impression was that they wanted to give me a broader perspective uh, with respect uh, to uh, the threat context, but uh, I do not uh, remember at all that we went into such precise details uh, for a g given riding and uh, that a specific country had done uh, something, uh, was alleged to have done something in a writing. So the first time that I did hear about the allegations with respect to this writing was when it was public, um, uh, following the leaks, and it, uh, last year it came out. Uh, Next questions you may be able to answer uh, quite quickly, if uh, given um, that you've indicated it was really more high level or global type briefings. I'm um, turning away specifically from this, this document. Can I ask you whether, I'll ask the court operator to pull up uh, SUM uh, 3. Minister, there was a number of uh, uh, summaries produced uh, for the purposes of this commission on various issues relating to uh, the 2019 and 2021 elections. And I'll just ask you uh, very briefly uh, to indicate whether or not you were aware of intelligence relating to these uh, various issues um, at the time uh, of the 2019 and then 2021 elections. So this first one relates to um, uh, potential interference in the Vancouver area and specifically the use of, uh, at paragraph three, the use of proxy agents to exclude candidates from community events. Was this uh, the type of uh, intelligence that you would have been briefed on um, in 2020 or um, after the, uh, sometime after the 2019 election? Yeah, and, and in your introduction, you said like before the 2019 election. So I would not have had even this level of detail uh, before the 2019 uh, election uh, when I became Minister responsible for democratic institutions, so after the 2019 election, um, provide the briefings. Uh, it was certainly they were focusing on on China uh, as one of the most uh, uh, frequent uh, countries in terms of attempting to interfere. Um, I don't remember details of local community events in the city of Vancouver. Um, again, I, I the first time I saw these summaries was preparing uh, for this hearing. And there are a long list of caveats that you can't figure out from this summary. We don't know at what particular moment this intelligence information was gathered. Uh, we don't have the context of other pieces of information. We're not sure if it's a single source, if it was corroborated. So I, I want to be careful 
not to comment on these specific things other than having looked at the summaries uh, before, before my appearance today. I understand, and I, I, I don't want to ask you about the substance of any of the intelligence. I'm, I'm really just looking uh, uh, or seeking to understand whether these are, you would have been briefed on uh, these issues um, in your capacity as uh, having responsibilities for democratic institutions. So, so, th so they, they would have, for example, talked about proxy agents, and that is one of the ways that different hostile actors uh, attempt to uh, interfere. Uh, I would have understood that China was very present in that kind of activity, but I, was it in the city of Vancouver and was somebody kept out of a community event? That I would not have known. Understood. And if we could um, bring up some uh, dot 10, please. This is a, a summary, uh, Minister, in relation to PRC threat actors, contact with candidates, and uh, funding of threat actors. It mentions uh, 11 candidates, 13 political uh, staff, um, and a transfer of uh, $250,000. Were you uh, briefed uh, in relation, or did you had you been briefed in relation to these uh, to this body of intelligence uh, in your capacity and uh, as responsible for democratic institutions. So again, I I wouldn't comment on specific uh, allegations. In this case, I learned uh, about this when it became public following some leaks. Uh, so I would not have been briefed in this level of granularity. Um, but as I say, I, I also think it's important that people not think we are confirming stuff that appeared in particular leaks that, uh, of intelligence information. I think it just merits saying that I took note of the public discussion of these issues. Right. Um, and turning to uh, 2021 now, I'll ask the court operator to bring up some uh, four. And this is a summary, um, Minister, that describes uh, some of the allegations of misinformation or a disinformation campaign targeting uh, Aaron O'Toole, Kenny Chu, and the Conservative Party of Canada. And I, I want to ask whether uh, in the uh, months or weeks after the 2021 election, were you um, aware of, uh, um, were you aware of the intelligence uh, summarized in uh, this summary? Uh, again, I, I knew uh, that China used social media platforms and particularly WeChat uh, to propagate campaigns of disinformation and misinformation. Um, but the first time I learned about the specific allegations, either with respect to Mr. O'Toole uh, or Mr. Chu was following again the public uh, release the, of this information, and then there were subsequent meetings uh, in the fall of 2022, I think, and certainly in the spring of 2023, uh, where we were taken into some more detail, a small group of ministers. All right. And so turning then to those, uh, we'll jump ahead then to those briefings, um, and I'll take you specifically to uh, one that was held in May of 2023, and that's CAN 17676. <coughs> if you can scroll to the uh, second page, please. These are, I, I realize these are not your notes, uh, Minister, uh, but, but Brian, we heard but some- But Brian Clow has pretty good handwriting. <laughs> he does indeed. <laughs> so we heard some evidence from uh, Mr. Clow yesterday that these were notes that he he made during uh, a briefing on May 18th. And I understand that you were, uh, your name is listed at the top and I understand you were at this, this briefing. I was. All right. And um, the document or the notes refer to um, uh, some uh, expressions of uh, or partisan preferences, um, shifting, uh, fr wanting to punish. I'm looking at the first, uh, 
sort of in the middle of the page under discussion of media leaks. Uh, there's PRC, no threats of physical harm to MPs or families. Uh, the next line down, PRC wanted to punish LPC, shift to CPC, um, and some further discussion of shifting back to LPC. Was uh, this the first uh, time you have been briefed on um, intelligence relating to shifting uh, uh, partisan preferences expressed by the PRC? Uh, yes, it was. That was the first time I would have heard that level of granularity. I remember being quite skeptical um, that an intelligence briefing would be able to uh, discern the shifting preferences of a country uh, in another country's election. I've been in enough elections uh, where a lot of people claim to have influence uh, or to be involved in either a successful or an unsuccessful election and having uh, played a critical role where in some cases it's exaggerated. So that's part of a free uh, and open democratic discussion. I, but I do remember the officials offering up that, that, uh, that piece of intelligence at that meeting. All right, and there's also, I see a note uh, at, towards the bottom of the screen right now, FI in DVN 2019 nomination. Is this the first time you would have uh, heard at that sort of granular level about uh, particular intelligence relating to the uh, nomination process in uh, 2019 and DVN? Yes, I think it was. Okay. And uh, at the bottom of the screen now, there's reference to the 11 candidates and uh, a reference to $250,000 is, again, this is the first time you would have heard with that level of granularity about that, um, yes, that allegation. Yes, it was. All right. And uh, scrolling to the next page, if you could, sorry. Uh, the second unredacted line there, disinformation campaigns did exist. I can't conclude direct impact on certain results. Um, and above that, there's a, a list of various uh, uh, media outlets. Um, is this the first time you would have heard about uh, intelligence relating to a disinformation uh, campaign in 2021? Uh I don't disagree with Brian's notes. I think there was a meeting uh, in in February, in the winter of that same year. I, I don't have those notes in front of me, and I just want to make sure I don't say, yeah, that was the first time, and then uh, there's a note referencing. This sure. was the first time that I remember hearing about ridings, allegations around money exchanging, disinformation campaigns and China using social media platforms was something that we'd heard a lot about for a considerable amount of time. Um, but this may have been the first time when they went into detail of the targets, the particular uh, elements of the disinformation that was used. Thank you. And I, I don't mean to suggest it was, you may well have heard uh, um, about this uh, at an earlier briefing, but it was uh, well after 2021. It would have only been after uh, various media leaks. Is that fair to say? Yes, okay. yes. It, it, th this level of granularity started after uh, m some of these allegations were uh, in, in the public domain. Thank you. And would, uh, just to conclude, would having knowledge of this type of information, this level of granularity, had be would it have benefited your review of the uh, implementation of the plan to protect democracy in 2019 and your efforts to update that plan that you spoke about earlier um, uh, for 2021 would have having this level of uh, information about the nature and extent of threats of foreign interference have benefited uh, your efforts in reviewing and developing uh, the plan 2.0 as you put it. I'm not sure that this level of granularity would have made a significant difference. Uh, the senior officials at the Privy Council office who worked with me uh, talked to their colleagues in the intelligence secretariat at Privy Council office, and I assume uh, with the national security agencies. I certainly believed in the discussions I had with them. Uh, they gave me a sufficiently a precise uh, picture of the threat landscape of the countries that were uh, active in, in the particular 
foreign interference space. Um, and the measures that, that we wanted to, to be put in, to be adjusted or uh, tweaked following Mr. Judd's report of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians um, were validated by the fact that we had Mr. Judd uh, and uh, the members of the panel themselves confirming that in their views, the, the measures that had been in place had worked, had been successful. Um, so I had every confidence that I had all of the information I needed uh, and my colleagues at Privy Council Office, the senior officials that helped me uh, go to cabinet with the adjusted version of the plan, uh, were well aware of what we needed to to ask cabinet to make the changes, largely uh, based on uh, Mr. Judd's review. And Mr. Judd would have had all of this granularity. So. I had very much confidence in his experience in this area. He had a long and distinguished experience in this area. Uh, and I was told that he had been taken through all of this detail. I was satisfied to rely uh, on his advice and the advice of the deputy ministers at Privy Council office when we went to cabinet for the amended uh, or the adjusted plan. Those are all my questions, Commissioner. Thank you. We'll break for lunch. And uh, we'll come back at uh, 2.20. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. This hearing is in recess until 2.20. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 14h20.
This sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is Well, we just resumed, but I forgot my notes. Just a second, I'll be back. <laughs> Before we start the cross-examination, I just want to specify one thing. Uh, the question uh, that I've been asked of and the answer that I've the answer that I've been given by Minister Blair regarding the media report concerning the uh, CISIS warrant. Um, were outside the scope of this stage of the Commission work and no findings will be made on these matters in the initial report. Cross-examination. First one is Jenny, counsel for Jenny Kwan. Minister Leblanc, uh, my name is Sujit Chaudhary. I'm counsel for uh, Jenny Kwan, MP for Vancouver East. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I just have five minutes, so a couple of quick questions. Uh, the first is you've probably seen reports about the CSIS director's talking points that we uh, examined yesterday with the PMO panel. I just have a question about those, a, a quick one. that are dated February 21st, 2023. And it's CAN 4495. And just ever received a briefing from the director. Uh, and maybe if it would help. And in particular, it's on pages five and six. There's some conclusions, if you can scroll down. Yeah, so there's three conclusions listed on page five. And then there's two conclusions on page six. And uh, we, we're just wondering if you ever received a briefing from the director that covered those five points. Well, then, if you want me to speak to all five of them, let's go back to sure, the first three. Course, if I could go back up yeah. to the first three. Yeah. Because you'll appreciate the first time I saw this document was when I was preparing for these. Of course, sir. Yes. And I was not in that briefing that the Prime Minister would have had. Okay, can I see the last two again? Sure, of course. Thank you. And your question again? And so my question is, did you ever receive a, a briefing from the CSIS director that um, addressed any of those five points or communicated those five points? Uh, not in that context at all. My first briefing with the CSIS director as Minister of Democratic Institutions, um, level sort of analysis of the threat uh, landscape. Um, since I became Minister of Public Safety, uh, uh, I talked to the director of CSIS uh, about these issues with more precision than the Minister of Democratic Institutions at the time. He talks to me uh, about things that um, we've always said that the threat evolves, that the kind of uh, the nature of the threat and the particular uh, 
ways that hostile state or non-state actors attempt to interfere evolve. And he talks to me about what CSIS is doing to keep up with the evolving threat. So that would be the context of my conversations with him. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's actually a good segue to my next question, which is, so uh, Metra Drouin was here uh, testifying in her capacity, her most recent role as NSIA, and uh, and she offered an observation at the end of her cross-examination with me. She said that, you know, it's been two years, or two and a half years um, since uh, 2021, um, There's uh, and our, our understanding of foreign interference continues to evolve as to the kind of threat it might pose today. Uh, as to what it might have posed in 2021, let alone in 2019. And so the, and I know that you've been working on a, you've issued a report with Madame Charette uh, about uh, steps forward. And so I'm hoping I can ask you a couple of questions uh, on that theme of what our current understanding of foreign interference is and what, how we might respond today. Uh, and so the first is a question that's been put to other uh, members of the government, but we'll put to you as well. And if we could call up now, it's in the document database. Good. And is we can yes, that's it. Thank you. So threat levels chart, and so the question, which is a high threshold and a single threshold, this in the in the counterterrorism context, we use a spectrum, and uh, with kind of a, a graduated set of responses. And so is this type of framework an alternative to the high single threshold model that would be used for foreign interference? Is it something we should consider or look at carefully? So, and I, my colleague, uh, Karina Gould, would have talked about that this morning when she was the Minister of Democratic Institutions and brought forward the first Protecting Democracy Plan, which had the public protocol, the threshold is deliberately set at a high level. Um, it's an extraordinary moment in the middle of an election campaign where a group of five senior public servants chaired by the secretary to the cabinet, the most senior nonpartisan public servant in the country, uh, a potential threat of foreign interference that in their the ability of Canadians to have a free and fair election, including um, so the threshold has to be deliberately want a robust public discourse moments in a country's democratic evolution, and that's positive. You want to encourage robust debate uh, and having a uh, weekly comment from a panel of the most senior public servants or regular commentary would be an extraordinary moment and done at anything less than a high threshold in our view uh, might might undermine confidence in the election. So that's why it's deliberately set that high and that's why I don't think a comparison to a terrorism threat uh, level is, is a valid comparison. During the election campaign, the national security agencies are still very much, according to law, doing their job at detecting and disrupting foreign interference. You're going to the ultimate instrument of a public declaration by uh, the panel of five. I think it's important to know that the work is being done on a regular and effective basis throughout the election period and obviously before the election as well. So one follow-up question, Minister, because, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, of course. So, so I mean, just to put this back to you, it could be that at the critical level, there's a public announcement by the panel of five, but beneath that, there's different types of communications that might not be of that character to parties, to candidates, to different entities. So there is a, there's a more complicated, a more complex set of tools protocol that might evolve in response to the record. 
and uh, the question is and so it, then kind of the all or nothing approach where it's a, a five where there's communications to parties to candidates to affected communities that maybe don't have the same Well, I, I think, you, as I said, you want to be careful in an electoral context before uh, intelligence uh, public context. You know that there's a, a security cleared representatives of each political party that can meet uh, with uh, representatives of the intelligence and security community. Uh, Elections Canada has access to these officials as well. Um, I don't think that you can. I don't think that you can have a, a spectrum of public comment. Uh, it either reaches the threshold where, in the independent professional judgment of these five senior officials, they are required to inform the public because, in their judgment, our ability to conduct a free and fair election in a riding or nationally is affected. I don't think you take steps along that road. It's a nest. Candidates respond to allegations. Candidates disagree with other candidates. Posts. Uh, that's part of a normal, robust democratic discussion. And having intelligence services or senior public officials commenting in in a public way in an election, in our view, has to be because in their independent judgment during the caretaker period, they think that something has happened that impedes the ability of Canadians to have a free and fair election. And it's important to note that in 2019 and 2021, in their judgment, they did not think that was the case. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. My name is Tom Jarman. I good represent afternoon. Aaron O'Toole. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, during the period from you were serving your duties as Minister of Democratic the intelligence precincts you received were high level as opposed Yeah, they were high level. Uh, There was discussions of different state, hostile state and non-state actors that were active in this space, but uh, it didn't go down into details uh, around specific ridings uh, uh, or specific geographical regions. Okay, thank you. And uh, this morning when uh, Minister Gould testified, she talked about uh, the relationship she developed with uh, Facebook, Twitter and Microsoft, and I guess Google as well. Um, in order to come to this voluntary protocol with respect to the 2019 election. Um, was that reviewed after the 2019 election? Uh, yes, it was reviewed uh, by the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians and by Mr. Judd uh, in his review. Uh, the, the, the voluntary uh, undertaking that Ms. Gould got from the major social media platforms was reviewed, and in fact, in 2021, we also added uh, others to that space. Yes. And what steps were taken to add uh, foreign en enterprises like uh, Tencent and ByteDance, who are I did, and the National Security and Intelligence recognized that there was a threat of dis some foreign state and non-state actors uh, were particularly active. Um, that is a process in uh, a moment where social media has taken on such significant importance and has such a significant impact. Um, but members of the site task force and others Uh, with the social media platforms. A period where the government is in is ones that would have those conversations. And the... Tencent been asked to enter into the same relationship. 
relationships with, uh, as Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, and Google. I, I want to be careful before getting in. I'd, I'd want to, I, I don't want to talk about specific discussions that may have happened with intelligence uh, officials who, who are the ones that are best placed uh, to give this advice to the government. Um, but we have participated, for example, uh, in a G7 effort, the rapid response uh, mechanism. Canada was a global leader in this space. There was the Paris call for trust in democracy, where I participated uh, quickly or soon after becoming Democratic Institutions Minister uh, with other uh, countries. It's a live conversation with our Five, uh, ally, five Eyes uh, partners about what we can do in terms of sharing information around different A complicated space. You'll appreciate that it's not easy for one country to uh, uh, in this area. That's why the most countries, uh, and there's increasingly an G7 partners uh, to work in this space together. Um, we took our responsibility. Uh, to do everything that we could. Uh, and I, I would think that certainly the work that Ms. Gould did told us that the major social media platforms uh, want to ensure that they're not uh, participating in activities or, or being used uh, in a way that disinformation or misinformation campaigns uh, could affect negatively the outcome of an election. Uh, but it's, it's a constant challenge for democratic governments around the world, uh, and it's an active conversation that I've had with counterparts uh, in other countries as well. Great. That's my time. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Next one is uh, Council for RCDA, Metzirois. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, ministre Leblanc, vous avez été impliqué dans le développement du mandat de la présidente commission, n'est-ce pas? Oui. You were involved in the mandate of this uh, commission, Mr. Leblanc. So, the commission was set up with uh, great care. Could you repeat your question, please? Question. Each word was picked with uh, great caution. We all agreed with each word in uh, the terms of reference and the mandate you just quoted. The Commission to investigate for interference uh, by uh, China among other state actors. So, it So is the government aware of uh, similar allegations uh, when Russia interfered with the 43rd and 42nd? I will not comment on the publications, on allegations in the public domain about uh, allegations of particular intelligence. It is known in the public domain that Russia is particularly involved in disinformation and misinformation campaigns in other contexts and in cyber attacks. I am referring to what is in the public domain. And um, earlier, in other countries, we saw allegations of Russians' involvement in such threats. But I will not comment on the specifics of Russian interference. Um, but I will say, as, it was, as was said publicly, that Russia was quite active in other circumstances, and we wanted to make sure that all appropriate measures of protections were available in Canada. Question? There are other questions.
wondering why we don't just mention China. general election. And, sir, I didn't say that Russia didn't get involved. I said that it is a that Russia is, get, is interfering through misinformation and disinformation campaigns in other countries uh, in the public domain. There were allegations concerning Russia, uh, uh, concerning cyber attacks. When I spoke, Parliamentary leaders of the three pol major political a year ago in the spring, people spoke uh, about China and Russia. There are other countries. We saw allegations regarding India. I remember at some point in the conversation, it was, I believe, in the month of August when we were finaling, finalizing the term in terms of reference, uh, we uh, concluded among ourselves uh, that we wanted uh, uh, to give the Commission the ability uh, to lead the evidence. Uh, but we used uh, the terms of other uh, state and non-state actors because uh, we want the Commission to be able uh, to establish the evidence and to uh, come to its Find, and to come to some findings questions. So uh, the commission was created to make sure that nothing was missed by the government in terms of Russian involvement in the last two general elections. Answer, we're always seeking recommendations uh, in order to reinforce the already robust measures that uh, we have put in place uh, and which were appropriate during the say that it applies particularly to Russia. I am looking for regarding several um, countries, some findings uh, which deserve uh, to be looked into and uh, reviewed. about where the Commission is going to go in its findings, but uh, among the four major uh, parties, we agreed that uh, Russia was in and China were involved, uh, but they're not the only countries, and we will not comment on specific incidents of a particular country. The Commission, of course, has access to all information and uh, uh, all evidence, uh, but I would like to be careful in the public domain. I, my last question. So we did mention uh, Russia to make sure that uh, uh, Russia would be investigated by the Commission. Reply, we recognize that Russia is active, particularly uh, in terms of potential cyber attacks uh, and uh, disinformation and misinformation. And the, the four political parties decided to use two examples of countries uh, which were discussed a lot uh, in the public domain. But we wanted the Commission, uh, uh, for the Commission to have access to uh, all classified information, to all documents, uh, and uh, with senior officials uh, uh, who were able to brief the Commission. So in its finding, we wanted the Commission to be able to lead the evidence. Thank you. Conservative Party. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In front of you, Minister LeBlanc. This is a news report from CTV News published June 2, 2023. And at the top, page two, the top of page two, it says, Affairs Minister Dominic Leblanc 
is leading a process to determine independent MP Handong's possible return to the Liberal caucus. Do you see that? 2023, you are leading a process to determine. Well, we, we've been sure we've been through this before. There's there's considerable controversy about uh, Mr. Dong's uh, uh, participation, willing or not, in foreign interference, and there's conflicting reports as to uh, what he did or didn't do, and what he said or didn't say, and whether that gave rise to for lack of a better term, discipline or him being forced from Liberal caucus. So I'm asking this witness whether that in fact happened and whether in light of, I'll come to the questions, in light of the uh, Special Rapporteur's conclusions, uh, that decision uh, to be excluded from caucus has been reconsidered at all. And, and, and tell me, what is the relationship with uh, uh, a and B of the uh, terms of reference, because I can sure. mandate of the commission, but well, we the, are the just part of part of phase one is to understand I'm going to discipline, but uh, I think after 2024 is our time being. So, so maybe said publicly in the House of Commons that he voluntarily decided to withdraw. Uh, from the Liberal caucus when the allegations became public. He stood up one evening in the House of Commons uh, and voluntarily withdrew uh, from the Liberal caucus and asked the Speaker to sit as an independent. That was the decision that Mr. Dong made when these allegations uh, became public, and that is on the public record. Those were his words. Okay. Mr. Dong has also said since that he would like to rejoin caucus and that he's had discussions with you about the possibility of rejoining caucus. Is that correct? I think now you're pressing the line. It, it goes uh, beyond the, uh, okay. the I, scope of the, 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 this phase. Okay. So I'll just put the, the questions on the record. I, I appreciate your ruling. And, and if it's correct that uh, Mr. Dong has requested to rejoin caucus uh, and uh, that has not yet been uh, acceded to that request. I'd like to know why. And uh, so that's the next question. I accept your ruling, Madam so Commissioner. Ruling. And I'd just like to put on the record the documents that speak to uh, uh, these questions that I've intended to ask uh, Minister LeBlanc. It's uh, COM uh, 304430, sorry, COM. 344, 345, 346, and 347. So, those are my questions. Thank those, you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Madame, nous avons, nous n'avons aucune question. Madame Commissioner, we have no questions for this witness. Thank you. No questions. Thank you. Human Rights Coalition. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Uh, could we please pull up Hello. Doc 15 and turn to page four? This is going to be the institutional report prepared by Public Safety Canada. And the final bullet point on page four reads, the public safety minister is responsible for most of the federal agencies operating in the areas of national security, policing and law enforcement, border services and corrections, and conditional release, namely 
importantly, the RCMP, CSIS, CBSA, CSC, and PBC. The minister's role is to coordinate their activities and establish strategic priorities relating to public safety and emergency preparedness. Is this correct? Uh, yes. Is it a strategic priority to protect diaspora communities? It's always been a priority, not just of the public safety department, but of the whole government. Uh, as I learned about uh, the prevalence of foreign interference, uh, we were always struck that diaspora communities are, in many cases, the targets and the victims um, of these foreign interference attempts. So uh, it's the public safety department is absolutely seized with that, as would be, for example, of CSIS and other uh, agencies. But the whole government is concerned about this. My colleague, the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion, talks to me about just my department, but the public safety department is absolutely uh, concerned about this, but it goes. Uh, and if I could ask the court operator to please pull up CAN 2096. And as it's being pulled up, uh, Minister, I understand this was an election security brief provided. The first page at the third bullet point, it's under the heading. Sorry, slide. do we know the date of that? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so just under slide two, it reads, a 2016 public threat report from the Communication Security Establishment, CSE, identified political parties and politicians, electoral activities, and the media as vulnerable to threats, but also noted that our system has inherent strengths built in. For example, paper-based ballots cannot be hacked. Would you agree with this statement? And for uh, I I think our system has a lot of inherent strengths. Uh, one of them is paper-based ballots. That's probably in the context of cyber attacks. That my discussions with Elections Canada or the security agencies have always been around the risk, obviously, of a cyber attack in the case of uh, paper ballots. It's a lot easier to maintain public confidence uh, in in the election uh, machinery and in the outcome. I, I don't remember that before me, uh, if it was my then Deputy Minister Ian McCowan, who was a Deputy Secretary at Privy Council Office, these were ongoing conversations that I would have had with him over a number of meetings or briefings. And so you said that it would be one of many tools in an arsenal to address the issue. Um, and with that in mind, you would agree that a paper-based ballot doesn't make an elector any less vulnerable to intimidation or harassment, which is why there needs to be other mechanisms. Uh, yeah, that's a fair statement. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. AG? I have no questions. Thank you. No, thank you. I have a question for you. Mr. Leblanc, you indicated uh, uh, during the chief examination that you learned about allegations uh, about uh, Mr. Chung and Mr. O'Toole only when the information was made public in 2022. And also, when you addressed another question, you said that it would not really have been useful to you uh, when you undertook to assess uh, to what extent the measures which were put in place uh, had been sufficient or uh, had been efficient. Could you indicate? Uh, uh, if in your role as a minister, this type of information would have been useful to you uh, at the same time when uh, such information was identified. Question, are you speaking uh, as a minister of democratic institution? Reply, yes. As a Minister of, uh, of Democratic Institutions, and then you can speak as a Minister of Public Safety. Uh, reply, I'm quite comfortable uh, about the fact that my discussion 
questions uh, with uh, uh, the BCO officials and my private discussions gave me sufficient information uh, how we needed to evolve our measures between the 2019 and the 2021 election. For example, I was aware that there were hostile uh, actors or media platforms uh, that were using proxies uh, for intimidation purposes. At the time, I had no responsibility, operational responsibilities uh, uh, to uh, uh, follow up. Uh, in the case of X and Y uh, person or X and Y country, uh, because uh, uh, this would have been in the hands of uh, my colleague uh, who was in charge of public safety. Um, this would have been less left to in intelligence organizations. So in my uh, general discussions with senior officials, I was convinced that I had enough information to assess a plan to protect democratic institutions. I didn't necessarily need to know that it was X candidate or uh, city Y which were involved. It was about asking and being with CMP, the Privy Council. had sufficient information to uh, It was just uh, because of uh, as Minister for Democratic I took on uh, responsibilities as been before, the role of the Minister for Public Safety uh, uh, in terms of approving uh, by intelligence agencies uh, the uh, questions of the uh, mandate of uh, sometimes they will inform the Minister of a threat the public safety minister, but I think it, it would not have been appropriate to be aware of such details as minister for democratic institutions. Both hats, a question, and uh, as a public sa safety minister, do you expect to be made aware of such allegations? Uh, answer, yes, absolutely, and I can assure you that in my discussions with Mr. Vigneault or his colleagues, it is the kind of discussions that they uh, have very free, freely with me. I, I am quite well informed on such issues. And when, if they deem it appropriate or when they need my, uh, my approval, or uh, they are obligated to inform me. Sometimes they are required to inform me without necessarily requiring the, uh, my authorization, but uh, I am very comfortable with such exchanges now. Thank you. So no re-examination after my question. No. What's <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sure, I'll give you a few minutes. On va convenir de cinq minutes. We'll give you five minutes, Mr. Monceau. Good afternoon, Mr. Leblanc. Good afternoon. Alain Monceau from the Bloc Québécois. We learned through the media as well as by way of different testimony here that the 
Safeguard Defend, a human rights coalition in September of 2022 had drawn the attention of 55 uh, Chinese police stations around the world, including three here. And then the RCMP said they had conducted an inquiry on two of these police stations, one in Montreal and another one in Brassard. These two police stations seem to have engaged in interference activities uh, from those locations. So you, the minister at the time, which minister? The minister of public safety at the time. You mean my predecessor? Yes. So your predecessor mentioned, and this was reported in the media, that the two police stations in question had been closed. They had been shut down indefinitely, and we also learned that illegal activities had been carried out. And this is why those two police stations had been shut down. Can you tell us whether indeed those illegal activities were criminal activities? the Commission's work, which is focused on uh, Mr. Monson, can you please establish the connection you are making? Our mandate is fairly limited in this stage. In fact, you are right. Establishing is that those police for 2022 as police stations were in existence in 2019 or 2021, unless there is evidence to the contrary. I want to make sure I understand. I don't want to open a can of worms at this point, which will not be useful in this phase. What you are saying what we are looking at is uh, foreign interference. Just before or during the 2019 and 2021 elections, and what you are saying is that these Chinese police stations existed before th that time. So what connection are you establishing between the 2019 and 2020 elections and their existence? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they existed then, and we can presume there was interference because the RCMP shut them down afterwards because of So your question is, what were those illegal acts? The RCMP would only have interfered in terms of foreign interference if there had been illegal activities. We never learned about those activities. I believe the question is too general. If you can reword the question, whether to the knowledge of the minister to the 2019 and 2021 elections, I would allow that. As you worded it, is uh, exceeds the Uh, if there were to this matter, and there is ongoing litigation in relation to this matter, it would not be appropriate. And then my second point is, uh, my friend has not provided any information to found the statements that he is making, that these police stations were in existence early, that they were in 2019, and it's somewhat unfair for the witness to be asked questions on a basis of a hypothetical set of certain circumstances that he may know nothing about. But this is the reason why I made clear that it's as far as Minister Leblanc knows, he doesn't have to speculate, uh, but if he knows uh, whether some of his alleged activities would have been uh, in relation with the elections, then this question is permitted. But I will not permit that you, you go very far with this line of questions. Alors, est-ce qu'effectivement, 
to know about any illegal acts which may have been committed from these two Chinese police stations in Mar. does not determine what is a legal or illegal activity or a judge. I believe you when you quote what the RCMP allegedly said. I would have to look into what the RCMP had in fact stated. I am about these supposed police stations. I think it is important to use supposed or alleged to qualify those stations, but I don't have any. And as the government, as government counsel has said, I am not confident enough uh, to answer that as there may be ongoing investigations. So I'm quite hesitant to answer the question on that particular issue. Thank you. We will now uh, move into break. I know that we are supposed to have a five-minute break, but in fact, it'll be more tw like 20 minutes, given the fact that witnesses will be changing and that certain security measures will have to be put into place. So I expect to be back in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Please, alors s'il vous plaît, this hearing is in recess until 3:24. Five? 3.30. La séance est en pause jusqu'à 3h30.
Your attention, please. The la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère commencera sous peu. Veuillez...
Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît, the sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission is back in session. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère a repris. Alors, M. Chaudry, c'est vous qui menez Chateau Le Chaudry, lead counsel for the commission. Our witness this afternoon is Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Can I ask that the witness be sworn or affirmed? Do you wish to be sworn or affirmed for the record? Sworn, please. Today's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So, Prime Minister, we'll start with the uh, typical routine housekeeping. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I ask you to pull, pull up WIT 66, please? Prime Minister, you'll recall being interviewed by Commission Council on February 27th, 2024? Yes. Can you confirm that you've re reviewed the summary of that interview, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence before the Commission? I can. Thank you. Uh, the next is WIT 67, please, Mr. Clerk. So, Mr. Prime Minister, this is the uh, summary of your in-camera examination. You recall having been examined in camera by Commission Council earlier this year? Yes, I do. Okay, and once again, can you confirm that you've reviewed the summary, that the summary is accurate, and that you adopt it as part of your evidence for the Commission? I can. Perfect. We can take that down now, Mr. Clerk. So I'm going to ask you to start today, Prime Minister, by asking a pretty general question, but nevertheless a fundamental one, which is, having been Prime Minister now since 2015, can you paint for the Commission a picture of the foreign interference landscape uh, over your tenure as Prime Minister? And, I, and before you answer, I'll just put two sort of precisions on that. One is that we know foreign interference comes in all shapes and sizes, but the kind of foreign interference that interests us most today at this commission is obviously foreign interference us as an institution. Second, um, all questions I pose to you, please stick to information. Um. that we had grown concerned about uh, as a party when we were in opposition before the 2015 election was the lack of oversight by parliamentarians uh, into what was going on in our national security universe in this country. Um, example of the... Uh, wasn't a process whereby parliamentarians of different parties of opposition parties could examine uh, top secret material uh, was seen as a lacking that Canada had, certainly compared to our other Five Eyes partners, which is why in our 2015 campaign platform, we committed to creating uh, a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, whereby parliamentarians of all different parties uh, would be sworn into the highest levels of uh, clearance to be able to oversee, verify, uh, and um, ascertain that everything that our national security agencies were doing was on the one hand compliant with Canadian values, rules, and the charter, and on the other hand, uh, doing everything necessary to keep Canadians safe. So we started in 2015 with a commitment to strengthen our national security institutions. We did that by the creation of uh, National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. We also combined a number of um, oversight organizations into NCIRA, which is a more um, judicial uh, or uh, academic or high-level uh, oversight of our national security agencies, uh, as well as you know, as we began to govern, strengthened our uh, various national security and intelligence agencies uh, and changed our national security advisor to a national security and intelligence advisor because it's not just about security and obviously the work around intelligence was getting more and more complex and important and part of keeping Canadians safe. Over the course of that first mandate, um, we witnessed 
uh, the uh, significant uh, foreign interference allegations or threats during the 2016 uh, presidential election in the United States, where uh, Russia certainly through misinformation and disinformation online uh, attempted to interfere. Uh, but also, more interestingly, as a key example, in 2017, during the French presidential election, there was actually a moment in which uh, officials within the French governmental apparatus actually had to come out and tell uh, the citizens of France that a particular piece of information or news that was about to break was in fact uh, Russian disinformation and should not be uh, given any weight or heed. That got us to reflecting on whether or not Canada had a potential to intercede in an election campaign uh, if there was a, a significant threat of foreign interference impacting the ability in fair way. Uh, so we uh, got them here in Canada, which ended up being two mechanisms task force that allows uh, our security agencies to monitor very closely the goings on in the election. And the panel of five, uh, which is top civil servants who would have uh, the ability, if they deemed it necessary, to actually go public um, or take other actions to ensure the uh, protection of our, our uh, democratic institutions and electoral process. One of the other examples of things that we've uh, uh, when Canada hosted the G7 uh, leaders actually brought forward and created the G7 rapid response mechanism which was designed uh, to monitor and respond to uh, threats of misinformation and disinformation in uh, our democracies, uh, a tool that has been in a number of different occasions and indeed was uh, more recently actually strengthened uh, to weigh in a little more on uh, the democracies in Eastern Europe where we're seeing significant interference by uh, Russians, given the, the conflict in Ukraine. Okay, thank you for that summary. Um, what I'm going to try and get at now is uh, the threats, really, to which all of this responds. So we heard from Minister Gould this morning about the, the plan to protect Canada's democracy and, and what it was really designed to, to do, that, that process. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I'm going to ask you to pull up a document, uh, CAN 019496. So, Mr. Of information, or at least that was, was uh, available to you at that time, and that's what I'm going to bring out here. So, if we, this is a memo that was written to you by David Morrison, your NSIA at the time, uh, and you received it in June 2017. So, the, the top of that um, document there talks about the Chinese foreign in interference threat. And it says, the CSIS describes the PRC essentially as sophisticated, pervasive, persistent. There are other countries around, but the PRC is the big one. Mr. Clerk, if you can just scroll down a little bit more. Okay, um, scroll down, scroll down, I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Okay, there we go. So uh, on the third page here, you'll see Prime Minister, it talks about allies who are facing similar challenges and refers specifically to Australia in which I believe what's explained there is they, uh, in Australia it was found that agents of the Chinese government were donating millions of dollars across the political spectrum. So your NSIA is informing you of this and keep scrolling down please, Mr. Clerk, to the next page and then brings it back to Canada. Um, oh, sorry, scroll down a little bit more, please, Mr. Clerk, till the next page. PCO comments. There we go, okay. 
Last page. Politicians and elected officials, in particular at the provincial, territorial, and municipal levels, are largely This is a very sensitive issue, and public efforts to, to raise awareness should remain general and not single out specific countries to avoid potential bilateral incidents. However, countries across the line should be reminded of appropriate conduct and risk of consequences. So, Mr. Prime Minister, I'd like you to speak to those points, if you can. First of all, the level of not coming from the PRC, and also that foreign interference, while at the same time like? Um, well, first of all, it's a good example, as I spoke about the um, experiences in the United States and in France. Uh, the experience that Australia had, uh, not with Russia, but with China, is uh, another excellent example that we were very aware of at the time. Uh, and highly the fact that there are uh, foreign state actors who are uh, interested in playing a role in, in, uh, in our democracies or in disrupting our democracies. The difference between Russia and China is a significant one in that China has a, a, a very large diaspora of Chinese Canadians who are uh, often the first uh, targets of interference uh, efforts by uh, a foreign state. Uh, by that foreign state. So we were very aware of it. As a politician in Canada for um, eight years when I became Prime Minister, uh, I was certainly aware of the various ways um, officials and different countries, particularly Canadian political processes, but uh, in 2015, maybe into 2016, our national security officials. Some of the things uh, understood as opposition politicians now in a position of being in government, that we wanted to understand more about the role of communities and, you know, we even wanted to know about particular individuals that we had heard things about uh, and understand what lens because we suddenly had access to a very sophisticated and uh, excellent national security apparatus that when one is a simple opposition politician you don't have access to. So from the very beginning we knew there were things we needed to know about. This uh, 2017 memo is certainly a continuation of uh, that level of awareness. The issue of it being a sensitive issue uh, is, um, is quite germane, uh, and it evolves over time. Uh, back in the early days of our government, we were very much uh, looking to deepen the trade and commercial ties with China. Uh, seeing it as an opportunity for exports. One of my biggest files of the day on that was trying to uh, restore the canola shipments that many uh, Western grain farmers were relying on uh, that were seeing um, irregular blockages uh, from the Chinese authorities. So that was part of our work. But even as we were doing that, we were very aware of the areas in which we we needed to uh, challenge or contest China, whether it was on issues of human rights or democracy, of uh, Uyghurs, of uh, uh, our, uh, our diaspora communities from Uh, they chose to arbitrarily detain two Canadians close to three years. Uh, we were 
back hard against China on um, the tensions and the fact that they needed to release those two Canadians. But we were extremely active around the world in mobilizing other countries to bring up uh, Canada and the plight of the two Michaels uh, during their bilateral conversations, which was something I can say um, ended up putting a significant amount of um, strain on our relationship because it was a massive irritant to China that everyone kept talking about these two Michaels even when uh, they didn't have anything to do with Canada. We heard it regularly, but that was what we would continue to do. Um, it perhaps came to the, the, the greatest sort of head in terms of um, being reminded of appropriate contact. C'est-à-dire que cela nous uh, rappelait November les contacts appropriés et les conséquences possibles. Um, saw the president of China, Xi Jinping, at the um, opening ceremonies. I mentioned to him that I needed uh, China to stop um, interfering in Canadian democratic processes because that was very much uh, something that uh, people were very concerned about that back home. Um, we'll move then to the front picture of to some more precise questions. Je vais commencer en français, monsieur, maintenant. Et on va parler d'un sujet. So now let's move. It has to do with the way that you receive information, uh, intelligence information. Now, in your interview and previous testimony, the written documents were not necessarily a reflection of the information you received. And in fact, it's the ver main part of your briefings. Can you explain that to us and the way you receive uh, the information you need? Well, first of all, any prime minister receives countless briefings, receives countless information, not only on foreign interference or national security issues, but on the economy or uh, public security issues, um, concerns shared by allies. I am constantly in receiving mode of all kinds of information from departments and advisors across government. I, of course, also follow the headlines to know what Canadians are reading about, hearing about, what they are concerned about in their daily lives. Now, all of this information is presented in different ways, but despite the fact that I receive written information, uh, briefs on intelligence, the only make me aware of a priority issue is I'm traveling or if I'm particularly is the best way to convey information to me is to receive a direct briefing from my national security advisor and intelligence advisor updates, usually on several topics um, during the same session, and this would happen on a regular basis. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's only three or four times a month. It all depends. But the only way to guarantee to make sure that I receive the necessary information is to give me an in-person briefing or over a secure line, if necessary, on any issue or priority issue. Now, you 
mention the NSIA, so the National Security and Intelligence Advisor. Is this the person you depend on the most to provide you with the information you need in this area, or do you get the information from the clerk or from both? Well, in that particular field, it is the NSIA to um, keep me fully briefed on everything I need to know and to answer any questions I might have about security or intelligence. So she is the person I turn to to get the answers I need. The uh, clerk often has a role to play to uh, bring priority issues to my attention. Um, it could be security or intelligence uh, issues, but it's mostly the NSIA who is mandated with um, keeping me fully briefed on security and intelligence issues. When you receive that, I ask you to explain to us how you respond, how you react. Can you tell us of staff, Ms. Telford yesterday testified that she received some information or security or intelligence products with a certain degree of uh, reserve and does not necessarily take the information at face value. Sometimes the information might be erroneous. And I would like to know what you think about that based on your experience. Well, in politics, there is a principle, especially uh, for those who are giving briefing or passing along information to a minister or to the prime minister, that if you are not sure about what you are conveying, you might not want to convey it. You cannot give a minister or the prime minister uh, wrong information before they rise on the House or speak publicly. This could be very prob problematic. So when I receive information on an incident which has occurred or on any kind of concern or on a natural disaster or an issue Canadians need to deal with, well, the veracity of the information, the accuracy of the information, the, its completeness is very important. However, I would make an exception with regard to intelligence. When you receive intelligence, it's not legal circles, it's well known that the difference between between those two issues. So when I receive a briefing, whether it's in writing or more frequently verbally, officials the reliability of the information being said, for instance, when I was briefed on the fact that Iran had uh, shot down a Ukrainian airline uh, on which 100 Canadians were on board, the first report were a little more vague. However, they told me they had indications that A, B, or C. And then at the next briefing, there was a lot more information. They knew that Iranian armed forces had shot down that Ukrainian aircraft. So what I am saying is that you have to take this intelligence, you have to take this information with a certain awareness, that it still needs to be confirmed or it might not be 100% accurate because it is very sensitive information. Uh, 
Ukraine. A, receive a report on Canada's unemployment rate or inflation rate. So there is a certain degree, I would not say skepticism, but of critical thought that must be applied to any uh, information. Um, I'm going to take you to the 20. Pull up uh, CAN005461, please. So, Prime Minister, this is, while it's getting pulled up, yep, there it is. Um, we know at this point in the, uh, the evidence before the... This gave a briefing to uh, the security cleared representative of the Liberal party about foreign interference in the Don Valley North riding. We also know from Mr. Broadhurst that he then received that information. How did this play out from your perspective? Uh, late in September, uh, as I was coming through Ottawa, um, I believe I was on my way out uh, across the country for a, a, another stretch of campaigning. Um, I believe it was on a Sunday as I was, I was heading out after Saturday with, uh, with my family. Uh, Mr. Broadhurst um, met me at the airport uh, in a, a holding room, in a lounge uh, on the, uh, the um, government side of the airport, government terminal in the airport, uh, to let let me know of concerns that he had received from the site task force and uh, CSIS about the nomination campaign, the nomination uh, election, um, the nomination race contest in uh, Don Valley North. He shared with me um, that intelligence services had shared with him concerns, had developing plans to possibly interference in the nomination contest, uh, specifically uh, by mobilizing buses uh, filled with and I'm, it, the challenge in this is always trying to pick out what I heard exactly then from what I knew later, but I believe it was either buses full of students or buses filled with Chinese speakers or Chinese diaspora members who would be mobilized uh, to support Han Dong, uh, who would have been mobilized to support Han Dong uh, in that nomination uh, contest of a few weeks previous. Uh, in what ended up being probably a 20 minute to half hour conversation with Mr. Broadhurst, I asked him uh, more specifically about, um, okay, so they had plans or an intent or a capacity to do this. Do we know that they did? Did you hear from CSIS and, and the security agencies that this was actually done? Um, he, they weren't entirely certain there was reasons to believe that perhaps it has and perhaps there were the indication was that there were buses that nomination contest um i asked, of course those who are in uh politics and certainly uh, on the ground riding politics know that it is regular for buses to be student groups, uh, you know, a particular uh, full of seniors to participate in, in a nomination contest. So just the existence of buses wasn't enough, buses with uh, Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers in them wasn't enough to um, be itself uh, alarming or, or uh, uh, 
a, a condemnation, but it was, there were clear indications that there were concerns by CSIS that China um, and that those students or those individuals on the bus might have been motivated uh, or brought, mobilized to vote in that way, and these, there were concerns that CSIS had. I asked um, the extent to which they were certain that it happened, the extent to which they were certain that China was indeed behind the mobilizing of the bus or buses. And I also asked uh, whether or not CSIS had information that Han Dong knew about this, whether he was a witting and aware that China had mobilized or Chinese officials had mobilized buses for him or not. And the answers, answers were not clear from CSIS at that point, uh, according to what Mr. Broadhurst told me. I then uh, asked, I also asked if, um, if it was a close nomination, if there was a sense that the actual result of the nomination uh, could have been affected by this bus or buses or what was there, and that wasn't clear at all. CSIS didn't have any conclusions to share at that point. Um, I asked Mr. Broadhurst uh, whether CSIS was making any uh, recommendations or uh, suggestions as to what we should do with this information. And it was clear um, to Mr. Broadhurst that this was very much about just letting us know so that we know and could perhaps um, take any actions that we deemed um, appropriate, but they weren't going to be recommending for us to take. Also specified uh, that um, this was uh, secret information that we could not share with the candidate in question, Mr. Dong. Uh, or the public at large uh, in terms of, of what they were telling us about these concerns and this allega these allegations. I then asked Mr. Broadhurst um, what the Liberal Party nominations, particularly contested nominations, had flagged around that nomination contest of a few weeks before. Um, there are party officials that oversee uh, the voting, the registrations, the voting, the processes, the counting. There are lawyers in place overseeing the count. Uh, there are possibilities for the losing contestant or contestants to challenge uh, the result if they feel it was unfair. There are many processes because um, political parties often have some very uh, complex uh, fights around nomination uh, parties, all uh, nomination contests, all political parties are like that. Um, and Mr. Broadhurst uh, assured me that they had looked into when they heard uh, these allegations or this information from CSIS uh, and CITE and had no flags on the nomination process. Um, so then I had uh, uh, what was a brief conversation with Mr. Broadhurst uh, after we had established all that um, to sort of agree that the threshold for overturning like an official party nomination to find out, particularly during an election, general election, for removal of that candidate. And that was really sort of the binary choice uh, we were placed with in that situation. Acting would be removing Han Dong as our official candidate. Um, the other choice would be not to remove that candidate. Even not having removed that candidate, we would have to revisit. There would be questions we would have to follow up on um, after the election to properly understand what, uh, what happened and what, what the issues or the risks were in this situation. So but understanding that the decision to um, 
remove someone needed a high threshold, a threshold that incidentally I have um, met and seen many other cases. As Liberal Party leader, I have uh, on many, many different occasions uh, had to uh, ask people to step down or step away or desist as candidates for the Liberal Party. Yes. Most recently, it's the last election where we did that in the, in the case of uh, a downtown Toronto riding. Um, but in this case, I didn't feel that there was sufficient or sufficiently credible information that, that would justify this um, very significant step as to um, uh, in these circumstances. So where does that leave you? put it as a pretty binary choice there, but you they classified information that you can't share. What are you able to do? Where does this leave a political party receiving this information? Um, after the election, when we were out of caretaker period, where I went back to being primarily prime minister and not um, simply leader of a political party with uh, 338 candidates across the country, um, I was able to turn to our um, intelligence agencies and say, uh, we need to know, know more about this. Uh, we need to understand what the context is because the answers that we get on that will have a bearing on choices we could make in the future. Responsibilities for a, an individual in uh, such a situation. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to some other things now because we have a lot to cover in 75 minutes. Um, okay, so the next topic then, uh, Mr. Clerk, you can pull this up, CAN 003116, but Prime Minister, I think I can ask you this question without reference to a document. An incident that was reported by the RRM in the 29th election had to do with an article um, published in the Buffalo Chronicle, some misinformation, false information about you specifically. Is that something that came to your attention in the 2019 election? Uh, no, it did not. No, it did not. Okay. Sorry, the, the engagement of the uh, site task force or the panel or anyone into that issue was not something I was aware of at the time. I was, of course, uh, aware of uh, the um, quite disgusting um, false uh, conspiracies or, or allegations and a significant number of uh, conservative politicians. So the, the apparatus was dealing with it. I, I I may have been aware of the article. I was certainly aware of the allegations and the accusations that were heinous and untrue in, uh, in that. Okay. Um, I think that's probably what we'll cover for 2019, although I do want to pull up uh, CAN 015. Prime Minister, this is the memo from David Morrison. I, miss, I misspoke earlier. Uh, this is January 14th, 2020, I think, when you received this. And it's essentially a report on the 2019 election, not on the outcome of the election, but on the operation of the, the site task force and the panel. Mr. Clerk, can you scroll down to the third bullet, please? Actually, could I just quickly look at the box? Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah, the, the third bullet. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so what they say here is pre-election intel briefings and monitoring provided a baseline assessment, uh, suggesting that and foreign interference would be commensurate to overall interference campaigns. While some in instances were noted and some TRMs, TRM as a threat reduction measure were taken, none of these activities met the threshold. And then Mr. Clerk, can you keep scrolling down? Next page. Keep going, I'll tell you when to stop. Yep, I think we may, oh no, there we go, okay. Um, it says, as it pertains to FI and as referenced above, 
Despite concerns that Canada would be targeted, and then I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but there, the assessment is there was no foreign cyber threat activity targeting Elections Canada, no instances of foreign interference in the human space, no significant indications of SI in the and GE 2019 below the with the information that was being provided to you about what happened in GE 2019? Uh, yes, uh, this this was a a report in January of, of 2020, so three months uh, after the election, um, I would have already have been briefed multiple times by the clerk and by others uh, that their conclusion was that the elections in 2019 were indeed free and fair and uh, the outcome was uh, not affected by foreign interference either overall or in uh, um, so now let's leave 2019 and move to the 2021 election. I'm going to ask you about a series of some incidents uh, or events that, about which the Commission has received information. And I'll do the first one with reference to one of the topical summaries that's been produced at the Commission by the government. So, Mr. Clerk, that's Ken Sum 4. The title of this one is a bit of a tongue twister, but Possible People's Republic of China Foreign Interference Related Mis- or Disinformation. So what we have here, if you can scroll down past the caveat page, Mr. Clerk, is a summary of uh, essentially allegations of misinformation about the Conservative Party, its leader Aaron O'Toole, um, and I think Kenny Chu is in there as well that were circulating during the 2021 election. So my question to you, Prime Minister, is, is this something that you were aware of as it was occurring in 2021? Uh, during the 2021 election, no. Shortly after the 2021 election, when the Conservative Party uh, went public with its concerns in the sort of the week that followed, I learned about it through media reports. Okay. Um, and were you aware that the Conservative Party had raised those concerns with the government as well? Not at the time, but later I would learn that through, through briefings. Okay. Months later. The next one then is... Um, can some 13, please? about both 2019 and 2021, the more germane one, maybe 2021. Can you scroll down to the uh, information page? Thank you, Mr. Clark. So what this summarizes, you'll see, is expressions of partisan preferences by certain PRC officials in Canada uh, is that there was reporting that some PRC officials expressed political preferences, which were party agnostic and opportunistic at a writing level. So then scrolling down, please, again, Mr. Clerk, in 2021, there was Canada made comments expressing a preference for a Liberal Party minority government. The rationale was they don't perceive any of the political parties as being particularly pro-China, but perceived minority governments as being more limited in terms of acting, enacting anti-China policies. So this reporting of an expressed preference by certain PRC officials for a liberal minority, was that something of which you were aware at the time? No. Um, as I said, both the 2019 and 2021 elections happened in a context of uh, significant tensions between our government and the government of the People's Republic of China, uh, particularly over the uh, illegal and arbitrary detention of two Canadian citizens, the two Michaels. Um, we were extremely active uh, both in pushing back at uh, Chinese officials uh, on this issue, uh, but also, as I said, active around the world in uh, drumming up support uh, for people for the two, uh, for different countries for the two Michaels, but also arbitrary detention 
uh, and how it shouldn't be used as a tool of uh, political uh, political. Uh, so, you know, I can. Consistently would get is that the actual no uh, it would seem very improbable uh, that itself would have a preference in an, in the election. So I take it from this that whatever intelligence reporting there was on that, it did not reach your ears. Down now, Mr. And there's also a, 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 the issue of the difference between foreign interference and um, attempts by different countries to influence behavior. Um, diplomats around the world are in their roles to try and influence uh, favorable behaviors by the countries in which they're serving towards the country they represent. That is. Um, big part of the role of, uh, of a diplomat, of a foreign official, uh, of all types. Canadians certainly uh, take, um, take an active role in furthering our interests, including uh, from time to time uh, having certain preferences around what might happen or might, might be an outcome of an election or a particular uh, domestic debate in, in a foreign country. However, um, foreign interference uh, happens when there is, and there's a full proper definition of it somewhere, but my understanding is uh, where it's um, covert, where it's uh, coercive, uh, where it is uh, using uh, pressure or, or particularly um, untoward means other than having Express. Yeah, I really hope you should sign this trade deal. Means to get them to sign said trade deal, or Matt to express a preference, political or what have you, um, is not in itself foreign interference. Uh, it may be attempts at influence. It may not be anything other than the regular concept of, of diplomacy. So it further their preference that would constitute potentially foreign interference. And, and certainly in the case of China, we have seen regularly that, that many examples of this commission that there are clear actions that would uh, amount to or, or indicate uh, a willingness to engage in foreign interference. Um, the, the next incident uh, I want to bring you to is CAN001082, Mr. Clerk. This is another briefing, Prime Minister, that was given to the cleared representative of the Liberal Party at the time. It's the 2021 election this time. Uh, you, you probably, judging from that document, can't say very much about this. But um, what I'm interested in knowing here is the timing of how this one played out, again, from your perspective. So we know that the briefing was actually on the 12th of September, I believe, not the 11th, as this document indicates. But it was given, again, to the Liberal Party representative and then to Mr. Broadhurst. And we've heard Mr. Broadhurst's evidence on it. So now we'd like yours. Um, my understanding is, which I learned uh, after the election was over was that Mr. Broadhurst made the determination that it wasn't something that he needed to bring to my attention as leader of the Liberal Party, and he did not. He did not bring it to your he attention? He did not bring it to my attention. During the election? During the election, yes. After the election? Uh, uh, more official briefings on, on this matter. Okay. He, he was he was the vehicle for officials because that's the way it would flow through as party leader in my party leader role. Um, Prime Minister, 
it was officials who would be able to brief me on this. Okay. Um, speaking of briefings, we're going to turn to that topic. You or we think you received, we do know you. Over the relevant time period. I'll start with um, February 9th, 2021. This one I don't really have a document to point you to, so I'm just going to ask you for your recollection of it. So this would be, again, February 20, February 9th, I'm sorry, 2021. Do you recall receiving a briefing on that date? Uh, yes, uh, that was uh, a briefing uh, that I got on uh, on the phone. I was not uh, not in person for that briefing. I was there via uh, teleconference on on a secure phone. And uh, yes, I got a briefing. Okay. Do you recall the content of that briefing at all? It was a, as I recall, a a, a general briefing on a number of uh, issues, including foreign interference. Okay. The next one then in time, Mr. Clerk, can you pull up CAN 0 Okay, this document, which has been talked about quite a bit in these proceedings, is briefing notes. Again, can you scroll down just so the Prime Minister can see a bit of the document and its content. So Prime Minister's briefing in the fall of 2022, October 27th. In the place where I got the briefing, so I, uh, I remember very clearly this briefing. Um, this briefing was actually uh, cases and situations to do with federal elections. Okay, so would you say that the content of this particular, these notes, these briefing notes, accurately conveys what you were told during uh, that briefing? Not particularly. Um, obviously, uh, there are elements uh, in this that are um, consistent with the briefing that was uh, on different elements of foreign interference. Uh, but when it comes to briefings, uh, and others uh, can speak to this and how they make decisions about what to read from their prepared notes, during an actual briefing uh, with, uh, with uh, ministers or, or a prime minister. Um, but it is much more of a To talk about how serious for it more that wouldn't have been something that advisors or whoever would have had to spend much time on because they would have known that we did understand how serious foreign interference is and how much we take it seriously and actually that was why we would spend more time that were really the meat of the briefing. Notes are prepared for the briefer is what actually becomes the most important thing that I certainly recall about those briefings was the various and specific cases we went through and how they are examples of concern or not concern that we then have to behave in certain ways or have follow-ups on this or that. I mean, it is much less a large theoretical briefing and much more concrete. This is a situation. And then the discussion about how we deal with this particular situation or example or another 
would be where the, the larger theoretical discussion and implications would come in, but they would be concentrated around specific uh, individuals or cases. Okay, so maybe we'll pull up now uh, Ms. Telsford's notes from that meeting. So that's CAN 009803. A little more sparse than Brian Klaus would be, but at least we have a few points here. Um, do these notes help shed any light on, on what was dealt with in that briefing for you, Prime Minister? Do these seem familiar? Um, yes, I think the, the one, two, three uh, indicates that different uh, uh, examples that we were, or the ex situations, or, or actually there are cases uh, that we were talking about, or individuals we were talking about. Um, and the bragging is not doing uh, definitely um, definitely uh, helps me recall uh, a part of the conversation where there was, and let me be careful how I say this so it's not identifiable, uh, there was a foreign government official based in Canada who was taking credit um, for a certain thing having happened in Canada um, in their reporting to a superior or to, to their home country. Uh, and just the fact that a foreign official was taking credit for having um, delivered a particular outcome in no way meant that anything that particular official did actually created the outcome. Bragging is not doing. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, wanting to write back home to say, we got the outcome we wanted, perhaps. Um, when that individual may not have had any actual bearing on the outcome of um, the particular event. Okay. I don't know if that's sufficiently clear for what it was. It, it is. And thank you. Um, the last document maybe on this point, uh, 4097. I'm sorry. No, sorry, four zero seven nine. My bad. There we go. Okay, so again, these are notes from that day. So if you can have a quick look at these, Prime Minister. the non-redacted parts of these. And what you'll see there is a text box over information that's been redacted but summarized by the commission. Does this seem familiar as information that was discussed at that meeting? During that same October, uh, October meeting? Sorry, what was that? The yes. actions on a document that I, I would never have seen. Fair enough. Okay, uh, next one then is November 30th, 2022. Can we pull up please, Mr. Clerk, can 014285. So this is a memo to you, Prime Minister, of November 30th, 2022. And Mr. Clerk, again, if you can scroll down so the Prime Minister can see the document, pass the transmittal note. It's a memorandum 
for you by the NSIA copy to the clerk claims of foreign interference in the 2019 general election for information. And the context of this prime minister is this is shortly after their, the media leaks have started about foreign interference. So a memo was written and we can again scroll through a bit to, to see the content of that memo. Could just keep going a little faster than that. I'm not really going to stop on anything. But I will ask you now that you've seen it a little bit to just scroll back up to the summary part, Mr. Clerk. Okay. What's happening here is uh, the NSIA and PC. A, that identified a single PCO in 2020, which is the one that we've seen earlier, on uh, briefing. Is that consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed on these, these issues? Um, sorry, is, is this note of uh, November 30th, 2022, was when we were uh, asking on, you know, what uh, may have happened. Uh, and uh, we were asking uh, were these things that we were flagged at that time. And yes, that's that's the single PCO information note dated to January uh, 24th, 2020. Um, and then the February 9th, 2021 briefing. So well, all I'm asking is whether that's consistent with your recollection of when you were briefed on these issues. But I, I, I wasn't, I, th th these were, uh, requests I was I was made or I made a request to our national security and intelligence advisor because there were things being alleged in the leaks that we had not been briefed on. So I'm not entirely certain about the briefing dates there uh, given because there were things, including those eleven candidates, uh, as 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 a quote uh, that we had never been briefed on until we saw. The leaks. Right. So I guess maybe this particular document I'm not asking you about, except of when you were briefed, the January 2020. January 2020. Was the memo that we looked at earlier. David Morrison memo? Right. I, I never. I got briefed on the contents, which was basically that um, foreign interference was uh, lower than expected and the elections were free and fair in 2019. Those were the, the top level conclusions that I were, was briefed on. 19 election, by the time we got around to January, um, it was good to have that report. I ended up reading the, uh, the, the Judd report, I believe, was the um, um, full assessment of the work that Site and the panel did uh, during the 2019 election, but I did not read that. Uh, I did not receive that January 24th uh, uh, note because I'd already been briefed on its entire contents. Okay. Uh, and then the February 9th, 2021, what note was that was that was the phone brief that we spoke about earlier. Yes. Right. I guess that goes back to your point about oral briefings or what really get to you, not necessarily the written ones. OK, um, can we then pull up, Mr. Clerk, can zero one seven six seven three. And, and let me just I mean, I wouldn't want to give people the impression that that um, briefings weren't something particularly uh, intelligence briefings we took very, very seriously. 
in most of these secure briefings, we would go into a, a skiff, a secure compartmentalized room. Um, told, we were told to leave our and our Fitbits, make sure we're totally secure within a fair. Often being told, no, we can't documents that are given, but we then need to return them to the uh, to the uh, uh, the officials. Um, certainly, in the beginning, uh, we were never clear on whether we could take notes on this either, because security was important for. Brian Cloud does take notes, um, but. that um, there, there was lots of written material and lots of tracking of that information as a government must and taking very seriously all these things and very careful controls. But when it came to uh, briefing and taking actions and understanding the context, it happened through uh, secure briefings and conversations that were uh, primarily um, us receiving information, us asking questions, us um, directing um, further actions or research in this area or that area that they would then take away and do. I wouldn't want anyone to think that, oh, because the briefings were primarily oral or, for example, that, uh, uh, that David Morrison memo uh, I didn't read, um, because it wasn't delivered to me, because I got the content in the fact that the election was integrity. Um, we'll just go to some other notes then. I think I believe. Me uh, too. Do you recall this? Um, my notes indicate that this was uh, immediately before question period, a briefing uh, that happened over lunch hour as I was preparing to go in to uh, deal with uh, some, some fairly um, intense uh, questioning on the issue of foreign interference given the explosive nature of the uh, media uh, stories uh, stemming from uh, unsubstantiated and uncorroborated intelligence shared by uh, a leaker. Um, so these were, you know, th these were conversations around what I could say and what, uh, uh, what uh, we, uh, we could and couldn't say uh, around, uh, around some of these allegations that were in the paper, uh, but would leave us limited on rebut, regardless of the fact that there was, uh, there were inconsistencies, there were uncorroborated information in the leaks. Uh, there were also things that were flat out wrong, but um, I was reminded of, of the the old story of uh, uh, some FBI uh, agent questioning a, a, a witness in an organized crime situation and saying, well, did you meet with that mobster in LA? The guy says, I can't comment. Did you meet with that mobster in Detroit? I can't comment. Did you meet with that lob mobster in Miami? No, I definitely did not. Um, you know, the, sometimes in denying something, you're giving information that you couldn't and, and throughout uh, my preoccupation and why these leaks um, was that we couldn't actually correct confirming the tradecraft and the work that uh, women and men in relied upon by our security agencies to keep them at risk uh, without sharing with some of the information or the methods uh, that we use uh, to keep Canadians safe. And that's part of the reason for the um, complex nature of a public of foreign interference, that if we say certain things or if we 
contradict or deny other things, we could be giving our adversaries tools uh, to actually uh, understand how we go about detecting their um, interference or, or uh, um, illicit ways of engaging to harm Canadians. It's a complex problem. Um, so the next, uh, I'm going to keep going with the briefings and the, the post-leak world briefings specifically, Prime Minister. Not long left, but uh, CAN 01800 not. So these are notes from the date on the notes is March 19th, but we know it was actually March 20th. So this is March 20th, 2023, a meeting at which you were present and I believe your staff was present and a number of senior national security uh, officials. So if we scroll down, so again, uh, content of this document or the unredacted content of what was happening at this meeting. to, uh, yeah, a little higher. PM, that's me. Uh, speaking of nominations, we were talking about, thank you for uh, uh, We were talking about the next, who the next speaker was that's redacted. Uh, but um, the emphasis on charter rights, uh, or the bringing up of charter rights and further down uh, PM, no June 2019 uh, meeting. Um, those are two examples of us uh, working constructively with um, CSIS and, and the intelligence agencies to, um, to better understand and validate certain pieces of information. Um, for example, um, in the information we were seeing, we'd seen that CSIS had a source uh, that said that uh, there was a um, June 2019 meeting that I was at um, that I can clearly and unequivocally at the time and since then confirm uh, never happened. I did not have the meeting that the source had set. Now, this doesn't mean that CSIS got it wrong. It meant that CSIS was now able to validate that what their source had said in this situation was wrong. And therefore, that puts a particular understanding or color on their ability to interpret other statements of fact or supposed fact that that source made and that's part of how intelligence work happens when when you know for sure when a source says something that you can or says something that you can then verify was wrong uh, important for us to highlight for example in that meeting that there was no uh, no meeting uh, as was described by that source uh, similarly on the question of charter rights that was a slightly different tweak where in the uh, CSIS analysis uh, the analyst had highlighted that there was uh, possible violations of people's charter rights in a particular situation. Uh, and we had asked and pressed for uh, more sort of legal or judicial analysis of that assertion within because it didn't quite ring um, true to our instincts as political actors in terms of the analysis that CSOS was making. Again, it's part of the process that one goes through as you engage with um, the experts in foreign intelligence and, and uh, security uh, in an active way to try and make sure we're understanding, getting the accurate picture and, and able to then continue to keep both Canadians and our institutions safe through the various jobs we do. Madame la Commissaire, I think I'm out of time. If you me permet une dernière question? Certainement. Parfait. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to sort of ask you. May I have a last question, Madame Commissioner? Yes. So we've heard about the 
existence of foreign interference, the pervasiveness of the threat, and various measures that, as you said, have been put in place to combat this. Um, you may know that earlier in these proceedings, we heard from a number of individuals who the being targeted by potential foreign interference in some ways. And there have been calls for the government to do more uh, than it's And in particular, I'm going to take you, I'll just read you. PRC misinformation. He said, uh, it's almost like I was the way is to let me know that I'm drowning. I don't need their notification. I need their help. Mm -hmm. So, Prime Minister, I'd like to hear the, your response to that. Actually, maybe in, in providing this response phase of the Commission's work. Um a bit of a step back uh, and the idea that you know we need to do more I agree um, when, when we took office in 2015 there was very little if any uh, mechanisms to counter foreign interference yes our intelligence agencies uh, did good work but the idea or the priority of protecting our democracy um, particularly when it comes to misinformation, disinformation, uh, active engagement uh, in various um, diaspora communities or, or uh, uh, electoral events, um, was not on the radar uh, at all uh, when we took office. Um, it hadn't been something that the previous government or any previous government had done much on at all. So we started from a standing start. Um, we created the National Security Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians. Uh, we created NSERA. Um, we moved forward to the rapid response mechanism, and we've continued uh, to do more. Yes, the panel for the 2019 and 2021 elections site, uh, but we've continued. Uh, we recently brought in a National Security Committee, National Security Council uh, of Cabinet. Uh, to address sort of strategic tools and powers and learning from uh, 2019 and 2021 that they'll be able to apply uh, in, uh, in the 2025 uh, election when it's uh, likely to come. There is always more to do, and one of the things I'm very much looking forward to um, coming from the work uh, this, uh, uh, this commission is doing is to make recommendations on how uh, we can strengthen even further the uh, protection of institutions and of our democracy. The other half is in their institutions, in their democracy. Uh, and whether it's a, a diaspora member um, worried about stepping up to running for uh, elected office in this country because they're worried about the impact that might be real or perceived from uh, a country they chose to left, leave many years ago for whatever reasons. Um, there are real concerns and feelings involved. And ultimately, democracy only works when people are confident in its ability to keep them safe, but also be the articulation of what they want for their community and their country. That's where confidence in the integrity of the elections in 2019, 2021 is so important, and something that we have emphasized throughout this process, that the every briefing I've ever got from all my intelligence and uh, security experts, thing we have seen and heard, despite, yes, attempting states to interfere. The 
feeling that individuals can have that maybe our institutions aren't so strong. Maybe they are impacted by foreign actors who wish to do ill to Canada and to Canadians. Very thoughtful about. And one of the ways ultimately safe is to make sure that citizens themselves active, critical thinkers who are empowered to see what is information, what is misinformation or disinformation and use whatever direction they want for the country. And we've seen with the intensity of misinformation and disinformation, not just from foreign actors, but just on social media generally in many pockets, that um, it's not automatic. Democracy requires constant vigilance and constant hard work. It didn't happen by accident, it doesn't continue without effort. It's not just effort of commissioners and politicians and spooks. It's efforts of every single individual to feel like they have the full ability to engage in our democratic processes and to feel that they are safe and protected as they engage, whether it's as a voter or a candidate or, or, a, or an elected member of parliament or of, of provincial parliament or, or wherever. These are together on and I, I am in constant awe across this country who continues to put up their hands for a more difficult uh, and more and more challenging discourse to say, no, I want to members of diaspora communities, but of Canadians experiences is the only way to make sure that we're actually building the kind of country we need to be. Who steps up and will continue to commit myself things of safety as we involve engage as citizens or more as our democracy um, are protected. Madame Commissaire, ce sont mes questions. Merci. I have no, no more questions. À votre connaissance, existe-t-il un mécanisme? As far as you know, do, do you have a mechanism or a procedure in place that will ensure that <laughs> The NSIA would constantly have access and receive information relating to foreign interference. And sir, the NSIA has a role of collecting and looking for all the information available in all of our security agencies, whether it's at the defense level or whether it's at foreign affairs or, 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 the, or any other security agency. That is the person who is beside me to coordinate that universe. So she has the capacity and the ability to look for those answers. For example, when I woke up this morning, I saw some reports in the media no matter the universe or the this place in the security and intelligence universe where information is available, she has access to that universe. She is the person towards which everything uh, uh, questions. So I understand that she has whether it's the agencies or the, min or the departments
and departments transmit information regarding foreign Sir, I am confident that the information that find relevant, but as we always be improved with respect to how the different departments and the different uh, levels of government work together. And the very existence of the NSIA ensures that we have a point of a connection between authority and uh, uh, gives her a capacity to collect information from everywhere. Question, when you receive in information, intelligence, that is, that may not have been corroborated as of yet, but that are likely to be very important, that could have a significant impact. Could you ask the agencies by setting up a priority list to complete or to follow through with those investigations? Answers, absolutely. And often, and in almost every situation, when I say there's a follow-up on you should follow up on this. The answer I receive is, we are doing that, and this is what we're doing. Of course, the uh, work that uh, the agencies do does not need for a minister to ask for a follow-up. They will follow up on preoccupying uh, uh, situations. Yes, a government or a prime minister can uh, highlight something, can put pressure to accelerate things or send more resources, but our systems and our agencies in the area of security have the mandates and the responsibilities to follow up on uh, preoccupying situations. Question. So we could, um, you could amend things? Answer yes. So we would have a regular reflection on our priorities with respect to security uh, for our country. We could lay more emphasis on cybersecurity, for example. When we see what the emphasis was 10 years ago, it's very different. The world is changing. The reality of our world is that uh, the balance of powers are changing. Russia has become extremely problematic, not just mildly problematic, as was the case 10 years ago. So we adjust regularly. And elected officials have an important role to play, indeed. But the work that our intelligence and security agencies play is that they work in a robust fashion in general. Question, when your campaign manager that there were allegations answer, with respect to the party, yes. I first asked, what information do we have in this regard? And I also asked if we could follow up, or at least the party should follow up with Elections Canada and identify the reports that were, see the reports that were written out. What were the conclusions? Do we have additional information? Well, the reality is that in highly contested nomination situations, there are usually uh, bust uh, voters. Sometimes that will be sp uh, the candidate. And in other situations, you would see buses that belong to a uh, an elder person's uh, center, and that will be used by one group or another. And in that case, you might not see receipts being submitted. In my own nomination contest that was in uh, March or April 2007, there were 
many bosses of Italians and Greeks because that was my reality in Papineau, my writing of Papineau. So that's a common uh, occurrence, and that would not be enough to flag any situation where anybody looking at the, con the nomination contest would say that, no, we have to follow up on that. We are not. So we're not a forensic organization. We know that we are limited in what we question. If that was to be revisited. Visit that after the elections? Answer, yes. Uh, by the party, I'm sure, yes, there were verifications made, but the verifications were comprehensive, I'm sure of that, immediately after they were notified by the site task force. I am not sure that there was extensive research that could have lasted months or weeks because we had only the information that we had and nothing more. If there were maybe an investigation by Elections Canada because of irregularities, there could have been a follow-up, but Elections Canada would be the one to speak on that. To me, the follow-up was at the level of the possible involvement of Chinese authorities here in Canada who would have actively been interested in the uh, nomination contest of a specific candidate. That is where we would have been able to do a follow-up, not necessarily to see what was the truth of what happened during the context, because it's very difficult to we have more clarity that a Chinese authority may have had for a specific candidate. Commissioner says thank you. We are supposed to take a break. A little bit, so I suggest um, I suggest a 10 minutes break, actually. So we'll come back at uh, 5, uh, 5.15. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît. The sitting of the Foreign Defense Commission is in recess until 5.15. Cette séance is at 17.15.
Your attention, please. The Foreign Interference Commission will be delayed for another 10 minutes. La Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère sera un délai de 10 minutes.
Commission is back in session. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère a repris. Cross-examination is counsel for Michael Chung. Prime Minister. Yeah. and that we went through with Mr. Broadhurst, and that's uh, CAN 5461, please. And so this is um, the document that uh, we looked at earlier. Um, I took Mr. Broadhurst through it because I wanted uh, to have his evidence about what he uh, uh, told you. Uh, and of course, the value of this document is that it sticks to the things that we can talk about in an open uh, proceeding like this. And so I just want to show you the key points. Of course, the first one is that there were allegations of foreign interference by China in the Don Valley North nomination contest. And then secondly, if you just scroll down a little bit, please. This is the redacted bit. Thank you. That, oh, sorry. There we are. Um, the summary of the redaction is buses being used to bring international students to the nomination process in support of Han Don. And I just want to begin by noting that there's nothing language the students were speaking. They're described as international. Noting that is that in your uh, evidence earlier and also um, you referred to uh, people on the bus, the students at points of Chinese speakers. Uh, do you recall that? I can take you to the passages yeah. if you like. No, no. Uh, I, I, no, I, I appreciate that. One of the challenges that I have is uh, remembering what I knew at a particular years later, I would find out more information about this means that I'm never a thousand percent precise on what it is that I knew at a particular moment. Yes, I do appreciate that. I do remember at one point uh, when we were talking about whether or not um, CSIS uh, understood how nomination races worked and how community organizations would regularly bring buses. Um, there was a quote, or there was someone relayed to me that one of CSIS's concerns was there were bus filled with Chinese speakers showing up at the nomination. And my response, as I sort of alluded to in my previous testimony, was, well, I had buses filled with Greek speakers and Italian speakers, because in my nomination in Papineau, those were the communities that were mobilized. Um, that phrase stuck in in my head, but I will admit that I do not specifically remember whether or not the Chinese speakers or Mandarin speakers report briefing that briefing on, on this particular Sunday during the campaign or not. Yes. But it certainly is consistent with this. All right. No, that's very helpful. And I will add seven on this. Paragraph 30 which is, oh, sorry, start. Right, thank you. Um, and so the last sentence uh, is the concern was that buses of Chinese speakers had arrived at the nomination or possibly been brought into the nomination. And then if we go to paragraph 30 and just over the page, the top, of the next page, a little further. There we are. Uh, Prime Minister, you see the last sentence. The central issue of concern was that buses filled with Chinese speakers could have been international students directed by the PRC. So the point that I want to make with you, Prime Minister, and it sounds to me like perhaps you've already got it, is that the, the central concern 
of the service here, as I understand it, is not that they were Chinese speakers. No. It's that they were directed by the PRC. Had these people been uh, students from Switzerland rather than uh, China, but were brought at the behest of China and to do China's bidding, I say the services concerns would have been absolutely the same, which is yes. that this would be foreign interference. Yes, entirely. It right. is not the, the nature of that. It, that is part of what I remember as context around the services concerns that China might have mobilized individuals. Yes. Thank you. And, and I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that. And I'll tell you why. And it's because, uh, as you'll recall, there have been times where you have uh, let us say, cautioned us all as the news about the allegations in Don Valley North came out. And as I have, uh, as I say, let, let us say, cautioned Canadians not to uh, fall into anti-Chinese or anti-Asian. What I want to press on you here is that the ethnicity or the language of these students has never been the issue either for the service or for any right-thinking Canadian. The concern instead is that PRC was directing people, whoever they were, to go do their bidding and to help Han Dong is into his seat in Parliament. And, and you can have that concern and worry about that and worry about the consequences for our democracy without having an ounce of racial Uh, that I made in response to them uh, saying, or the suggestion that, oh, the, the concern is the bus filled with Chinese speakers. I say, that has absolutely no bearing on anything. And I want to be clear, though, I, I hope it is your evidence uh, that you did not feel that uh, the service itself was acting in some racially prejudiced way. No, my concern was more that perhaps the service didn't understand uh, as deeply as uh, political uh, actors do, uh, the prevalence of busing of different community groups in nomination campaigns. Right, and let's come to that point as well. If we could go to WIT 66, please. That's your other statement. Paragraph 24, please. Thank you, and actually it's at the uh, top of page seven, so keep scrolling a little. Yes, stop there. In the middle of the page, Prime Minister, the fact that there were buses of Chinese-speaking people at the nomination meeting did not necessarily corroborate the allegation that the PCR PRC was responsible. And in fact, I should have read you the sentence before as well. He, meaning you, Prime Minister, also remembered that the intelligence was only an allegation, included no evidence that the people being busted the polls were supported by PRC officials, right? And, and you go on to say, uh, Prime Minister, that you remembered asking uh, whether uh, the service understood uh, that busing is part of the nomination process. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, going back to the reporting I just showed you, there's obviously a reference to busing there. But what I want to suggest to you is that the emphasis, again, wasn't on the mode of travel for these people. Uh, they took buses this time, all right. They could have come some other way, and it wouldn't terribly matter for the services perspective because their concern was that they were directed by PRC and assisted in getting to the nomination place in order to allegedly help one candidate over another. So it, uh, the, the, the way they got there doesn't matter one way or another. I understand your point that you wanted to make sure that CSIS understood that buses per se are not a problem. But uh, my uh, proposition to you, sir, is that when you read that statement, the, the emphasis is on direction by China. Yes, they got there by buses. That's the allegation. They could have got there by tricycles. It doesn't terribly matter. The point is they were directed by China. I would suggest that it might be more difficult for a foreign actor to organize fleets of individuals showing up on tricycles uh, rather than filling CSIS would still be concerned, and rightly so. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Um, I would like to uh, take you to the David Johnson report for a moment now. That's at COM 
104. And if you'll go to page 23. Now, I forgot that this is in two columns. So I'm not sure where I'm going to find my quote. Let me read it to you. I don't think it's controversial. You may recall that Mr. Johnson, and I hope we can find it in here somewhere, but Mr. Johnson concluded in respect of the Don Valley North allegations, he said that the irregularities were tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto. Do you recall that, sir? I can try to find it for you if you don't. Yes, there it is. Irregularities were observed. Yes, and then I, there we are. And there is, thank you very much, Prime Minister. And there is a well-grounded suspicion that the irregularities were tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto. That's what I wanted to ask you about. Now, I fully appreciate, sir, that that was not a conclusion you were able to make or prepared to make in September 2019. Uh, but my question for you is today, now that we've had Mr. Johnson's report and he's come to that conclusion, do you accept first that there were irregularities in that nomination contest and secondly that they were likely tied to the PRC consulate in Toronto? I'd suggest that um, irregularities being observed is not itself uh, enough to overturn a democratic event. Um, that a well-grounded suspicion uh, is certainly warranting more, uh, but also might not necessarily very high threshold for a democratic event. Yes, but I don't think that's what Mr. Johnson is speaking to. He's just saying that there is a well-grounded suspicion that the irregularities, which he seems to have found, uh, were tied to the consulate. And what I want to know is, do you accept those conclusions today? Yeah, yeah sorry, if you're not asking me about how, how I, I accept that there is a suspicion that um, PRC officials in Canada uh, were engaged in um, in some way with that nomination. Uh, I, don't, I can't speak to irregularities. Perhaps, perhaps you know what irregularities specifically Mr. Johnson was talking about? Um, no, not as well as some people in this room. Um, all right. Well, you, you do accept, though, and, and you say that there's a suspicion. Do you accept that it's well-grounded? That was Mr. Johnson's view. I, I, can't, I can't speak to analysis made by others. I certainly, uh, and again, distinguishing what I knew in 2019 from what I may have uh, learnt later uh, leaves me in an awkward position around answering this. All right, I'll move to my uh, next document, and that is CAN 15842, please. And you've seen this already, it is the October, late October 2022 briefing. You've already given the document. Scrolling down a little further, there we are, thank you. Um, my question for you is, did the director say words to the effect of, or convey the message that, as you see here, Canada has been slower than our five eyes allies to respond to the foreign interference threat? Uh, no. All right, and if you continue on in that same passage, such as proactively publicizing successful disruption activities, was that something that the director conveyed to you? Uh, no, when I spoke, briefing notes prepared for the director didn't particularly align with the actual briefing we got. Yes. Um, the briefing was spent almost entirely on specific cases, and all of the 
these notes prepared for the, the, the director. I'm generally saying, yes, foreign interference is serious. India, China, serious, would have taken up the first he would have gotten right into the cases. So this is not... Uh, I'm just going to show you one more point from this. I do have your point. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, it's the uh, bullet point. ...are able to conduct foreign interference successfully in Canada because there are no consequences, either legal or political. Foreign interference is therefore a low risk and high reward endeavor. Did the director convey in those words or in some similar words that message that this is uh, an, uh, a low risk, high reward endeavor because there are no consequences? Uh, uh, no. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. Council for Jenny Kwan. Prime Minister, good afternoon. Um, so, Prime Minister, it's a matter of public record uh, that MP Kwan has alleged that she uh, may have been the target of foreign interference by the Communist Party of China in the 2021 general election. And so, based on that premise, uh, there's uh, time permitting, there's three sets of. The first is uh, how MP Kwan. Thesis that she was a, a target for foreign interference. Uh, the second is uh, why she might be a target. And, and the third is how uh, foreign interference might be occurring against her in Canada. So, uh, so you're aware, Prime Minister, that uh, MP Kwan received a confidential briefing from CSIS uh, on uh, May 26, 2023. Yes. Uh, and you're aware that she's not shared publicly any of the class of information she received uh, in that briefing. Uh, I, I believe that to be correct, yes. But, but you're aware she stated that she was told that she is an evergreen target for the Communist Party of China and for the rest of her life, even after she leaves politics. I can't speak to directly what she was told, but that seems... Uh, seems consistent with what uh, what they might have told her. Yes. So, so Prime Minister, are, are you able in this setting uh, to um, share with us whether you had any role in the decision to brief MP Kwan about foreign interference? Um, when there were, when there are. Um, allegations or information brought to me regarding a particular member of parliament or a particular individual, often one of our uh, first uh, responses in my office, my response, is to uh, ask uh, CSIS or the security agency involved to engage directly with the individual. Um, the nature of that engagement do that. Sometimes us encouraging it allows uh, But I believe in this case, uh, we encouraged uh, those briefings to happen. And so you, you encourage them to happen. And um, if you're able to comment, uh, was one of the reasons why thing to happen was to enable uh, MP Kwan to herself identify foreign interference that might be occurring and to take steps, if she could, to counter foreign interference? Um, the challenge of foreign interference exists for, as we've heard, um, for just about every elected official at every different uh, order of government government as a potential threat. But we also know that diaspora communities, particularly uh, from uh, certain countries of origin, are more, uh, more susceptible to be targets on that. So um, 
whether it's uh, defensive briefings or, or threat reduction measures, which are two, uh, two different approaches that CSIS and others can use in terms of briefing. Um, it is, they are designed to both inform, make aware, and hopefully help uh, the individual in avoiding Sir. And so, so one, so one goal is to help individuals avoid foreign interference if it's occurring. So a self-help remedy, if we could, urge an individual to come forth with concerns. So the RCMP or the Commissioner of Canada. And, and, and so the, and of course, for, for anyone to come forward, a member of parliament or any Canadian who might be targeted for foreign interference, the, the, the expectation would be that if they presented such a complaint or a concern that it would be investigated thoroughly. Um, that it would be given the attention that it merits, yes. Okay. And so, and ask, dig, dig in a bit to why MP Kwan might have been targeted and, and what your thoughts are. So you're aware that MP Kwan has testified here that she's, she believes she's been targeted for foreign interference uh, because of her outspoken criticism over many years of the human rights record of the People's Republic of China. Are you, are you aware of that? Uh, yes. Yeah, and so she's, you know, you're aware of her criticisms of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Yes. And the Hong Kong national security law. Yes, like many, many Canadians of all different origins, but particularly progressive Canadians uh, of Chinese origin, um, there, are, there are some very, very um, strong and outspoken and uh, brave individuals who speak up against the, uh, the government of their country of origin. And, and she made some of those criticisms as a parliamentarian mm -hmm. uh, on the floor of the House of Commons. Yes. So, for example, when she spoke in favor of and voted in favor of the resolution on the Uyghur genocide. And so, and so it's clear then that in, in making these criticisms and that she was exercising her parliamentary And no Canadian... And I'd also say more, she yeah. was... Uh, fulfilling her responsibilities as a member of parliament to represent uh, her constituents and her community in, uh, in our parliament. Agreed. And, and, and that no Canadian, uh, MP or not, should be subject to foreign interference for expressing their political views. Indeed, yes. So, so, so I, I want to then take you uh, then, if, if I may, Prime Minister, to how foreign interference by, this, by the CCP might be occurring in Canada. Uh, and so we've had testimony interference activities occur through the United Front. Communist Party, you're, you're aware of that. Uh, not exclusively. Right, not ex but but including through the the United Front. Yes, there are there are many different ways, uh, and uh, the United Front is one of the ways in which, uh, in which uh, the Communist Party of China exerts either influence or perhaps in other cases. Are you able to comment on the other ways. Are a perfect example of of something. That has been in the news uh, recently that our friend from the block asked about earlier today. Good. And, and of course, and they often, the United Front often operates through proxies, we've learned. Uh, you agree that that's correct? Yes. And, and I think the words you used to describe foreign interference in your examination in chief were covert, uh, coercive, uh, might funnel funds to Chinese proxies in Canada? Um, I, am, I, I, am, I am wary of getting into too much of uh, what I know in an open forum here, but um, I think there's been evidence uh, submitted along the lines of that. Okay, and, 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 and so and it has confirmed that the United Front uses proxies to
encourage you to go directly to the source uh, of, of these reports and allegations. I can say that, yes, I am kept very, very highly briefed on various ways of interference. I'm not always sure which ones I can talk about that talking about public record things, and it's good that you're putting of course, part of the, some of the rituals of Canadian political life involve attending events hosted by different ethnic communities that are potentially quite significant. So Vasaki would be one I'm sure that you might be familiar with. Yes. And so there is a certain significance then to having been invited for many years to an event and then suddenly disinvited in a public way. That would be designed to send a message. Wouldn't you agree? Um, I think publicly disinviting someone uh, as um, as as wrong as it would be um, might fall into the category of influence rather than interference. If a, a diplomat is hosting a, 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 a an event. Uh, that the Chinese government is behind or through with proxies, um, it's a fairly open and visible way and perhaps meant to be open and visible to exclude an individual. Uh, that unfortunate or much as we might disagree with it, it sounds like surreptitious, uh, but more here, but I, I understand your point that, that it is unfortunate that China uh, in general tries to uh, silence critics of its regime, including uh, you know, high-profile uh, members of parliament. Okay, so a, a couple of concluding questions, if I may, Prime Minister. So the, the, the GAC panel testified that if the People's Republic of China, or for that matter, matter any other uh, foreign state, were engaged in foreign interference in Canada, it would violate international law. Um, do you have any reason to disagree? I, I am, yes, the um, foreign interference is, is violation of Canadian law and international law. And, and you'd agree then it's a violation of Canadian sovereignty? Yes. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jarman? Representing a Renault tool. Thank you, Prime Minister. Or thank you, Commissioner. Prime Minister, my name is Tom Jarman. I represent Aaron O'Toole. Uh, just building on a question that my uh, colleague was asking, uh, Mr. O'Toole, similar to Ms. Kwan, has also received a defensive briefing from CSIS. Um, and was that done uh, with the permission or direction of your office? Um, again, it is not something that uh, CSIS needs to get permission from uh, the Prime Minister's office to do. Uh, but in this case, we certainly uh, uh, encouraged it. Yeah. He's come under this sort of... Uh, they should be made aware of that? Uh, that is in, in general. Your office given direction to that effect? Um, threat reduction or defensive briefings it gives or doesn't give, uh, but certainly our posture has been one of uh, encouraging uh, CSIS to keep all parliamentarians uh, informed and, and aware of uh, not just threats against them, but of, of issues of foreign interference. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess if I could go to CAN 4495. And uh, this is a document that's supposed to be sometime in late February of 2023. It was prepared by CSIS. Um, Commission Council has shown it to you, and uh, I believe you also saw it during your witness interview. 
If you could scroll down to the third page. <clears throat> uh, a little further, please. Thank you very much. Oops, back up, please. Thank you. Um, so I understand from your witness uh, interview that you were not uh, advised of this, these events concurrent to them happening in the election in 2021. Um, but I would ask, after February 21st of 2023, have you ever been briefed by either CSIS or the NSIA with respect to conclusions similar to this that observed, there were observed online and media activities aimed at discouraging Canadians, particularly Chinese heritage, from supporting the Conservative Party of Canada leader Aaron O'Toole, and particularly Stevenson, Richmond East, Kenny Chu. The timing of the efforts uh, to align with conservative polling improvements, similarities in language with articles published by agreements between these Canada-based outlets and PRC entities. I believe I think it's, it's what, 66. Um, not the interview summaries, the, uh, the uh, prepared summaries. Redactors. Madam Commissioner, I think the Prime Minister is referring to the multi-source topical summary. That one. On. Oh. Topical summaries, yes. She or she. I believe it's number four, if that assists, sum.4. We just scroll yes, down. I have page. that one. Yeah. Yes, thank you. That's it. So that's a topical summary, but I, going back to my question, which was, has any official, either the NSIA or the director of CSIS, or anyone on your staff briefed you with respect to the conclusions that were in CAN 4495. And just to be fair to the witness, uh, perhaps he could be allowed to look at those conclusions one by one rather than sure. in a mass. Well, possibly you can go back to CAN 4495 then. Please. Yes, I have, I have the summary, so if we can go back on the page to the document you brought Thank up. You. Scroll down, thank you. Further. Overall statement is observed online and media activities. Yeah, what I will what it would go to is the bottom of that, uh, the last line in the second paragraph there, uh, and refer to the um, general summary there, point six, that says, no PRC state direction of the incident was detected or reported. Yes, I realize that's what that document says. My question is, what, did anyone brief you with respect to those allegations that are in CAN 4495? And um, your answer is no, that's fine. First of all, these are uh, briefing notes that I never saw. These are briefings for a briefer who then uh, gave a briefing that, as we've seen, may or may not have included yes. all of these things. I am and was, however, aware of the elements in the summary uh, that talked about uh, whether it's uh, following the publication of the article in the Hill Times, uh, there was uh, a number of different um, media organizations that picked up and and uh, and ran with those things. Uh, but again, getting to the bottom line that no you know, Chinese state direction of the incident was okay. detected or reported. Thank you. And I'd like to turn now to COM008, which is the, the cabinet directive 
from 2021 with respect to um, their critical election incident public protocol. And this is the standing directive right now. It is unlike 2019, it, this is an ongoing thing. Is that correct? Uh, yes, this is the existing directive. Intervention by the panel of five would either be high used, observe with certainty, uh, and Mr. Blanc used the high threshold as well. Is that consistent with your understanding of how the directive is meant to apply? The directive is meant to apply uh, and the panel is meant to kick in when there are threats uh, to Canada being able to hold a free and fair election. Um, threshold, uh, because just the act of uh, engaging for the panel uh, could itself have um, an impact on the um, unfolding of the election. So the um, expertise uh, and the um, experience uh, and the professional judgment of the people on the panel is what we lean on significantly for uh, whether and how uh, they intervene. I will highlight that not every intervention by the P5 would be uh, to convene a supper hour press conference to tell Canadians about something in the middle of an election campaign. It could involve, as it has, apprising different parties of concerns. It could be involve uh, asking uh, or working with a social media giant to take down a particular piece of misinformation. Like there are different things that are to do to ensure that the election remains free and fair for Canadians. Possibly, can we scroll down uh, in the directive itself, please? And into five, there we are, the process. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I have to go back up again. So they say, uh, paragraph three, please. You say, Minister, or Prime Minister, rather, that it's, this can be engaged by threats. The panel of five has testified that it must be an event, be in fair election, at which they would give no... Is it your evidence that the panel can act on... I ask actually to scroll down to... Go to 4.0 or, f no, next one, 5.0. Uh, there we go. Lays out a process through which can threatens Canada's ability to have a free and fair election should notification be necessary. I suppose an incident could be an event, uh, but I think if there is an imminent threat um, to Canada's ability to have free and fair election, I have no doubt that uh, the panel would engage with that, whether or not the incident or event had happened or was just imminently about to happen. And just one last question, please, Commissioner. And that threat sure. could crystallize at the general election level, at the riding level, or indeed among a diaspora community level that's spread out over across several ridings. Sorry, and what's your question? That threat could crystallize could, yes. at either the general election level, an individual riding level, or among a, a broader community that's spread out over several ridings. Uh, yes, as long as it threatens Canada's ability to have a free and fair election, uh, either at the riding level or in the aggregate uh, general election, which is just the sum of 338 individual riding elections. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Thank you, Tom. Acting on behalf of the Conservative Party. Good evening, Mr. Prime Minister. Could I have, just give me a moment, could I have uh, TRN uh, 6 called up, please? And while that's being called up, 
Mr. Prime Minister, in preparation for your testimony here today, have you been aware that that he spoke to PRC officials on multiple occasions about the two Michaels while they were held in captivity in China? Um, I believe so, yes. Okay. And am I correct that the two Michaels had been taken into custody and detained uh, in China commencing in December 2018 until they were released at the end of uh, September 2021? Yes. Okay. Would you agree with me that the detention of the two Michaels was a very high profile and very sensitive matter, both in Canada and abroad? It was certainly very high profile, uh, and it was uh, a detention that uh, caused us to mobilize broadly. It was certainly a very difficult experience for the two Michaels and their families, but it was also something that uh, mobilized an awful lot of uh, of not just Canadians, but our partners around the world. Thank you. We've heard evidence uh, and seen evidence in this inquiry that, that at least one of the general counsel, counsel general in I have a couple of questions for you uh, regarding happy to hear from him about that. I, I would urge him to refer to the summary, the topical summary on this issue. I'm, I'm going to come to the topical summary, but if I could ask the Prime Minister generally, uh, Mr. Dong had been having conversations with the PRC. I can't recall offhand at what point that was. Do you remember what year, sir? Um, perhaps there's documents that refer to the meeting that I can talk about publicly, uh, the various briefings that I've had when, when these allegations came out. I believe, actually, I believe they... This was the source, this was uh, a matter disclosed in the leaks in uh, the fall of 2022, uh, and it was only subsequent to those leaks that I became aware of those conversations. So it would have been uh, late in 2022. You don't believe you were made aware of any such conversations prior to that? No. Okay. And uh, could I ask that can some uh, two be called up, please? And I believe uh, Ms. Chowdhury uh, took you through this document to some extent earlier. This is a summary of intelligence held by CSIS uh, and the intelligence agencies relating to Handong and its communications with the People's Republic of China. Uh, relating to the two Michaels, and uh, I take it from your answers earlier, you, received, you reviewed this document in preparation for your testimony. Uh, there's a summary of five points. Can you confirm, and I, th I think you may have, that in preparation for today, uh, you have received I have six points on mine. I, I may have misspoken. You're correct, quite correct. Six points. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Can I turn Perhaps you can review that. And while you are, this, the second sentence says the PRC released the two Michaels at that moment, but opposition parties would view the PRC's Canadian pro approach to the PRC. See that? Yes. When were you first made aware of MP Dong expressing this view? As I said, this was subsequent to leaks. But let me also just say that um, 
it's aware of information alleging that MP Dong expressed this view. As has been uh, previously stated, there, there have been uh, significant questions around both translation and summary of uh, the actual uh, exchange uh, that, you know, I, I don't think I need to read the, the first page filled with caveats around incomplete, single-sourced, uh, varying degrees of reliability, you know, not necessarily uh, indicating corroboration uh, or reliability of sources. So there's a lot of uncertainty around even the things that we're saying in the summary, that we're seeing in the summaries. Can I ask you, Prime Minister, have you personally reviewed that summary? This summary? No, the, the summary. Um, Madam Commissioner, I'm concerned that we're I'm not yeah. sure. I, I can say yes to that, though. Yes, I have personally done that. Um, but there's not much more I can say about it. That's fine. Thank you. Can we call up uh, COM uh, 118, which is the Special Rapporte Rapporteur's first, first report that was uh, produced or dated May 23, 2023? COM 118? Yes. Just a minute. And if we, I'd like to go to page 26, small Roman numeral eight. There's an analysis of a, of a piece of reporting uh, that Han Dong advised the PRC consulate to extend the detention of the two Michaels, Global News, March 22, 2023. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and immediately below that, uh, Mr. Johnston comments on how there, there has been considerable media, media attention about an alleged transcript of this conversation. You see that? Yes. And he then says, I have reviewed the same intelligence report that was provided to the Prime Minister relating to this allegation, which I am advised is the only intelligence that speaks to this issue. I can report the following, and we're going to come to the following. My, my question now, though, is... Mr. Johnson tells us that he reviewed the same intelligence report that you did and that this is the only report that exists that speaks to this issue. So my question for you is the following. Is the intelligence report that Mr. Johnson is referring to that we just looked at or is it something else? I'm not sure the witness can answer that in this setting. Okay. And are, are there other for now, we'll go with written reports, uh, either hard copy or electronic, that you're aware of that perhaps n were not shared with Mr. Johnson that might relate to precisely what was or wasn't said uh, the PRC official? I'm not certain I can answer that question. For the same reasons? Uh, for reasons of, of security and, and confidentiality. Thank you. National security. Thank you. Have those reports, uh, if there are any such reports, have they been provided to the present commission? I, I again, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I, I cannot confirm or infirm um, the existence of, of any other reports that I cannot speak to here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson then gives his assessment of that particular allegation as follows. He says, the allegation is false. Mr. Dong discussed the two Michaels with a PRC official, but did end their detention. The allegation that he did make that suggestion has had a very adverse effect. Do you agree with that assessment, sir? Um, yes, we know that the media reports um, and the allegations made in uh, rather a spectacular fashion about Mr. Dong uh, were false. Okay, uh, but would you agree with... As to what he said or didn't say about, uh, about the two Michaels. Okay, would you agree with me, sir, that all that Mr. Johnson was commenting on was, was what is contained in that heading, that particular allegation? 
Mr. Johnson didn't comment one way or the other about whether uh, what else Mr. Dong might have said to the PRC Council read the two in Can Sumo 2, the the differently. I'm not sure the witness can comment on what Mr. Johnson was or was not commenting on. Mr. Prime Minister, I have very many more questions, as you might imagine, but I simply don't have the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. De Luca. Council for Andang. Thank you, Commissioner. Prime Minister, I'm Mark Polly, and as you heard, I represent Handong. I'm gonna start with uh, the same issue that Mr. DeLuca finished with, and that is the allegations that were made in the newspaper, in uh, Global, at least, uh, relating to the two Michaels. And we, as you know, we heard yesterday from Mr. Klo, among others, and Mr. Klo told us about how after the leaks came out, there were discussions about what to do, what to, how to respond, whether there could be any response. And uh, in particular, he said, there were a number of discussions about how to get the truth out that the story was wrong. And uh, he explained that up until yesterday, he was not able to say that publicly. Are you able to, to um, first of all, tell us, did you have conversations like that as well about whether there was anything the government could do, whether you, anything you could do? Well, further, what we actually a rapporteur uh, who had the opportunity to uh, quite categorically that the allegations the special rapporteur uh, those uh, allegations as false was perhaps uh, more reassuring to concerned Canadians than uh, having um, official party as Mr. Tong uh, category. category. Does that, uh, well, aside from Mr. Klo have discussions about whether there was anything that could be released before that, like immediately to respond? Um, there, were, there were many discussions uh, following the leaks on this issue, but on uh, a number of the issues that were uh, leaking as uh, we highlighted and attempted to highlight a few times in the media there were uh, clear falsehoods uh, and inaccuracies in the media reporting, but uh, the challenge of protecting uh, national security meant that we were very much limited in our ability to um, contradict um, the um, the uh, false allegations being made by uh, the leaker. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that difficulty you're describing, although we've heard, as I say, Mr. Klo talk about finally being able to say something publicly yesterday, but I take it that same tension continues that you're able to say. But you know, given, as, as uh, Mr. Cloud pointed out yesterday, we are now in a position to, um, to express uh, and to repeat that the way it was characterized in the, um, in the media. So let me... The ongoing discussion about buses. Uh, we heard about you being briefed by Mr. Broadhurst in September of 2019, and you talked about him flagging concerns and describing this scenario of students uh, being brought to Don Valley North nomination meeting. And uh, you, you asked whether the intelligence agency 
understood this thing that busing people to nomination meetings is uh, standard, or I think you said regular earlier. Is that right? Yes. And it will be your last question. Thank you. Uh, and you. Sorry, let me make sure. And you raised the issue of whether the intelligence agency understood uh, this, this basic issue that someone like you who knows politics and nomination campaigns knows. And did you figure out an answer to that, whether the people at the agency who were reporting this had that context? Oh, certainly. Listen, our, our intelligence agencies, even though they don't organize uh, nomination meetings themselves, as you know, political parties do, uh, you know, regularly turn to experts and uh, you know, learn about the things that they uh, don't know about when they need to. Uh, so I am very confident that our intelligence agencies uh, now know a lot more about the unfolding of nominations, uh, which is important because they need to be able to ensure that those nominations, uh, like all electoral events, um, you know, by the residents and indeed by uh, are free and fair and uh, absent interference uh, by uh, foreign actors. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Human Rights Coalition. Uh, my name is Sarah Teach, and as the Commissioner stated, I'm representing the Human Rights Coalition. Uh, I understand, Mr. Prime Minister, that you have a lot of confidence in your NSIA's ability to receive information from the national security agencies. But I want to ask about your level of confidence in the agency's abilities to receive information from those most vulnerable, namely uh, members of targeted diaspora communities. So let me just start with this. Uh, were you aware, Mr. Prime Minister, that the RCMP's National Security Information Network is only available in English and French? I was not. Were you aware that the uh, CSE's online reporting tool, as well as CSIS's reporting tool, and the OCCE's complaints form on the website are also available in only English and French? But I am also aware that all those agencies use uh, in language language um, individuals uh, who are able to uh, read. I take your word for it that uh, the online forms are only in English and French. I appreciate that. And we also heard on uh, March 27th with the diaspora panel, that was the first day of these hearings, that community members oftentimes don't feel uh, empowered to reach out to the agencies. They feel that they won't be heard. They feel it's a waste of time for whatever reason. How can you expect the agencies themselves to really know, and therefore, how can you expect the NSAA to know of diaspora community members is happening, including in the context of elections? This is certainly a challenge, and it is something that we've been working on over the past years to try and uh, improve and increase the not just the diversity within our various agencies, uh, but also uh, the ability of who are often most vulnerable to interference, uh, particularly in diaspora communities, but also at the same time, um, often with good reason, most suspicious of uh, authorities and uh, enforcement agencies that, uh, uh, that have not always treated them fairly in the past. Thank you. Um, given these limitations, does this plant even a seed of doubt in your mind in terms of the integrity of the 2019 and 2021 general elections? Um, I think those are two different things. Uh, the challenge of um, the challenge of any democracy is ensuring that, that people who perhaps disagree with the outcome of a given election still have faith that that is indeed the will of the people, the will of citizens. Uh, and that's where having uh, a panel in place 
both in 2019 and 2021 that could uh, say that uh, action was free and fair is uh, a really important expand it and become more, um, perhaps more <clears throat> sensitive uh, or alert to um, various vulnerabilities that um, are more difficult to go into, particularly. So um, there is more to do, but I do have confidence in the ability of our uh, intelligence agencies and our panel um, to have drawn the conclusion that the uh, elections in 2019 and in 2021 were indeed free and fair. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Dudi for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. For, uh, yes. No, it's the Sikh coalition, I'm sorry. You'll be next. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> Mr. Trudeau, my name is Prabhjot Singh. I'm appearing on behalf of the Sikh coalition. Um, so I don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to start by asking uh, whether you would agree that your government missed key opportunities to hold India to account for its interference in Canada, and, and to be more specific, um, so we can narrow down a concise answer, that there were attempts made by the government to minimize the threat. Assessment? No. By five? five. By your government um, in the hopes of creating some oversight and transparency on security and intelligence issues. Uh, Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 73 of the PDF. So as you know, this report uh, deals with uh, concerns about foreign interference. Is that 73 of the PDF? Or yeah, 55 of the actual document. And so this is a, a section that deals with foreign interference specifically. And if we can continue to scroll down until 79, please. You can go a little bit faster. And so right there, if you can hold for a second, if you scroll up, please. So there is mention specifically of, of foreign interference by the People's Republic of China and continue scrolling. There's mention of the Russian Federation and if we can pause right there, and it specifically says other states engaged in foreign interference. And if you continue scrolling, that entire section has been redacted. Mm -hmm. and Mr. Operator, if we can go to page 108 of the PDF. And if you continue scrolling until 1.13, you see it, it, these are instances of Canada's response to foreign interference in the relation to China. Of uh, a response to Russian interference. And if we scroll down, uh, is redacted. So Mr. Trudeau, I'm going to of this report outline details of Indian electoral interference as well as outlining governmental fail so, and so I, I yes, so I understand that you may not be able to uh, address this in a public setting for national security reasons and if that's the case you can indicate that to, to the commissioner um, so can you confirm that that is the substance that's been redacted in this report um, obviously in a public setting I can't speak to redactions made for national security but I I will say that the principle anywhere in the world uh, has all the rights of a Canadian uh, to be free from 
uh, extortion, coercion, um, interference uh, from a country that they left behind. Uh, and how we have stood up for Canadians, including uh, in the very serious uh, case that I brought forward to Parliament of the killing of, uh, of Nijar, um, demonstrates our government's commitment to uh, defending the rights and freedoms of Canadians for whom, uh, if, which are the reasons for which so many people uh, crossed oceans and continents uh, to come live in this country and build this country. And the suggestion that we can to defend Canadian rules and values and defend Canadians from foreign interference is uh, simply But I do want to confirm that it was you that approved the redactions in this report. Is that correct? Redact based, on, based on suggestions uh, from public servants that you received. Redactions are made uh, by professional public servants uh, and uh, we sign off on them, but we do not modify them. Uh, you do have the possibility to push back against excessive made by professional public servants, not by the political wing. And, and does the Prime Minister have the authority to push back on the suggestions that are made in cases where there may be excessive redactions? That gets into the entire question of uh, declassification of information and in the American system, uh, the uh, in ways that uh, are not replicated in our system here in Canada. So just very simply, I have one last question I want to ask after this. Does the Prime Minister have the authority and the ability to push back against those suggestions when there's excessive redaction? The Prime Minister uh, has an uh, ability to engage in discussions uh, and uh, ask for reasons. But like I said, as, uh, as Prime Minister and as uh, a government, our uh, habit and our uh, approach has always been uh, to allow the professional public service to make determinations around what needs to be react redacted in the name of national security and confidentiality. Uh, Madam Commissioner, I have one final question, if that's okay. Uh, very quick. Sure. I, I think you would agree that the lack of meaningful steps to expose and stop foreign interference activities when they first arise, uh, including deliberate actions to redact any failures that may have been included in the NSI COP report, uh, could play a role in India's increasingly aggressive interference and repressive, uh, repression activities over this period. Uh, effectively and failing to bring the threat of Indian foreign interference uh, to the Canadians' attention earlier. Is that correct? I think that's certainly a question one needs to ask of the previous Conservative government that was uh, known for its very cosy relationship with the uh, current Indian government, uh, whereas our government has always stood up to defend the minorities in Canada and the rights uh, of minorities to speak out, even if it uh, irritates uh, their home countries overseas. Thank you. Those are all Thank my you. questions. So, Mr. Dudi, it's your turn. Good evening, Prime Minister. Uh, it's John Dudi. I'm counsel for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Uh, we've heard uh, that Russia's foreign interference activities in foreign elections was the catalyst for the plan to protect Canada's democracy, and that Russia was a foreign nation that the Canadian government was concerned could potentially interfere in Canadian elections, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've also heard from the site task force and the panel of five that neither identified any foreign interference activity by Russia in either the 2019 or the 21 general election. It would seem possible that Russia was not interested in interfering with Canadian elections in those years, or equally possible that they did and the Canadian government failed to detect it. Would you agree that it's possible that Russia interfered in one or both the elections and the Canadian government simply failed to notice it? I would highlight that, of course, um, it is always possible that the 
entire body of our national security intelligence agencies are um, very sophisticated cyber uh, uh, and security uh, communications established absolutely nothing um, or that um, would be very wary about saying that, oh, you know, despite the fact you didn't find any evidence of it, it still might have happened. I think we have seen the extent to which Russia is engaged in misinformation, disinformation, and actions of, of, uh, of sowing chaos and destabilizing democracies around the world, including uh, attempts at cyber uh, attacks and, and successful cyber attacks in Canada. Um, but I think one of the big differences between Russia and a number of other hostile or challenging state of um, a, a critical mass of either uh, Russian diaspora or um, Russian speakers in Canada, as you contrast with the situation in Ukraine or in Latvia or elsewhere, where uh, there is a, a, an easier threshold for them to interfere in uh, democratic processes. You spoke about the need for Canadians to be confident that the government is doing what it can to keep Canadians safe. How confident are you that Russia did not interfere with either election? Um, we know Russia is responsible for significant amounts of propaganda, of misinformation, of disinformation, and uh, certainly attempts at interference are uh, no doubt uh, ongoing from Russia. They are a hostile actor, hostile to Canada, hostile to our values, hostile to our support of Ukraine, uh, and hostile to our democracy. But to say, to read the belief that Russia posed a integrity of our elections to the outcome of determined. And finally, would you expect members of the Canadian Ukrainian community to have a high level of confidence in that conclusion as well? Yes, I think the Canadian Ukrainian community has a degree of confidence in the conclusions by all of our national security experts and top public servants that the elections in 2019 and 2021 are free and fair. At the same time, I think Ukrainian Canadians, like all Canadians, need to remain vigilant to Russian disinformation and to the amplification of pro-Russian narratives in contexts and coming from places that one wouldn't suspect uh, pro-Russian narratives to be amplified. I'm very pleased to see that Ukraine just passed the updated uh, over the past days, uh, and I am continue to be bewildered at the fact that the Conservative Party uh, voted against uh, that update because they fell prey to uh, pro-Russian narratives that are uh, undermining Canada's support for Ukraine amongst Conservative Canadians, which I know is uh, a thing of deep distress for many Ukrainian Canadians, and rightly so. Thank you, Prime Minister. Merci, Roy, for the RCDA. Russian-Canadian Democratic Alliance. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. Hello, Madam Commissioner. I am representing the Russian-Canadian Alliance. We have heard that some disinformation campaigns could have affected some political parties in the 2021 elections. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. I want to remove politics about this, and I want to talk about disinformation. Mr. indicate that the conclusion from our national security of ensuring the integrity of our elections, 
Well, they agreed that there was no impact in the results due to foreign interference, whether it's in the different counties or in the general elections at large. So yes, there were attempts to interfere, but our elections were uh, the integrity of our elections stood firm. Question. I want to ask if that kind of attempt affected just one party or could it affect all parties, leaders of all parties, like the Ligbro uh, party and the others? Answer. Well, appearance can affect just one party, all, all parties or a few parties. In it can also affect the country of origin, the county, and the region as well. Question, did you witness this as some leader of the Liberal parties during the 2021 and 2019 elections? Answer. In my capacity as a party leader, I was supposed to campaign, speak to as many Canadians as possible, and ensure that as many Liberal uh, members are elected as possible to ensure that the integrity of the elections stood firm. And they concluded that in both elections, 2021 and 2019, these elections were free and fair. with your own ears and saw with your own eyes, did campaigns answer? Well, disinformation uh, quite widespread, more in 2021 than in 2019. We saw conspiracy theories with respect to vaccination. We also witnessed conspiracy theories about the World Economic Forum and even personal attacks against me and my family. So yes, there was misinformation and disinformation during those campaigns. Question. Uh, well, it, it can't be easy, especially when it affects your family. But my question is, you understand how social media works, so you did your campaign in 2015 thanks to social media. I'm sure it was very helpful in that campaign. I want to know whether there were some disinformation campaigns that were more important, and do you think that it impacted voters during those two campaigns? Answer. Well, every political party was using social media. Uh, to try and garner votes. So, of course, social media played an important role in those uh, elections. Question, I was talking about disinformation campaigns, wondering if you know whether we can influence voters in that regard. And so I think we can see that disinformation and misinformation impacts uh, several people. There are thousands of Canadians who believed that vaccination was more dangerous than, than uh, COVID-19 itself. That is an example of people who were affected, sometimes uh, fatally, by uh, disinformation. Uh, Mr. Tira, you have a last question? Um, this is my last question. I want to know if you witnessed disinformation that could, if you had witnessed this, why didn't you raise this issue with uh, government institutions, those who are mandated and authorized to act on these misinformation and disinformation campaigns, especially when it affects the integrity of elections? Answer, because those institutions, and I speak 
regularly about this with my national security advisors about the impact of misinformation and disinformation. We can see, let's remember the situation that happened with the convoys in Ottawa to understand that it's a real situation, but it's not up to me to tell the panels that you have to be wary of disinformation and misinformation. It's part of their job to ensure that the elections are remain uh, keep their integrity. And they did a good job in 2019 and 2021. And we understand that in 2025, it will be even more difficult, and they have to keep doing the excellent job. One last question, if I may. If you, as the party leader, you're in an election campaign and you see um, serious interference, um, false information, would you report that? Is Elections Canada doing its work? I trust that they will do their work but it is part of our responsibility, all of us, whether we're citizens, candidates, party leaders, or political parties. We all need to work with the site task force to uh, report any misinformation or disinformation. And this is part of what we're going to do with the panel. Uh, we will raise issues with the panel, but the panel does not depend on us to do its work. But yes, absolutely, we can contribute and we should. Thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, Attorney General. Examination. No, thank you, Commissioner. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je sais pas si je dois dire que vous êtes. Thank you very much. I don't know if I can say you are free to leave, but I will allow myself to tell you that you are free to leave. Thank you very much. Order, please. Alors, s'il vous plaît, the sitting of the Foreign Interference Commission has adjourned. Cette séance de la Commission sur l'ingérence étrangère est levée.